round three of the U.S. Championship and U.S. Women's Chess Championship was full of surprises and upsets. Wesley So started the day number five in the world and undefeated in this competition. But 14-year-old Sam Sevian was not intimidated by his experienced rival. The shocking outcome ended So's perfect tournament and led to victory for young Sevian. Hikaru Nakamura was also perfect after two rounds. His game against Gata Kamsky, it seemed like Nakamura was controlling it from the beginning, even with the black pieces but it ended suddenly in a draw after a big miscalculation. Meanwhile, Irina Crush, the defending champion on the women's side, stumbled in her game against Nazi Pakidzi, leaving no clear leader on the women's side, as the strongest and youngest U.S. championship in history promises even more surprises in round four. And it all starts right now. Today we have a historic matchup between Wesley So and Hikaru Nakamura and it's fitting that we kick off today's action here in the Bobby Fischer exhibit as Nakamura is the highest ranked U.S. player since Bobby Fischer. So let's get all the action started and head on to the studio with Jen, Yasser and Maurice. Welcome to round four of the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships and U.S. Women's Chess Championships. Yesterday we had so many barn burners, and but... Thrilling round, but today I think we might be able to beat it, Jim. Well, at least with the importance of the round. Yeah. We've got Nakamura versus So, really a historic match, as Taryn mentioned, because having two players in the top ten. Right. Incredible. And now they're facing off. Exactly. Well, I think at the start of the tournament, as you saw the field, you said to yourself, this is the game you wanted to see, number one and number two, and they'll be going to head-to-head -head in round four. And luckily it's on Saturday, so you can all stay with us while you watch some other random sporting competition in the background. Exactly. So let's take a look at the standings, because even though this is the number one versus number two matchup, that's not exactly how the standings are right now. Nakamura is tied with none other than Grandmaster Ray Robson, young Webster University student um, who's been playing fantastic so far. So half a point behind since he lost to Sam Sevian yesterday. Um, and then a ton of players at one and a half out of four. I mean, one and a half out of three, rather. Um, so we're going to kind of see who um, rises from that group. Inclu now, in the women's championship... Including Gada Kamsky, defending champion at one and a half. That's right. In the women's championship, we have no clear leader either. Rusadan Golatiani and Katerina Nemsova, both with two and a half out of three. Nazi Pakidzi coming off a great win yesterday against the defending champion, Grandmaster Irina Crash. So that's the big surprise here, that Irina is not dominating this field, and there's plenty of juice in the U.S. Women's Championship. Absolutely. We have Grandmaster Maurice Ashley with uh, the key matchups of the day. Well, if yesterday's round was shocking, today will certainly be electrifying as we have some of the big dogs facing off against each other. First of all, numbers one and two in the competition, two of the top players in the world. Hikaru Nakamura, disgusted from his game yesterday against Gadakomsky. He knew he should have won that one. He walked out of here without even coming down for an interview. And even more disgusted will be Grandmaster Wesley So. He had risen to number five in the world, but got knocked back by the youngster Sam Sevian. And so he only stands at two. We see these two players facing off early, making this a key battle for sure. On the women's side, we have someone who's been there, done that, Rusadan Gulatiani. Nobody talking about her too much before the championships, but she has won this title before. In 2005, she survived a big scare in round one against her co-leader, Katerina Nemsova, and now she's facing off against a newcomer to the competition, Nasi Pakitsi, who beat the six-time champion, Irina Crush. So this is definitely going to be all-out war. On the ladies' side, a great round, certainly in round four of the championships. Guys? That's right, Maurice. And we see the players arriving. You've got Annie Wang there. Um, Timur Gureyev, well, kind of looking at his shirt today. <laughs> I, like, I, I like the shoes. It's got to be the shoes. Yes, indeed. 
Um, we've got some interesting fashion choices from all of the players here at the championship, <laughs> and championship. And what a fashionable neighborhood. The Central West End, it's a gorgeous day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we are, uh, do you think he's ready to play aggressively? He's ready to rock and roll. Sure, it looks like it. And um, what's he going to play, you think, against Gata Kamsky? Um, how can he top the creativity of yesterday? <laughs> I have no idea. I won't even go there after H7, H6, and I'll move to... <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday, yesterday's game, he is an impossible player to predict. But uh, do you think he'll play something normal, or do you? I, I'm going to go with no. I'm going to go with no too. <laughs> I'll actually join you on that. I mean, uh, in I guess normal is kind of a vague word. I, I'm not defining it. Are, are we going? Is he going to play something that's not unusual? That unusual. doesn't have a name. <laughs> yeah. Well, unusual. You have to go to the dusty part of our uh, libraries. But uh, in truth. He and Gata have faced off against each other three times before. Two draws, one win for Gata. Irina, don't text and walk. Yeah. It's very dangerous. <laughs> very dangerous. I'm turning you your cell get, phone. You can get hit by a fan, yeah, exactly. a chess fan, collision. Um, of course, they're not allowed to use cell phones in the tournament hall. In right. fact, they all check them at the desk, which right. is one of the great things about the uh, St. Louis Chess Club. And the man of the hour, Sam Sevian, 14 years old. What a great win yesterday. He should be so proud. I, I saw his dad was like fantastically proud. <laughs> Grinning from ear to ear. Yeah, yeah uh, there Mr. he is. Savio. The, the proud, the proud uh, papa indeed. Uh, and yeah. um, no, we don't do that. <laughs> no, we don't do that. <laughs> but again, let's come, let's return to what I think is the, is the game of the tournament. Uh -huh. uh, Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley So. These two players remarkably have only met one time before in classical chess. It was a semi-slav uh, gambit deferred that Wesley was white and the game ended in a draw. They have played a blitz match, a death match on chess.com that uh, uh, Hikaru won very convincingly in the five minute Three minute and one minute. Did really? he Nakamura won, won the lightning chess game? <laughs> Convincingly. I mean, he's just amazing at that kind of chess. Yeah, he's so a, he's that, a, that's not a huge surprise. No. But uh, today, Wesley uh, Black and Hikaru can basically play anything C4, D4, E4. So, what's your prediction? I would probably suggest a D4, but really, this is a toss up. And they're the I'm going to go with E4. You're going to go with E4. Okay. You have, I have E4, you have D4. Yeah. Don't try to get C4 in night F32. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll go, no bargaining. I'll go with <laughs> Very good. But uh, if we do see an E4 game, I'd suspect that we'd see a king, classical king pawn, maybe a Berlin, maybe uh, some variation of the Rui Lopez. At the Tata Steel Chess Festival in January of this year, Wesley played it incredibly well, losing only one game. And he defeated Vasily Ivanchuk on the black side in Arui. So if we do see E4, I suspect we'll see a king, classical king pawn defense. Well, that'll be fun. And our co-leader. That's right. Grandmaster Ray Robson playing fantastically in this tournament so far, giving us a little smile. And do you know what the difference is here, uh, Jen? Really, Ray has always been a great talent. He's been playing. He's played on the U.S. Olympic teams. But for the last 10 years, he's always been afflicted by time trouble. And in this event, he's made a, a concerted effort to avoid time trouble. My goodness, is Var putting on weight? Look at that little round tummy. <laughs> <laughs> Better not say that about any of the women players, or you're going to get hunted down. Yeah, no, like, no, no, I won't. <laughs> I'm warning you right now. <laughs> Var, no baby can, bump speculation. Right. Var, Var, I can get away with it. It's like a bro thing, right? A what? A bro. A bro. Bros. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, respect. I always kind of find funny when guys make fun of each other for being fat because it's just like. And women yeah, never you go can't there. do that. You just don't go there. I get it. I get it. Um, but Unless it's April Fools. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking fat in that dress. April oh, Fools. Oh yeah. <laughs> that does not work. Um, going down uh, the lineup, Ray Robson. By the way. He will play against Var Akobian, and their individual matchup is amazing. They have actually played each other 13 games, with Ray getting uh, the, the def definitely the short end of that stick. Uh, 13 games, the score is 8-3 to three in terms of def decisive games in favor of Var, with only two draws. And so here he is, Hikaru Nakamura, entering the St. Louis Chess Club, along with Chris Littlejohn. His uh, trainer, yeah. And Wesley, sitting at the board, waiting for his illustrious opponent, number one, 
ranked Hikaru Nakamura number two in the world ranking Hikaru to arrive at the board. Dressed in black, wearing black? Playing black. <laughs> Playing black, right. Yeah, Wesley. Ah, and there's the handshake. So we're going to be finding some. Whoops. Oh. We're finding some moves here, too. I'm also intrigued by this uh, Trove Shanklin match. I expect that to be an exciting game. My goodness, and the clocks have started, and I just saw a quick move there. Look by Wesley So, and the round's underway, round I four. I think you're right, Yes. I think that looks like a D4. You oh. said that almost surprisingly. <laughs> More uses. Let, let, us, let us see. We'll what find we out. Okay, by the way, Ray Robson has opened up E4 against VAR, and we don't have moves yet uh, in the Hikaru game, although on our. Oh, it looks like it's a white square, maybe C4. C4. Yeah. In English. Yeah, so push. Yeah. Nobody wins. Uh, well, I'm closer. <laughs> I mean, C4, wow. D4, E4, I'm a little closer. To this. I guess you could say that, or you could say it's a white square. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Nice retort. Okay, C4, English opening, E6 instantly by uh, Wesley So, uh, suggesting that he's ready to play a Queen's Gambit decline, classical, uh, or perhaps an early Bishop B4 Bogo Indian checking uh, system. That's right. Now, if Nakamura really wants to, he can play a move like uh, knight c3 or e4. Well, e4 probably just gets into a kind of a French defense where things get defined too early. Exactly, because it's an exchange French, yeah. which uh, doesn't leave a lot for white. Exactly. I suspect that uh, knight c3 will be uh, uh, Hikaru's choice. It's considered more fle flexible. And just to... Uh, to what I had mentioned. After d4, okay, knight f6, the players will transpose into a nimzo. But there is this other possibility of bishop b4 check, bishop d2, queen e7 going into a bogo. That's something that maybe Hikaru doesn't want to see. That's why I suspect knight c3 the mo more flexible. It looks like he's played d4, however. Okay. So just willingly transpose. Still don't win. So, I no, 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 no. <laughs> only on move one. That's the only, only when it counts. Okay, so <laughs> you gotta you gotta check the technicalities of your contract. Right, always. right. Learn, Learn this, let this be a learning experience to you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Jen. I, I uh, considered me learned. Uh, it looks like d7, d5 has been played by Wesley. So an orthodox queen's gambit declined is appearing on the board. Knight c3 and bishop e7. Okay, so normally knight f6 has been the main move for the better part of hundreds of years, but uh, it is in particular is the Armenian grandmasters who've popularized this move, bishop e7. It's sort of like a little bit more uh, of a flexible move in the sense they want to induce white to play the move knight f3, knight f6, and only in this case after bishop g5. There are specific reasons, um, subtleties, that only appear much later in right. a queen's gambit decline. Why you want to coax Induce the knight. knight f3, because otherwise right. sometimes it's that e3, bishop d3, knight e2 thing. Precisely. Which we, we saw that uh, 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 yesterday, I think, too, in some kind of Nimzu Indian. Yeah. That sometimes white wants to develop that knight e2, not f3. Um, primarily because of the possibility of pushing the f-pawn at some point. Right. And in this case, in fact, uh, Hikaru said, fine, I'll bring my knight to f3. And as those players get uh, into their game... Is there any negative to bishop e7, guys? Or do you, do you think yes. it's just a superior move? No, uh, there, there is one uh, drawback. Let's say in this position, after, for example, knight f6, uh, bishop f4, okay? Uh, the bishop, instead of coming to the uh -huh. uh, g5 square, bishop f4. Now, in this position, it's often considered that black's best response is bishop to b4. Got to this ragazin type line. Precisely. Interesting. Taking advantage of the fact that the knight on, g, uh, the, the knight on f6 isn't pinned by a bishop on g5. So in such positions, in fact, the bishop on f4, as I just point out, 
could actually end up being even a tactical target. So Bishop F4 is a, a better line when they have committed their bishop to E7. Precisely. Which means that you've got some pros on one side and cons on the other side, which often happens with transpositions and, and whatnot. Exactly. But I really think it's important, and that, um, an old trainer of mine, uh, Victor Frias, oh, yes, Victor. he used to think it was really important and underrated understanding every early move in the opening. Right, the like, subtleties. Yeah. You like, give, to, you got to give to get, you know, and there, yeah. you, there, there's always pros and cons to almost every move, and it's important, like Victor, you are about to say, to understand those. Yes. Little, little, the tiny things can make... moves, make, like five, make, six. Yeah, it can make big differences, absolutely. And especially because so many amateur players, they, they memorize the opening, like, more deeply, which is fine. Yeah. But make sure that you're understanding the base... Oh, right. you. And you, you may have your novelty on move 12, but you better be sure you know why move 5 and 6 and 7. Uh, uh, exactly. The differences. Shall we, uh, shall yeah, we let's take move a look on. around? Ooh. By the way, we do have, actually, the players have transposed to a Queen's Gambit, or an orthodox line of the Queen's Gambit declined on board 1. Oh, Team War, I think we both win. What do we, we win? What do we win? Let's move to a game. <laughs> Looks like we both win. A uh, wing Gambit. A wing Gambit. This definitely counts so as late. abnormal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and How so are we going to celebrate? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to celebrate by an awesome game. You know, Team War Gray of yesterday um, really did uh, let the cat out of the bag with Grandmaster Marty Sashley, and I wonder if um, Kemsky was watching that. Oh. He said he's going to continue to uh, make it rain. Uh, yeah, mix it up. Okay, I actually uh, liked the wing gambit very much when I was younger, but I always did it in the following move order. I always played knight f3. My opponents would usually play d7, d6, being under the spell of Robert James Fisher and wishing to play a uh, Sicilian knight or And then I would unleash my, my dreaded... Uh, Gambit, wing gambit, b4, c takes b4, e4, and then soon I would play a2, a3. The reason for that move order, and we're talking about subtleties, in the, in the game as played, takes, if you now play this wing gambit line with a2, a3, d7, d5 is considered a very good uh, response. And I recall a game, I believe it was with Kamran Shirazi, uh, versus oh Jack gosh. Peters. This is a famous one. Right. Uh, in a U.S. championship in uh, Berserkly, California. Wait, wait, let me get some move. Takes on B4. Yes. And now yeah. the puzzle of the day. That's right, guys. <laughs> a this, double attack. Yeah, we saw something like this the other day, right? Oh, with Dmitry Gurevich. Right. Yeah, the double a, attack. The double attack. So Queen here, A5. So and Queen E5 check, and this was the shortest game in U.S. championship history, I believe. Correct. So. And Kamran Shirazi gave it up at this point. I don't think we're going to see that record broken in this tournament, you guys. No. <laughs> so the problem is, is when you're playing this Wings Gambit, it, it, it it makes a lot of sense to first induce this move d7, d6 before launching uh, with b4. But now, having said that, let's see what, well, Timor, Timor seems to be thinking at this moment. You mean, oh, Timor is thinking, huh? Yeah, I, at the moment, I have just um, Black's c takes b4 and Timor um, considering He's probably looking at that variation now. He noticed yeah. now that rook on a1 is loose. Right. Okay, let's He's go. He's challenging himself now, come up in, with, with a novelty in the wing gambit. Now, again, we've uh, mentioned, of course, that Ray Robson tied for first after three rounds. He's playing a player who's really gotten the best of him in their uh, many encounters. Again, 13 encounters, only two draws an 8-3 to three record in terms of victories favoring Var Akobian. The players have played a Russian defense, or what we call in the West the Petrov. When, I, when you were a kid, did you try to uh, imitate your opponent's moves and, and say, okay, if you're such a good player, I'll just do everything that you did until you lost a lot of games? Once or twice against my dad. Uh, didn't work, though. <laughs> Mike gotcha. Uh, he was like, queen takes e4. Right. There you go. <laughs> okay. Right. So here we have the Petrov, Russian defense, uh, as mentioned. 
considered an extremely solid defense. And then this line... Um, Knight c3 has become very popular yeah, in the last 10, 15 years. Even though it doesn't look super positional, the idea is... Well, in the old lines, they would all go d4, d5, bishop d3, two main branches here, bishop e7 and bishop d6. And after thousands of games, uh, theoretically, black has actually been doing very well. So a lot of white players have relied upon this move, knight c3. After this forced trade of knights, essentially white's a little bit ahead in development. You see two units develop versus one, but more so he has a little bit more space for his bishops, you can see here. So although it's a small advantage, the white players actually like playing this position, and the players have played to this and it's fun. Situation. It can be kind of fun to play with white. You got a little bit of space, and sometimes you get a kingside attack if white goes kingside. Importantly, for free. That's right. And Maurice Ashley, what are your thoughts on this line? Importantly, the fact is that Okobian almost never plays this line. I just checked out the database, and he's only played this twice. Now, he's a very solid player. He loves to play the French defense. That's his mainstay against e4. But I was only able to find two games. That means that Ray must have been slightly surprised by this choice. Now, we mentioned, you mentioned, Yaz, that is an 8-3 to three score that VAR has on Ray. Well, you know, Ray is a younger guy, and he was getting beaten up in the older days uh, when, when he was just a wet behind the ears kid. Now that he's a college man, the last four games they've played, they've broken even, 50%, two wins each. But check out the number of moves they play. They average those four decisive games, 60 moves per game, average. That So they play for a while when they fight, expect a rough and tumble battle here, lasting past the first time control. Guys? Thank you, Maurice. That's right, right. Okobian's the French master. Absolutely. Uh, let's just check out the ladies' games. Just Actually, a he's a frequent GM in residence here at the St. Louis Chess Club, just like you. Yeah. And I think a lot of the players here have adopted the French because of VAR. <laughs> I know. They're like raising their hands and like, who plays the Sicilian? He's a great <laughs> ambassador for the French defense, and uh, he's got the whole St. Louis Chess Club behind him. Here. Yeah, yeah, that kind of hero of Petrosian. A lot of Armenian players um, end up playing the French at some point in their careers, and some really stick with it and love it. Exactly. I re remember Sinbad Laputian uh, playing it as a near religion. Okay, Ruslan open with knight f3, and it seems like in the ladies game, a lot of the ladies like to postpone the battle, just do the old double fee and shadow. Well, yeah, these players are both Georgian, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of Georgian players try this. So, yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's part favorite of the reason setting. why. Uh, I've adopted this on occasion. I've played in the U.S. Championship in a, uh, in a game with Gregory Kaidanov, where I tried to slow play him. I got a significant edge. Uh, I blew it, and the game was a draw. But it's, it's one of those openings by white that looks tame but uh, a single misplay and suddenly it's like all of white's pieces end up being better than the opponents. Knight well, we saw C3. how poisonous it was yesterday when Nazi Bakitsi used it against Irina Krash. It's a great effect. Strongest Indeed. player in the tournament. Yeah. Exactly. So Knight C3, so this is all very standard. Um, it's, it's common for black to capture, capture, Knight C6. Queen e2. Numerous games have gone in a fashion like this. Uh, just, I'll just put, uh, I think I've probably seen uh, dozens of games from this precise position. So this is a very common setup. We've got our hedgehog going on. Now, what's going on with Alyssa Melikina, who's playing against one of the other uh, leaders in the tournament, Katarina Nemsova? Well, this is not that surprising. We have a C3 Sicilian. This is right. one of Alyssa's mainstays. And in fact, I think she has some videos on uh, YouTube or online chess lessons featuring the C3 Sicilian. She wrote an article about it on Chess Life. So uh, Katarina should be well prepared for this. I'll make Evgeny Sveshnikov very happy because for the better part of 40 years, he's been um, a championing C2, C3 against the Sicilian. Well, I think it's a great opening. I, I like it. I mean, it's, it's great for a pl white player who's pretty aggressive but doesn't have quite as much time to study theory. Exactly. It works out well for them. Yeah, you avoid a boatload of theory, but then 
Strangely enough, a boatload of theria is occurring after C2, C3, knight F6. And white might, yeah, exactly. The pawn on E4. I think knight F6 is one of the more testing lines, very aggressive. And one thing for those of you at home, spend time on your C3 Sicilian is black. You've got to spend a lot of time on it, because I think that's one of the reasons why it's so successful at the mm -hmm. expert and master level, is that... The, uh, the players aren't, they're ignoring it. They're not putting a lot of exactly. time and effort behind it. So this will not have been a surprise for Kate. So knight F3, D6, D4... All of these are very standard moves. Queen you can take D4. with a pawn, but queen takes is a, a possibility as well in these lines. Yeah, considered a, a secondary choice, but e6, yeah. knight bd2, and for sure, again, Kate will have expected, especially if Elisa's mm -hmm. uh, doing YouTube videos on how to play the white side, she will have expected this line of play by her opponent. But I'm not sure if Elisa plays exactly like this usually. I think she usually plays, like you said, the more classical taking with C the pawn D4. type lines. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually am, um, I think that Nemsova is going to be well prepared here in general. I think it's going to be a battle in the middle game that Elisa's not going to get that much. Well, let's just see. I think the most straightforward would be knight c6, and then bishop b5, queen, bishop b5, breaking the pin, coaxing white to give up the two bishops, and we'd have a situation like this. White has, um, a little bit more free play, but Black's already won the two bishops. So a big battle ahead yeah. in this game. And Maurice Ashley was uh, some thoughts on another game from the Women's Championship. Talking about winning the two bishops and big battles, there is a nice matchup going on right now between young Annie Wang and Sabina Foyser, who is one of the favorites, an Olympic team player, for sure one of the tougher players to play in this competition. But let's take a look at their game because it's gone unusual, guys. It looked very much like a quiet Slav, especially after this exchange on D5. Symmetrical pawn structure, you would think. Knight F3, Knight F6, Knight C3, Knight C6 is copycat chess going on. But after Bishop to F4, looking for this diagonal, Sabina said, no, no, no. Move your bishop away. And the youngster played Bishop to E5. That caused their opponent to play F6. Bishop back. Give me your bishop, thank you very much. And now E5. You don't see this kind of aggression from Black early in a game already. These pawns centralized right here, and also the F6 pawn already sticking out. And she's got the two bishops. So she's saying, I'm going for it. Sabina Foyser, as I said, one of the favorites on the women's side. Another game that looks like it's building to excitement already is the game between Sam Sevian, who defeated Wesley So yesterday. He's playing against Daniel Derodisky, who's got to get his tournament back in shape. After having two early losses and drawing yesterday, they are now in a martial attack. Now, this we know is a crazy line. Black goes for it by sacrificing a pawn. So if you count them up, Black's already down a pawn. But we know Black gets enormous counterplay. His bishop gets to d6. His queen comes into the game. And he has open lines for the attack. So what does Sam have for this line? He's been thinking a while. I'm surprised he walked into a martial attack and doesn't know what to do or didn't have anything prepared immediately. So we'll see how the youngster handles himself after that big victory yesterday. We can expect a fight on these two boards as well as others. Guy? Thank you, Maurice. Uh, I'm looking at the game of Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley So, our featured matchup as number one, number two. Interestingly enough, the players are playing right down into a mainline Queen's Gambit declined. For those of you who are chess history buffs, you'll know that this, uh, that this also has featured one of the most famous games of the 1972 Bobby Fischer Boris Spassky match, uh, where Bobby surprised his Soviet, um, the champion uh, Boris Spassky, uh, by playing a Queen's Gambit uh, declined. And in that game, you'll remember this uh, one. Do you remember oh, this yes. game? Queen uh -huh. A4. C5, Queen A3, Rook, uh, C8. Bobby Fischer went on to win what was argued afterwards as the, as the best game of the match. And uh, funnily enough, chess has a long, long memory. 1972 World Championship match. These days, if we were to get this variation, by the way, uh, I was trying to imitate Bobby Fischer in one of my games uh, in the Dutch League. And I had this position against uh, Kengis, who was a trainer of Michael Tull, from Grandmaster from Latvia. And instead of going for the C5 line, as did Boris Baski, the KG Wiley old veteran played the move Rook C8. 
and demonstrated to me that black is actually has a very balanced position. And the move rook c8 was unknown to me at the time I played that game. So let's see what, in fact, has happened in the game. Just a second. I'll just come right back to the game. I'll refresh my board. Bishop g5, h6, castles e3, b6. Um, so in the he, other, he, in the only two he, other games that uh, Nakamura played in this, he took on d5. He took on d5. In this case, he's actually played bishop d3. Right. So uh, two major moves. Taking on f6 is a major move. Uh, a, a mainline move, I, I should say. This uh, variation of play, I actually played against Anatoly Karpov several games. Uh, one I should have won, but the games were drawn. Um, that's one line, uh, the C takes D5 we've already spoken about, and the third main line, which turned out to be uh, Hikaru's choice, Bishop D3, very sensibly developing Bishop, but that line, Bishop D3, Bishop D7, castles, Knight B2, D2. This is all very, very standard, and we, <coughs> we the, the normal move here for white is Queen E2, although Rook C1 is also played and usually black plays the move knight e4, trying to free his game by uh, trading a few pieces. Right. Yeah. Again, very, very theoretical, and I just see that a different move was chosen by uh, Hikaru. Hikaru did not move his rook or move his queen to e2. He chose bishop g3. That looks that like a, a strange... Strange, yeah. uh, loss of a tempo, I must say. Well, normally speaking, black is, point, is aiming for c7, c5 in order to trade pawns and, again, once again, just trade a lot of pieces, liberate his game, equalize the position. I'm trying to come up with and, something new over the board. And Wesley played c5 like, a, like an instant. I mean, he just snapped that move down and yeah. Wesley got up from the board. And as I look at the times, by the way... 20 minutes, yeah. Well, Wesley has gained four minutes. He started with a minute, uh, and pardon me, an hour 30. And his increment, he's been playing so quickly that his increments have added up, and he has actually gained four minutes to Hikaru's loss of 15 minutes. So Wesley is showing that he's been very, very well prepared for this key encounter. That's right, because Bishop G3 does look so odd, and you wonder why is Wesley prepared for it. Exactly. But uh, on the other hand, um, C5 is such an obvious move, kind of like what you were saying the other day about Ferrugian playing E4. Even if you're not prepared for it, just play E4 instantly. Exactly. So exactly. that might be Wesley's philosophy here. Well, uh, again, it's the type of... Uh, well, Wesley is playing a system where C7, C5 is considered the equalizing advance, and that when black is able to get this move in without any consequence, you know, he hasn't compromised himself in some unfortunate way, it's considered that uh, black has achieved equality after the move C5. Yes, and uh, Nakamura seeming like maybe he wants to avoid trades in this game and make it a bit richer, but perhaps, uh, you know, not getting as good of a position. So that's that's what Bishop G3 says to me that like you know he doesn't want this mass liquidation after knight to e4. Mm -hmm. Though I have to say, if both uh, of them were about to face off in push-ups, I think Nakamura might have the edge. Really, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Wesley is taking his physical training very seriously. Oh, is he? Yeah. 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 So yeah, we'll no, see. I'm sure. I'm just I'm just <laughs> commenting on the fact that uh, Nakamura is rocking uh, the t-shirt. In this game. That is true. That is true. Look at my biceps. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think we have seen C4 takes D5. I haven't gotten an update, but I saw that Hikaru did grab something, and grabbing on C5 would make no sense. So I'm suspecting that he has played the move C4 uh, takes D5. And now a very fundamental question. You could play E6 takes D5 maintaining your control over the e4 square and setting up for a future knight e4. No, Wesley said no. And this would, this would lead to what we call the hanging pawn structure. Uh, the pawns on c5 and d5 are considered, w since they're not being supported as hanging. Hey, that's such a negative way to put it. <laughs> who, well, who uh, I mean, I, this is just uh, the chess vernacular, Jen. I didn't invent I didn't invent this stuff. Um, the hanging pawn structure has been a very controversial one going back uh, many, many decades, maybe even centuries. 
And the idea is while white is trying to put uh, pressure on the pawns, the pawns in the meanwhile are covering a lot of squares. Um, Wesley well, wanted no part of the uh, hanging pawn structure. He <laughs> went for knight, knight takes d5. And he did it very quickly. And uh, Hikaru back at the board, I don't see a move. And so the difference in this particular case is that Wesley is saying, I, after knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, I want to keep my pawn structure intact. Any capture on c5 is really just simply right. good for black because you're, this knight on d7 comes powerfully into the game attacking this bishop on d3. So d4 takes c5. So white's going to want to find a way to get e4 in instead to get an advantage. But it's unfortunate that we can't really follow up with d5 here. Exactly. I mean, we could, but then you just take twice, and we don't really have any good discoveries here. Well, so. and, and that's, that's the reason. This type of position, by the way, is the reason why black often tries to sneak in this little h7, h6, putting the question to the bishop, because if right. the pawn was back on h7, then white would play. White would black. have an advantage with that super centralized queen, whereas now we're just down uh, a pawn. Precisely. And uh, Maurice has some news for us in one of the women's championship games. Just a couple of interesting points to look at. You guys might think about funky openings. Take a look at this funky opening choice in the game between Anna Sherovich and Victoria Nee. This opening started out D4, C5. On the next move, C5, and after D5, E5, uh, often known as the check Minoni, but with a pawn on C4, this line different when E4 is played. And now the game goes into unusual territory after knight C3, bishop E7. The point here, bishop E7, is to get rid of this bishop that's supposed to be a bad bishop due to the pawn structure. And now bishop to B5 check. And how do you respond to a check in the opening normally? Well, normally you block somehow. But king to F8... Now, that's already a provocative move. I had to look at the database to see how often this had been played. It turns out it's been played 19 times, only twice by a player over 2,500 on the ELO list. The record, the decisive record, white wins 10 times, black wins once. 10-1. You've got to wonder why Victoria would choose this line. Just to go a couple more moves, the threat of A6 and B5 is in the position. So A4, now Bishop G5. And Anna, knight ge2, the novelty right now, which is why Victoria is stopping to think, because this move has never been played. Normally, knight f3 is the book move. I also want to point out another game quite quickly on the men's side on the Open Championship. In this moment right here, between Ray Robson and Veruja Nakobian, knight to d4 was played, and instantly bishop takes on d4, trading off a valuable bishop for a knight. Usually when a dark square bishop takes a knight, is because you plan to dominate the other color squares, that is the light squares. So d5 immediately played by VAR and now h5. So their game already imbalanced, two bishops against bishop and knight. Solid structure for black, but white looking for some play. Guys? Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. And I can see that in that game of VAR, after the move h5, and I'll just bring that game up on my board for a quick sec. After the move h5, there's no way VAR is going to put his king on the king side. Essentially what white is setting up for is to gain some space on the king side with f3 and g4. So no reason to put your king into, into the danger zone. Var is going to castle uh, long and... And uh, white's still going to attack on the king side, but not quite as much fun without a king there. <laughs> exactly. There's a missing king there. So I'm basically saying I prefer white but the advantage, to my mind, is really, really small. Too small, at this point. almost, and, for, the, uh, for the old, for being white. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Var, of course, did castle queenside. That was his move. But that's a and problem. Petros a tough knock to crack. That's why people resorted to this. Exactly. Well, Anatoly yeah. Karpov, uh, during his reign as world champion, he had the Petrov in his repertoire, and he was just really almost unbeatable. Only Gary Kasparov could really. Uh, put pressure on him. Uh, I, I have to go to Timor Garia's game just out of you know respect for Timor's uh, uh, willingness to gambit upon against God, our defending champion Gadikamski. It was captured. Knight f3. Now, actually, Gada's next move was a big surprise for me. D7, D6, because I had mentioned how much I like playing the wings gambit when my opponent has already played the move D7, D6. The reason I didn't like I don't like this particular move order is either knight f6 or d5, but 
it's the D5 move that really sours me to with the wing gambit in this particular line of play. Uh, D7, D6 was Gata's choice. Great. So what has White got for his pawn? Well, there you have it. He has the classical pawn center D4, uh, classical pawn duo, D4 and E4. Knight hey, F6. earlier you were calling them hanging pawns. Now you're calling them a classical duo. Because they can be supported. There's a C pawn and an F2 pawn that can uh, back up the D4 pawn. Now, on a very, very good day, what you want as white is for your opponent to just kind of do nothing. And God actually has done nothing, which is almost ideal for white. G7, G6, fair enough, a nice move. Uh, preparing to Fianchetto, uh, uh, the Fianchetto, the bishop on G7. But let's just throw some moves on the board. And this is why I liked uh, the wings gambit uh, very much, because I always liked the dynamic attacking chances that I would get by advancing pawns and moving them up the board. And black's position is solid, but it's very cramped. And so at the cost, uh, the material cost of a, only a pawn, which is decisive at these high uh, uh, levels, um, white has a long-term initiative, kind of like in a Benko gambit. Strategically speaking, black is giving up a pawn, but he's got a long-term mm, yeah, compensation. Yeah, this, this is going to be a fun game, and I um, like the choice to fight team more. We are, we're going to come back in just a few minutes to see more of these opening battles shape up in round four of the 2015 U.S. Chess Championship. Two thousand and fourteen was a great year for chess. Chess twenty four brought you live interactive broadcasts from top tournaments, a play zone where you can take on opponents from all around the world twenty four seven. Interactive beginners courses ensuring you pick up the basics fast while having fun. A tactics trainer to sharpen your chess by solving puzzles adapted to your level. Hundreds of interactive videos. Chess twenty four on mobiles and tablets. Most features are free, but limited for registered members. Chess24 is offering a special premium membership for just $9.99 per month or $99 per year. See you at chess24.com. You could fly to Venice. Or Paris or even Copenhagen. You could fly all over the world. But why? When you could just come to St. Louis. Your trip begins at ExploreStLouis.com. Mr. Matheny, what's your favorite part about this sport? I think the strategy. How much do you hate to lose? I don't like it at all. What about being second-guessed? <laughs> I don't like that either. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't have moved that rook. Checkmate. Sorry. Whether you've played chess for years or never before, come experience all the sport has to offer at the world-renowned Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis. Welcome back to the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships. I'm Jennifer Shahadi, here with Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan. Pleasure, We Jen. have Maurice Ashley, as always. And round four, as we mentioned before, epic battle this round between So and Nakamura, which will likely determine the front runner for the U.S. Chess Championship. And maybe the winner of the event itself. Yeah. And as I was just going around to some games that we haven't uh, seen, uh, yeah, how's our boy Southern going after <laughs> it's, yesterday? Exactly. It's a mainline martial gambit. Uh, Daniel uh, Naroditsky uh, gambiting the pawn d5. Not that we have any favorites. Of course, we love Daniel also. Of course, <laughs> of course. Especially and, when he plays the martial gambit. <laughs> right. The martial gambit, of course, uh, made famous by uh, 19th century, 20th century American champion Frank Marshall. C7, C6. So why'd they call it that? 
Marshall Gambit? Keep going. Keep going? Okay. Actually, this was not Marshall's idea when he introduced the Gambit oh, right. against Capablanca. Right, it's kind of like a thing, right? That's correct. Yeah, and, I, I, and, and, the, and he got refuted over the board, despite By. the fact that he had been preparing it for months. Uh, years. <laughs> Years. That's sad. He, yeah, he debuted it against the world champion uh, Jose Raul Capablanca, and over the board Capablanca, the world champion, refuted the Marshall well, Gambit. Luckily, there is um, use for over the board and theoretical talent, right? Exactly. Well, we have uh, the modern day treatment of the Marshall Gambit, which is C7, C6, D2, D3. Uh, the main line, of course, uh, for many, many years has been D4. But uh, the theoreticians have uh, shown that DT, D2, D3, keeping the D4 square unoccupied has its usefulness. Okay, bishop D6. All of these moves are very uh, standard. Whoa, just a second. Rook E8. Hmm. Just a second. I guess I'm, mo I'm mostly used to the move queen h4. Uh, uh, the way that line goes, by the way, is queen h4, g3, queen h3. Uh, Danya played bishop f5, queen f3, rook e8. Okay, and... Well, you can win the bishop. Just go ahead, yeah. Just take it. No, take, take it. the bishop. Take Come the on. bishop. And so allow many, myself... Uh, many scholastic tears have poured. Oh, this yes. The back rank checkmate. Did you realize that Bobby Fischer's book, Bobby Fischer Teaches Chess, is all about the back rank checkmate? <laughs> There's a lot it's of back like, rank checkmate. <laughs> one theme for that entire book. And very surprised by this uh, decision. Um, I don't know the latest wrinkles, but allowing Black's Queen to already penetrate to the E1 square with uh, Queen E1. I got to feel that this is very good compensation here, especially yeah, we have to as figure out how to develop those uh, dormant pieces. Uh, it would be really nice if we could play B B3, Bishop B2, but right now our Bishop on B3 is also in the way. I so can only imagine that if you wanted to do something, it might be along some lines like this. Here, check this out. We can take on. So you're, you're attacking um, a8, so taking on h2 is not particularly attractive. Right. And what I want you to do is play the move rook d8. So which now we're threatening bishop takes h2. And now <laughs> I'll, play bishop g5, yeah. I'll attack your queen with my rook, but I'm also attacking your rook like this. So, and so now if I play bishop h2. I'll just happily munch that one. Right, and, and we have a back rank issue of our own. So now after rook takes queen, rook takes queen, rook takes g5. And this is why kids get back ranked amazing. <laughs> all the time. Because it comes up so often in variations. Right. right, so we've seen two back rank checkmates in this one variation. But for both players, that's pretty good. Um, so I'm expecting so after bishop g6. So by the way, just uh, this is the game position. Bishop g6. Oh, bishop g6 has occurred? Has occurred. That's okay. on the board. So bishop g6 on the board, and now after bishop d5, <coughs> pawn d5, queen d5. Besides, uh, rook d8, your, your rejoinder, bishop d5, looks quite strong. So okay. where else can we go here? Precisely. Um, let's see. Well, our bishop's in take. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> well, it uh, I want to. You, you, using my beautiful green arrows, I boldly pointed out that two pieces are on free. The bishop on d6, the rook on a8. Now, again, this move looks very logical, bishop g5. Uh, we have another choice here for black. We can take the rook, okay? Mm -hmm. You'll take my rook. I'll take your pawn. I don't know what the body count is, by the way, at the end of this whole variation. One, two, three, four, five. Six, one, five. But opposite color you... bishops, opposite color bishops. Uh, I've got this move, queen takes d3 in the air. Right, but I might move it forward. Sure. But then you, your f, f2 is also hanging. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll fig I figure that with such an active queen, I'm a big favor to win back a pawn somewhere, somehow. This looks actually okay for black. Okay, let's go back. Although black is the one who's struggling to some extent. So is there anything else here besides rook d8, or is it the only move? It looks like it's the only move. Exactly. And unless again, this all play, comes from... Like, unless we can let you take on on a8 and with the idea that we can play bishop d3. So for, for instance, if we play bishop f8 here, that looks weird, though. 
bishop f8. I wouldn't have given that move too Just much. Just with the idea that if a uh, queen takes, we have bishop takes d3. But you'll now, only win back um, an exchange. Right, you'll just right? go about making luft at this moment. Right, you'll you'll get me. You'll you'll get. Uh, and you'll here, get the knight, bishop d6 check would be an awesome move because g3 queen takes f2, except for the stupid detail that it's not legal. Yeah, and yeah, I hate that. I just hate that. You know, it's such a wonderful winning move like bishop d6, and you're not allowed to make it. Who wrote these rules? Right, so, okay, I'm sure a lot of theory... Very mar that the marshal, fun, though. But the it marshal could... gambit, uh, the theory advances so rapidly because right. it's such a forcing defense. And both of these players very keyed up on recent theory. But the fun thing about this is it's so fun earlier in the games, but mm -hmm. then it's going to be likely to peter out really soon. Right. Your and that's whole... why it's so cool to have a variety of openings right. and so many games. Yeah, the marshal gambit, like a Grunfeld, you know, things tend to burn very, very, very quickly at the start. And then you've burnt yourself out, and uh, a lot of the uh, battle has been decided coming out of the opening. This looks like one of those cases, by the way. Whereas in the game that we saw in the ladies' championship on the first board, uh, a lot of the battle is being delayed until time trouble and so forth and so on. Let's go back to our first board, our, uh, our game of the day. And that has to be between uh, Wesley So and Hikaru Nakamura. Let me just... Nakamura giving his opponent... The look. The look? The classic Nakamura look. Okay, let's see what happens. And Wesley give it right back. Uh, Love it. <laughs> all right. Bishop G3, probably likely a theoretical move, looks like a, a loss of a half tempo, allowing black the opportunity to equalize rather easily, I would have said, with the move C5. Let's see how the game did, in fact, unfold. We did have this trade. Queen E2 takes on D4. Knight takes D4. Bishop f6, I'm sorry, this There's just looks like a very balanced position. Very small edge for white, I yeah. think, because of the slightly more advanced knight on d4, the slightly better pieces, perhaps the c6 square. But it's so tiny that if he was playing against a weaker player, it would be one thing. But mm -hmm. No, I, mean, I don't see white as really... You don't even think... Some, what if you're playing... But you pick white between white and black, if you had to choose, or no? You think it's yeah, a total slightly. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's very, very small. I, razor I, thin. Razor thin. Just not enough to... You know, I, players of these of, at this level, you really... It, it's important that you emerge out of the opening with something. You need pressure, you need space, you need an imbalance that you can work with. This is not an advantage that uh, a world champion or any elite player is going to be satisfied with. Hmm. Well, m maybe not the, uh, the best outcome then for Hikaru Nakamura facing his main rival with white, but not getting much. Maurice with some news in another game. And a quick comment, guys, on this game. It's one of the problems with the random pairing system is that you may get such a key matchup early on and neither one of these players wants to risk anything this early in the competition so they may play more solidly a draw after 30 moves no problem and you'll see them probably come down if that draw does occur and say yeah you know it's it's what it is and then leave the battles for players they know are significantly weaker than them so maybe an adjustment can be made so that the fans can see much like the final four we get to see the end of the battle or the end of the tournament where the top players play one another Anyway, there's much more to go in that game, but I want to show you an exciting development in another game. We've seen this before. We were watching this game, Annie Wang versus Sabina Foyser, and, and Sabina plays very aggressively in the opening. F6, E5 had happened, and in this position, she castled, and now there is a sacrifice alert on the board. The move Knight takes on E4, that is the D Knight takes on E4, Pawn takes, and now D5, and forking these two pieces, going to get one of them back. Very importantly, black must maintain this light square bishop. If black just drops back casually so as not to wreck her pawn structure after this capture, well, we all know this one. A nice little check followed by the end after this rook sack queen to h5 would be mate. So black has to be very careful here after this fork on the move d5. The engine is giving bishop f7 as best. And after d takes c6, the very aggressive queen b6 to be played this bishop is now a key piece controlling the board but look at that pawn on e4 also weak so this is a transformation that Annie Wang will want to go for we'll see if she finds it on the next move guys thank you Maurice nice shot I always like those knight on d2 take 
E4. You, you think a position, you, you have this impression that you have this really, really close, solid position, and then suddenly uh, a piece sacrifice and the position gets ripped open. So a nice um, tactic there for white. Uh, again, I'm just kind of browsing through the games here, trying to figure out, okay, different... Uh, we were talking a moment ago about the hanging pawn structure. I'm going to the game uh, between Ruslan and Naji. Key for our matchups uh, in their the standings in the women's championship. Exactly. Both and of these players of Georgian descent. And here, when White plays the move d4 takes c5, and there is that recapture b takes c5, then we have our hanging knights. Hanging knights. Uh, hanging pawns. <laughs> hanging we're, knights, though. That is hanging like, knights. That sounded good. That would that would have worked for last round, right? Where yeah, the knights right. were hanging all the all over, but hanging pawns. They I were apologize. strong knights. Hanging yeah. knights. So hanging pawns uh, may be featured in that key uh, matchup in the ladies. Uh, moving back over to oh, to oh, this other key matchup, uh, Alyssa Melikina versus Katarina Nemco Nemsova. You were pointing out that knight c6, bishop b5. Right. Um, I thought that that was the way the game was going to go. Yeah, and the, the key here is that we don't really like giving up a bishop, but it's even more important that like, the whole crux of our position here is our centralized queen. Usually they tell you don't centralize your queen early in the game because it's going to get attacked. Right. But if Alyssa can arrange it so that none of the pieces can attack the queen, then it's actually awesome to have a queen on d4. It stops you from developing your bishop on f8 because we can take and take on g7, g7. Mm -hmm. and it just exerts a ton of pressure. So that's why um, Yasser, who's usually loath to give up his bishop, <laughs> yeah. is so happily playing bishop b5 and bishop takes c6. Exactly, because you maintain the queen on d4. But Kate uh, prefaced her move night. She said, no, I like being able to uh, tickle the white queen with knight c6, so she played a6, knight c4, putting pressure against the d6 pawn, knight c6, queen e4, and I think we're up to date at this moment. Yes, we are. Well, first impressions are that actually Elisa uh, should be pleased with the outcome of her favorite treatment of the Sicilian uh, with c3. Um, I prefer one. Yeah, it is nice to have that queen on e4 ready to play bishop d3 in castle and stop our opponent from castling. And there's also this harmonious idea of bishop g5 as well, disrupting black's queen and, you know, I can win the two bishops uh, by playing a knight takes d6. So if we do see a, a move like, for example, pawn takes, let's say knight takes e5, again, white just has the freer game and for the moment, too, the better development. So this... Uh, Preparation, we got to give Alyssa the nod. Yes, indeed. And uh, again, just. Ooh, by the way, whoa, we just saw a big move here. Check this out. A favorite opening. No, check this oh, out. Oh, so instead it. Knight, Knight takes, takes C3. C3. Ooh, a little fork trick. I didn't see that Yikes. one come on. Let, no, let's let's have a good look. Was, was this uh, a nicely planned uh, sacrifice? Well, this could be or a really nice liquidating move because White could be left with uh, some poor pawns. So, so after let's pawn takes c3, d5, we can play uh, queen g4. Yeah, let's just pause it here for a moment, because I, li I actually like white's possibilities now. I do like your move queen g4 uh, very much. Takes. So th the thing here is that black's structure has improved because, well, Big white's time. structure has decreased because now she's got this pawn on c3, which sticks out like a sore thumb. As well but as on the other hand, the white's activity has actually grown even more clear because we've developed our bishop, we're ready to castle, and you're going to have even more troubles developing your bishop on f8. So this is going to be a pretty principled battle. And here Yasser is. Sacker. <laughs> Pond grabber, and I'm sacking pawns. Wait a minute. I, I'm wearing the wrong hat. You I'm were just, just like so ready to castle. Yeah. Oh, I like white's attacking. Well, okay, so now let, let, let's play around and get checkmated. So let's take something. Oh, let's, I was going to take the c3 one. Oh, you want it? Oh, well, that's really. That's uh, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're me. really asking for it now, Jen. I don't know. Just something like bishop g5 and thank you for uh for, for being alive yeah, yeah for, for being so kind <laughs> okay i'll take another one okay no 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 no. queen takes c3 i'm gonna take all of them oh you're gonna be, oh you're really gonna die with a full stomach <laughs> exactly. okay so let's see how we're gonna do so it so queen it was takes, queen takes c3 bishop g5 bishop g5 now this you want to play knight takes e5 yeah, this looks like oh. it's gonna be some kind of morphe finish <laughs> oh you bet <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, I wouldn't have even gone there. Knight takes e5, queen takes e5. Well, let me just start picking up all the tempo I can. Say rook e1, attacking your queen. Okay, better not play queen f5. So <laughs> <laughs> That would be a bad choice. I agree with that one. So, okay, let's go back to a5. Go back to a5. Let's, let's threaten the old... Not, yeah, not to mention the fact that you, it might not have been too early. It might not have been too early for bishop takes e6. Right. Bishop just, takes e6 is a... Just, I, yeah, you, I, yeah. I was expecting I bishop d7, better. bishop... Yeah, bishop d7, bishop takes e6 is what I... So, but if, but if uh, yeah, we might as well show a line with bishop takes e6. And this is, this is what happens when you neglect castling. Right, right. Yes, exactly. And we don't even need the inclusion of rook d1 and bishop, bishop d7. It would still to be mating. To make this advantage. It would yeah, still to, be mating because you can't go to d8. Yeah, to make this line work. So that's why you shouldn't just take all the candy. Okay. And we, we actually have a, a special feature over at the World Chess Hall of Fame. There's new stuff going on all the time. There's special events. Um, I met a, a man who was asking me about how to get his wife interested in chess. She doesn't play yet. And I was like, well, take her to the Hall of Fame to some of the events there first because mm -hmm. it's a great gateway. Exactly. Right? Like you, one of those music events, those are fantastic. The mm -hmm. Wednesday night music events that they have monthly. Right. And then all of a sudden, you're at a chess club. Why don't we just play a game? Right, exactly. Sneak it in there. Well, for and me, the Bobby Fischer exhibition is really uh, just worth the visit. If you're anywhere near the vicinity, uh, you've got to go and see that. That's a real great, great exhibition. And Taryn is there right now with some information on what's going on. All right, thanks guys. I am here with Shannon Bailey from the World Chess Hall of Fame. We're gonna talk about some of the exciting upcoming exhibits mm -hmm. you guys have. Yeah. So which one that stands out for you? Well, one thing, um, one show that I think chess players are really going to love is we're doing a show called Encore, and those are ivory chess sets from the John Crum Miller collection. And John has worked with us before, and he's an avid chess player. Um, he has one of the top collections in the United States, and we were honored to have a show of his two years ago, but now we're going to look at a specific type of collection that he has. And so anyone will be able to walk in and think, wow, these sets are really beautiful. Um, chess players will really appreciate some of the playing sets. And then we are looking at ivory because ivory laws are changing right now, so it's having a big effect on collectors and museums. And so we're just going to showcase that. And so um, there'll be beautiful wall cases, and then there'll be some sets that are um, set up in specific historical games. So it'll be something for everybody. That's great. Anything else you want to highlight that's coming? Yeah, we're um, working with the artist Marcel Dezama again, and he is represented by the David Zwerner Gallery in New York, and he has an exquisite uh, film that he produced in 2013 uh, all about chess, and he created a bunch of artwork, um, 2D work and um, sculptures that were inspired by it. So we'll have that. They open May 14th here at the Hall of Fame. That's great. So there you have it. Art and chess coming together here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. As always, you can learn more at worldchesshof.org. Guys, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, the World Chess Hall of Fame, there's always something new and exciting going on there. And the Hip Hop Chess Federation, uh, uh, the Hip Hop Chess <laughs> Exhibit, right. which actually the Hip Hop Chess Federation founder, mm. Adiza Benjoko, did do a lot of work on. Yes. He was the, uh, the curator. Um, that, that's fantastic. You've got to go see that. There's a great film by Ben Kaplan, who's a local St. Louis artist. Okay. And you haven't seen it yet? I haven't. What? I just came from okay. Dubai. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me go a break. Go check it out. Go check it out. <laughs> and then give a review. It's, it's really beautiful. Wonderful. Cool. And Maurice has some uh, thoughts to share as we get going in round four. Yes, well, you know, we talk about principles and rules and uh, those things like uh, strategic ideas that we learn. And one of them is development. Get your pieces out. Well, it looks like Black has decided to neglect this idea in her game, the game between Anna Sherevich and Victoria Nee. Take a look at this position. After, we actually were on the board after uh, King F8, the exotic King F8, after Bishop to B5 check. This move, King F8, is not one you want to try at home unless you've got some sophisticated preparation. Well, after A4, stopping the advance, A6, B5, Bishop G5 looking to trade, Knight G, E2, this novelty. Well, we saw the trade happen, and after A6, attacking the bishop, the bishop dropped back, and now G6 was played, looking to develop the king. That's another time waster in the position. And after castles, King G7, look at Black's development.
as in no development. Uh, Anna Shervich said, really? This is how you play chess? Well, F4, I'm coming to get you right now. The knight went to E2 just so that it would not block this pawn after EF4, Queen F4. White has one, two, three, four, five attacking pieces. This rook will show up quite soon. White is well castled. Black has not developed a single piece. Yaz, what's the over and under on how long black should last in this game? It looks like 10 moves at most. It looks so bad. The engines are saying there's definitely a real edge here, but not a mating attack just yet. But to me, if I had black, I'd be peeing in my pants. Ooh. Guys. <laughs> well, don't do that at the board. We're either. black. Yeah, We're yeah, black. yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I've played some of those grotty defensive systems myself as black, and it really comes down to if black can maintain enough control over the E4, E5 break. If uh, Victoria is quick to be able to play knight b8, d7, e5, remarkably, her position's very resilient. If she doesn't, uh, and she allows Anna uh, e4, e5, and d5, d6 type of breaks, uh, Maurice is right. She will not, uh, black will just be overwhelmed. Uh, but it really comes down to a game of timing. I think she had played queen e7 when um, Maurice had uh, stopped his analysis. And it really comes down, uh, can Victoria get her knight uh, to e5 in time, or will Anna uh, unleash a sacrificial attack? It's really that straightforward now. Well, again, we're going to want to keep a close eye in, on Indeed. I have to go back to that Godekamsky uh, Timor Gariev game. Uh, again, a wing gambit. You do not see these gambits uh, at the highest level. And uh, again, uh, kudos to Timor for his courage in trying. Uh, something to get himself back in the tournament. And Jesus. kudos to Kamsky for taking it head on. He likes the pong. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. He's basic. He basically says, "Look, I'm the super solid guy. I haven't made any mistakes. Uh, if you're my opponent's going to give me material, I'm going to take it, and I'm just going to hold it with all my might." B takes a3, castles bishop g7, h3. Okay, that's a kind of a loss of a half tempo to my mind. Because of black, the move, the idea be, behind move h2, h3, simply to stop white, black from giving up his bishop, uh, trading his bishop for a knight. But if black were to do that, then you're going to get two, two bishops. So I don't see h3 as a necessary move, but that was Timor's choice. Castles, bishop g5, knight c6. Knight c3. Hmm. I'm finding that move a little bit uh, doubtful, but okay. Knight d7 by Gata, and this is the position they have at the board. And Gata saying, look, first of all, you haven't recaptured the pawn, so for the moment, uh, black is ahead two pawns. This bishop on g7, eyeballing this pawn on d4. Right. And this is where I had and questioned maybe... this move, knight c3. Uh, normally in a wing gambit, you want, oops, I beg your pardon. You you want to either use you want to use your C pawn, either for it to go to C three in the variations or to the C four square. So, plonking your knight in front of the pawn that's not in the spirit of the wing gambit. Yeah, I mean he wants to try to stick the knight on D five to go to fact that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's try. We could do it right now for sure. Knight to D five. The D four pawn is taboo because of the e7 pawn. That's right. Uh, no capturing here because of capturing here. But then, what about h6? So you're just going to come at me with g5 next. Precisely. I want to uh, push your pieces away from the e7 pawn so that uh, as black, I'll be able to grab this pawn on d4 in case of bishop g3. And again, for the moment, it is three pawns. Yeah, that's too You much. just don't see that. Way too much. You just don't see that a lot at this high level that uh, somebody is white in inside of 14 moves of sacrifice three pawns. That's pretty impressive uh, <laughs> gift giving. Maurice, what do you think about uh, Timor's gambit? I think that Timor has decided that he's going to go to outer space and play chess there and maybe beam down some moves to us. Uh, I think also he's deciding who he's playing against. He's very much being uh, a psychologist here because he knows he's playing against a player who likes solid, predictable positions. Someone like Komsky doesn't want to see erratic, crazy play, but also 
Kowski's seen it all, so you're not going to scare him by playing strange moves. But Timor is playing very confidently and very quickly, I might add. He's got an advantage on the clock already. I'd like to show you another game, though, that's gone crazy but has settled down. It features a double disco. Take a look at this one between Sam Sevian and Daniel Naroditsky. We left it at this position, and Sam, instead of, he had already won a pawn in the Marshall, won in air quotes, because obviously Black gets a lot of dynamic play with all these pieces ready and White's pieces still on the back row. But in this position, he said, I want more food. Thank you very much. Give me the pawn. I'm up two pawns. Well, and I'm also attacking a rook. Black said, okay, I'm going to play rook to d8. And my bishop was under attack, but I'm threatening a discovery on you. Bishop takes, followed by winning your queen. All right, nice idea. Well, I'm going to one-up you, said Sam. I'm going to disco on your queen. Your queen's under attack, and I'm hitting your rook. How about them apples? Well, he had to capture on a1. Did Naradisky? Bishop takes d8. Now the bishop's under attack. Bishop f8, and now h4 was played, breaking the pin on the back rank. I mean, breaking the back rank, mating issues, and threatening h5 trapping the bishop now black has a very aggressive queen it looks like these pawns are under pressure so he can calmly play h6 and wait wide out it looks like something's going to drop here but yes it's two pawns two pawns up for white and yet the engines are saying zero 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 dead even position according to the silicon beast assessing this game i'd be a little worried if i had the black pieces here my two pawns down two pawns deficit doesn't look like a lot of compensation on the board a lot of activity i don't know what's going to happen here for young naroditsky guys yeah, it's an interesting battle i think uh we should try to figure out what black's going to play here okay let me bring that uh yeah. because they the by the way the players did uh follow the line we had been looking at uh although we didn't look at the move h4 uh i have actually done some work with uh, mickey adams mickey uh, in the world's top ten, uh, most of his career, has always been a big, big fan of the Marshall Gambit as black. And um, I really admire uh, the dynamic play that the Marshall Gambit uh, offers uh, the second player. It is two pawns, but the two bishops, which often features for black in the Marshall Gambit, uh, does give him a lot of compensation. After the move h4, if in Danya's shoes, I would really be looking very closely at the move queen d1 with a very straightforward idea. I want to play bishop takes d3 and want to play queen takes f1. That's about as straightforward as you can possibly get, right? So if uh, black, pardon me, if white felt inclined to try to stop that attack, well, here's the martial gambit in its fullest glory. I'm a pawn down, but the two bishops, almost always these endings, and if you look at the games of Mickey Adams, time in and time out, he's proven that black, uh, black's position is, is absolutely fine. So I don't know, queen d1, so, uh, h7, h6 is uh, uh, quite possible, but queen d1 would uh, attract my attention. I think Maurice is looking at queen d1, queen a8 with a counterattack for oh, white. How's okay. that going? Sure, let's have a look at that. So queen d1. Queen d8. So we, 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 we've been doing double discos, and it looks like, like everybody's doing the same thing to one another. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, so something like this, and maybe at the end of this particular line, it's worked out in White's favor, because uh, at least in this case, Sam Sevillan will snap the f7 pawn. Yeah, because you got f7 before I got f2. Precisely. You got f7 before I got f2. So queen d1, queen, queen d1, queen a8. Queen a8 is the business. Huh. Okay, intriguingly no. enough. Suppose we take. Um, hmm. That looks simply good. Uh, that's why uh, the silicon beasts uh, have suggested h7, h6, or maybe well, we could play like we could play like queen e1 there. Even uh, in that position. After queen d1, queen, queen a8. Queen a8, queen e1. Yeah, but then if you're going to play queen e1, you might as well get in it. I'm not well, exactly... Well, because, th because then you might have to just go back. That's all. I mean, uh -huh. if you don't have anything better, you're going to have to go back to, to defend e5. It, to and maybe that's variations like that, or maybe why the computer is saying zero, zero, zero. You mean, okay, so... So I'm saying like queen d1, queen a8. If we play queen e1, now we're turning bishop takes d3. 
And if you can't play bishop e7, what else can you do? Well, you can, can I, play bishop c, bishop. Okay. Yeah, you just just just, just back off, right? Directly, huh? To see if I can't transpose into that line where we both mutually grab pieces on f1 and f8 squares. And this is exactly the same, huh? It looks like it's going to transpose, yeah? yeah. I mean, you're and we're going to have to play h6, and mm. you're going to end up getting f7, which is not exactly what we want. Precisely. Yeah. So let's just go back here for a moment. Uh, after bishop f8 has been seen, h4, let's try h5 for just a moment. Um, I can understand why. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, h6 yeah. is also... Uh, so if, from we're, if we're toggling between queen d1 and queen e1, then why not actually make a move that's useful? Yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought about that? And now a big difference. Finally, I mean, it gets funny, right? Because then it's in this, in this uh, contest as to who wins f7 and who wins f2, now we see a line in which it's black who gets f2 yeah, before, <laughs> before you get f7, right? That's, that's kind no of a, good, yeah. That's kind of intriguingly humorous, actually. Yeah, so some funny lines here, and we're starting to see why this game might end up in a well-played theoretical draw. Yeah. We, meanwhile, Maurice with uh, more on a big matchup in our women's division with uh, Nazi Pekidzi and and Rusadan Golotiani, right? That's actually the, the match in the women's side that has the most points. Exactly, between so the two players. That's like, we've got to keep a real close eye on it. Yes, and it looks like a former women's champion is really putting pressure on her opponent, inducing one of those weird moves to appear on the board. Take a look at this, guys. In this position, it started off quite quietly, nothing special, pawns barely touching right now. And in this moment, Rusudan played C takes D5, and now pawn takes back and D4, a simple transformation in the center, and those potential hanging pawns we're seeing maybe happening on the board. After rook c8, rook to c1, and black played the move a6, little uncertain move, weakening this side just a bit. And now knight to e2, a knight maneuver meant to plunk the knight down on the f4 square and also free this diagonal for her bishop. Nice idea, knight e2, very natural move. What is unnatural is the response, knight back to b8. Knight back to b8, looking to reroute the knight to the d7 square, but this has got to get Rusudan thinking, wait a minute, my knight's going to go to f4, I'm going to have a capture, a potential take here. This knight gets out of the way, and that d5 pawn is going to come under enormous pressure. So knight b8, an interesting development in this game. If Rusudan wins, she goes to three and a half and begins to try to separate herself from the pack. Of course, Katarina Nemsova has something to say about that, but still a game we will keep an eye on. Guys? Wow, nice. Knight b8. I like White's position there after that move. Right. A lot of interesting chess, I think, today that we're going to see in the Women's Championship in particular. Yes, and uh, I also just, before we did go on a break, uh, coming back to table number two, Ray Robson versus Vara Kobian. Uh, two bishops for Ray. He had that uh, opening an advantage uh, for within the first half dozen moves or so, and now he has made his expansion on the on the king side. He's just followed up with the move g4. Take a look for a moment at this light square bishop of Var. It has no uh, place on the board, so to speak. I mean, it's it, it's blocked from going either queen side or going king side. And there's a nice little point that I I did want to make that in cave of the strategic mistake f7, f5, then I believe after g4, g5 takes, bishop takes, even though it's white's pawn structure that looks a little bit more messed up, in fact, the position's opening up very nicely for the dark square bishop, and Ray Ray uh, would be in the driver's seat in this particular position, and having started with two and a half points, he suddenly becomes a, a serious force to be reckoned with. Everybody talked about Hikaru and Wesley and Gada, uh, we didn't know. We knew that there would be some kind of X factor. We just wasn't sure what it was. Where it would come from. And, and now, looks, right, now we know. Or maybe Sevian, too. And, well, for the moment, we do know. And it's Ray who is uh, putting the pressure on his very uh, experienced opponent, Verujan Okobian. And he is going to push. We are going to be back with more action from round four of the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships in U.S. Women's. If you got a tweet to send us, question, comment, hashtag U.S. Chess Champs, and we'll take some of them on the air. And we'll be right back.
Chess.com. Chess.com is social. Now you can play chess with your friends whenever you want, whether that's middle of the day or middle of the night. You can get instantly matched up with one of over 5 million other members from around the world. You play live games in real time, turn based games at your convenience, or tournaments with anyone at any time. Chess.com is mobile. You can play online from your computer, or you can play on the go from your tablet or your smartphone. No matter where you go, whether you're at work, grabbing a bite to eat, or just enjoying some time at the park. Your games are there with you, and keeping multiple chess games going 
has never been easier. Chess.com is for learning. Don't just play chess, get better. The best chess training resources have never been more accessible. Learn essential chess strategy quickly and easily with the extremely popular Tactics Trainer Tool. Improve your game in ways you didn't know were possible with training videos by chess masters. And regardless of where you're at now, take your game to the next level with multiple simple to use training tools. Chess.com is for everyone. Over 250 million chess games have been played on Chess.com. And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or a grandmaster. Chess.com is the place to play and learn chess. So create your free account now and see what Chess.com is for you. and welcome back to the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships and U.S. Women's Chess Championships here in St. Louis, the capital of chess in America. We've had several breaking developments in the open section of the U.S. Championships while we were on break. We want to go right in to the game, the featured game between West, uh, Hikaru Nakamura and Wesley Slow. I noticed, Jen, that uh, uh, in this position after move 15, rook fd1, Wesley actually really slowed down a great deal exactly at this point. He went into the tank and he made the strategic decision of giving up the two bishops to force the isolated queen pawn. And then he fell, followed up with the move knight b8. His problem was that uh, the more desirable square, knight f6, the problem is, is that with the c-file open and with white possessing the two bishops, after move a2, a3, just preparing to bring the rook over to the c-file, uh, if Wesley ever tried to defend the c-file with rook to c8, there's this bishop a6 move. Let me just put that on the board for a second. And this is a kind of an annoying, annoying uh, line of play for black. And that's kind of the root of the incremental advantage that we were talking about earlier, that those b5 and a6 squares. Yes. c6. It's, for instance, if the pawn were in b7, that wouldn't be in the air at all. Exactly. So it's that tiny little thing. And Wesley covered up his queenside uh, light squares with the move knight b8. Now what he's trying to do is reroute his knight to c6, where he'll put direct pressure on the pawn on a d so knight b8, and we're seeing this, uh, I, I prefer the two bishops, I prefer uh, Hikaru's position, and Wesley has to be very, very careful in uh, this position of an isolated queen pawn. So for example, rook on a1 to c1, knight c6, very uh, normal looking move. Let's say, for example, bishop c4. If you wanted to try to trade this bishop, rook takes, pardon me, or queen, yeah, rook takes. Uh, you do get the knight to the d5 square, but white has full command over the c-file. Later, he's going to post up his bishop on e3. It's just a more comfortable position for Hikaru to play. Uh, on our other table, by the way, I, I really like the way Ray has slow p played his advantage. He's just played this move, bishop e3 to f4. I'm not a big fan of that move so much as I liked the idea of just bringing the two bishops into play with bishop d3 and rook e1. I really think that white has a nice pressing advantage on the king side, better central, con central control, and overall I really like Ray's position. Also while we were on break, I was talking with Maurice Ashley. We were having a lot of fun, of course. Uh, the nice thing about commentating Yes, you know, we get to sacrifice all of our pieces. Do it. If, if it doesn't work, okay, we'll take our moves back. And so we got to this position, and uh, uh, Maurice is going knight d5, h6, bishop here. And I was trying to move g5, which was not played by Gata. I was playing g5 and bishop g3, and Maurice and I were just having some fun in this position. But w then when the players got to this position after g5, oop, pardon me. I'm thinking, 
The reason that Goddard Karamski did not play the move G5, Snap. he he may have been worried about Bishop takes the the old peace sacrifice with a straightforward idea of I'm going to give you checkmate with queen h5, h7. Right, okay, so if we play e6 there, for instance, you just play queen h5 straight away. Yes, exactly. So if we go to this position, e7, e6, with a double attack against the knight on g5 and the pawn on d5. And we're going to bring the knight to, to defense in f6, but unfortunately one move too late because... We just remove the defender and check mate. So, so instead we'd have to come up with something else in this position. And maybe there's not something else that you'd really be happy about. Gata was oh. not, not happy about allowing this and what he simply did is he chose the move knight b6 and knight b6 and you heard, earlier you heard me make mention of the fact that in the spirit of the uh, wings gambit whites uh, supposed to use a C pawn, and now he does that with the move C2, C3. And at this point, I would be very satisfied with, uh, I know Gata likes the pawns, I like the pawns, but as white, I'd be very satisfied uh, with the outcome of the position at hand. Now Maurice has some thoughts on this game as well. <clears throat> yes, now the engines are saying that black has basically no advantage, and when you know that you're up two pawns and the engines are saying that you have no advantage, that means that the other guy has a lot of compensation in terms of space, in terms of development, and in terms of pressure. I'd like to go down that line a little bit, Yaz, because the mating attack was so interesting. The move G5 was definitely decent, at least decent for white after bishop takes, takes, knight takes. The reason why here is that black could not get away with knight F6 with big advantage because of the move E5 another sacrifice opening the line for this bishop and allowing this knight to drop because of course the queen is going to go to the h5 square and if you just capture normally here knight takes on f6 e takes f6 attacking the knight which was the piece you would try to eject except that was the purpose of the e5 move because now you can ignore that attack on the knight because it's your bishop that's the real star of this position having the checkmate happen on the h7 square. So that's why Gata decided to neglect that line. Instead, he played the move knight to b6, and the engine just says c3, solid, keeping that center intact. He's about to take the pawn now on a3. Bishop can always drop back, and this pressure is annoying. That e7 pawn is under pressure. This trade here is not something you want out of the position after takes. Your knight really has no good home but to go back, and then you see the pressure along this long diagonal. The rook can get to the e-file. Black's pieces are not well coordinated, so Timur's opening can be counted by him as a success against a guy like Gadakomsky, and he's going to have to work really hard. We see Baruj and Kobe in there working hard as well, but Komsky looks like the players with the black pieces under a lot of pressure in these openings, trying to make sure they solidify. Not going to be an easy task in the next several moves. Guys? Very good. Thank you, Maurice. And again, coming back to our feature table uh, between Hikaru Nakamura, the number one seed going up against the number two seed. After the move, knight c6, bishop b5. Um, I, I'm just, I, there's, there's some uh, tactics to, to take a look at, Jen. When you see the move rook c8, which looks pretty natural after all, you're defending the knight on c6, then you say, ooh, is the rook on c8 trapped? Can't I play the move bishop a6 and you can't put the rook on the c7 yeah. square or the b8 square They're thanks tricky. to the bishop. Yeah, if you, go, if you go into the corner, well, I've got your rook trap, but there is a tactic in the position. That's J right, I can play knight takes d4 here. With the threat of knight captures e2 check. Oops, uh, white would not have time to play rook takes c8 because of knight takes e2 check. And if we go rook takes d4, then rook takes c1 and uh, black wins. You want to change, yeah. So, so uh, after the move rook c8. That's a cool one. Yeah, um, there is not the move bishop uh, a6. Black, pardon me, white may have to take a move uh, to make a move to defend the pawn on d4, something like queen e3, and then that threat of bishop a6 is a real threat, and uh, we might see that, for example, in this position, Wesley would have to drop 
back with his knife. Right, aiming for a switcheroo at some point, perhaps, or the, posting the knight up on f5. Right, right. So a lot going on in that game. Again, we mentioned the Timor game. I like Ray's game, and let's just shoot over to the women's section for a moment. Uh, just a second. This is how our is future our table. Okay, how's our defending champ going? Okay. Arena will be down. I'll get to Arena's game in a moment. When we had left it, uh, this uh, awkward retreat by Black, Knight B8, not the type of move you want to make in this type of position. Uh, Maurice was pointing out how these white knights are ready to hop into Black's camp with Knight F4, Knight E5. But there's also this very annoying move, Bishop H3, which is oftentimes featured in such positions. Uh, knight e5, very straightforward move by Ruslan. Knight d7, knight f4, rook c7. Already, uh, Najee's feeling the pressure. She wanted to, to avoid this awkward pin, bishop h3, and arguably make room for her queen with queen a8. But I'm just thinking about this hanging pawn uh, situation. I could maybe capture on c5 and probably force a recapture with the knight to keep this pawn on d4, uh, d5 uh, sufficiently protected. Really big advantage, in my opinion, uh, for Ruslan in this game. We'll just move over to uh, Kate's game. This was the one where, on move nine, we were all surprised by all knight right. takes c3. And then I started trying to take all the pawns and get checkmated in spectacular style. You did good. You did good. <laughs> yeah. we, we were all proud of you. Uh, 11, queen e3, that's not the most aggressive. That's. No, we were looking at Queen G4. Yeah, this is the much more logical. solid move, whereas I really was uh, uh, drumming uh, the move Queen G4. Maybe she thought there was some something with like some tempo gaining move, perhaps with H5 at some point, that made things a little bit dicier for those sack lines. Okay, but that's a yeah. weakening move too, of though. Course, I mean, yeah. go ahead, go for it, H5. But that was not Elisa's choice. She played it solid, but now I think uh, Kate feels justified. Oh, bishop e7. I thought that she was bringing her queen to the a5 square to support bishop c5, but of course there's queen g5 yeah, in that case. Yeah, queen g5 is kind of annoying. So bishop e7 was played, bishop d2, bishop d7. A little slow play by the players, but still, this pawn on e5 really gives white um, a lot of space and her bishop on d3. So for example, after a move like rook e1, if black castles queen um, e4 setting up that battery provokes a lot of dark square weaknesses after a move like g6, both the f6 and h6 square are weakened. Yeah, right, and there's not that much that black can do about that. She's probably just going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Another uh, very standard idea in such positions is not to make the queen e4 move right away, but first to go h4 and h5 and setting up for that queen e4. So, Elisa. Nice, uh, but I also feel like black can be, even though I love attacking and I love the c3 Sicilian, I think that black's position can sometimes be more resilient here than it seems at first. Okay. Because there's just a lot, of, there's just a lot of defensive resources. Except, I hate this bishop on d7. That bishop really needs to be on the mm, long yeah, diagonal. Well, it's a passive Where it piece. usually is in those types of pan off positions with similar types of attacks. Exactly. So here, I'm not a big fan of Black's position, and I know what you're saying, it's solid and resilient and all the rest of it, but just uh, making some straightforward moves for a Bishop moment. Bishop yeah. Yeah, and I'll bring my rook over here. I'll, I'll offer this pawn as a bait, and I'm thinking, for example, if you do snap, and I go like this, and you go like this, and I'll take, take. I've got, for at the cost of a simple pawn, I've got a pretty nice attack brewing against Black's King, thanks for, to those weakened darks were. So uh, one of our tournament leaders, Kate, uh, under pressure, she'll have to show her defensive yeah. metal. And this, this is Alyssa's strong point, too, these types of attacking positions with a small edge. I think she feels more comfortable in them. Well, who doesn't? But <laughs> who doesn't, right? But in particular, I, I feel yeah. that I've seen a, not, a lot of nice wins for her in this type of uh, structure. Now, so let's defending go. defending champion Marina Crush was a massive disappointment yesterday. Right. Um, how is she doing today? She's playing a perva, and as black, the players a with one and a half out of three, so doing pretty well considering it's her first U.S. Women's Championship. She was invited as a wild card. And we have a, a classical Nimzo, uh, white, my, one of my favorite uh, systems is white, just oh. gaining the two bishops. 
Irina excels in this position as white. It's interesting to see her play it from the black side. So now she's going to teach her opponents how to play the uh, black position, knight e4. She's playing it very aggressively. All, all of these uh, moves have been uh, well known. Knight d7, knight e2, queen e7, f3. Now that's an interesting move, f2, f3, provoking black to making that trade. I think as white here, I would have simply played knight c3, inviting the same type of trade. If you want to take on g3, go for it. That wasn't white's choice. f3 was played, takes, takes, and a totally different approach. I like the knight on c3. I'm not a big fan of the knight on g3. h5 by uh, arena. Well, that's, yeah, that's one of the drawbacks of having a knight on the g3 or b3, that your opponent can just kind of ram their pawn down like that. And um, there we go, bishop d3, king b8, e4, uh, grabbing the center, as much center as she can get. Trying to gain some pluses for herself, because otherwise it just seems like black has the edge with them, some, that play that she's generating on the queen side. So a perp would trying to say, well, at least maybe your bishop on b7 is going to be dormant. Exactly. h3. G3, now D5, whoa. Oh, that, now that That's a totally familiar. different approach to the position. I didn't think that black was going to make that kind of a central break in this position. It's funny that you, as, as, as such like a brilliant strategic player, it's funny mm. that you jump out of your chair when you see yeah, that like, move. Because like most people are like jumping out of their chair with there's a checkmate, but you're jumping out of your chair because D5 tends to be anti-positional in situations like this because sometimes white could play e5 and then you know take twice on d5 and then after e5 the bishop on b7 is terrible. Right. But I think what Irene is going for it is the activity that will come after c5. Perhaps white's king is just stuck in the, in the center. So if c takes d5, takes d5, e5, positionally that's awesome. Right. But just an immediate c5. Well, here we go. Uh, it's a, again, it might be a timing issue, but a move like d5, you have to be really careful that you don't end up with some extremely passive, uh, as you said, dormant bishop on b7. We would call it a septic bishop in the northwest, by the way. So a, a key variation would be cd, ed, e5, c5. And let's get our king out of the way for a second. King b1, c takes d4, e5. And if white ever manages to play knight takes d4 and keep this bishop under lock and key, uh, white's going to have a great game. I'm guessing that uh, Irina has seen variation like this. Whether she tosses in rook c8 and queen d2 or not, I guess she's counting on the move f7, f6 as breaking up white's fantastic chain of pawns from h2 to e5. So let's go back for a second. Just in this position, if I were in a her shoes, I would probably, uh, in this exact moment, I would just go for the quiet move, king b1, setting up for those types of positions. And then the question is whether or not Irina is ready to break with c5. I suppose she is, and I'm going to say the position's roughly balanced. Balance, but that's very different than equal. Absolutely. Right, when you look at the So Nakamura game earlier, you said that was equal. Mm -hmm. Now it's getting a little juicier, but very, very different than balance. Yeah. Well, usually when I mean balance, I think, I, I, I guess it's a nice way of saying all three results are possible. Right. When we use the term equal, we're kind of thinking that the draw has a higher uh, likelihood than otherwise. Okay, back to our feature table, board one. Number one versus number two, bishop b5, rook c8, rook c3. Uh, also another way of uh, dealing with the bishop a6 threat. And setting up for the bishop a6 threat. Previously against queen e3, we were trying to move knight e7, and then the queen on e3 was, was going to be tempoed uh, by uh, a knight, c, uh, knight e7, f5. So rook c3, Hikaru's followed it up with bishop a6. And what Hikaru is trying to do in this position is to try to convince black to trade pawns, no longer an isolated queen pawn, but now he's got ideas of c4 and d5. Right, and no longer a homey square for your pieces on d5. Uh, the sad part is that after a move like bishop b5, I've seen a lot of top grandmasters in such positions end up making repetitions. So bishop a6, I would see Wesley as saying, okay, I'll just, I'm not going to help your, help you, uh, your pawn structure. 
uh, by trading on C3, I'll just play rook to uh, C6 and ask you what you're doing. Uh, from what, from Black's That's not what we had in mind. No, yesterday. no, we didn't want to see this a safe, script. solid draw. But Maurice kind of got it right there when he said, when you have the number one and number two players in the field playing against each other too early in the event, um, they tend to play cautiously. Close to the vest. Well, also, it, 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 it's kind of unfortunate that Wesley got the black pieces here because he's the one half a point behind. Exactly. So, and yet he knows that he even said in his interview that against Nakamura, such a strong player, it's hard to like. Just go in there and be like, I'm going to play for the win, right? Because right. it depends on what he plays, well, right? For sure. And as we see, he's played very solidly, so so is trying to equalize. I think if the colors were reversed, maybe we'd get a little more action. Precisely so. Which yeah. is easy to say after we see this game. Exactly. And we've got Maurice for some news on another game in the U.S. Chess Championship. Well, two players, one who would never be threatened with playing solidly, the other who typically plays solidly but decided he's going to go for it. The game between Ray Robson and Var Akobian, and you see the players here. In the game earlier, there was a very important move, an, a move that I called the most important trade in all of chess, the move Bishop takes knight. And when you play a move like this, you decided you're going to give up a bishop for a knight, hand your opponent the two bishops, you have to figure out if you can control the opposite color from your bishop. Why is that? You've given up your dark squared bishop. That means you have two pieces that can control the light squares, two minors that is, while your opponent only has one because this dark squared bishop can never ever control the light squares. So you're going to have to dominate the light squares, which is why you see this move happen. D5. He's saying, okay, you're going to have the dark squares because you have the dark square bishop, but I am going to dominate those light squares. So after the move h5, trying to get a little control himself of the light squares, castles, now f3, rook d8, g4. And white's saying, no, you're not going to dominate the light squares. I'm going to get a piece of that action. Well, the move a6, stopping any pin on this side, but also putting it on a light square. Black, uh, white played bishop f4, now trying to make some use of his bishop. And now the move f Five, a very serious move again looking for light square domination and allowing this move g5 now he has traded and bishop takes and essentially black again is saying you got the dark squares i'm going to give it to you you have your bishop but i'm going to find a way to dominate these light squares the problem is that this knight still does not yet have an anchor square it's sitting way back in the position not really offering that much pressure to the d4 pawn so i don't see the future of this piece I'm sort of kind of liking White's game here, Yaz, because that bishop just looks so free, so easy, and it looks like there's going to be no opponent for the rest of the game. What do you think? It looks to me like White's the one with the edge. Oh, without question. This is exactly the type of position that Ray Robson wanted with the two bishops, and I alluded it uh, to this exact line earlier in a different uh, variation. That is to say, the pawn on f5 by black. I'll just bring that position up on my board for a second. It says, if we go back for a moment, <clears throat> we get this position. Uh, let's say um, uh, white had played in this position g5. And it looks very similar to the game, except there's a massive uh, difference of major importance. In this line of play, Black would have a very good bishop on f5. In the game, the way Ray played it, he played bishop f4, waited for black to occupy the square f5 with his pawn so that now in this position there is, in fact, no bishop takes f5. Uh, perhaps from Var's point of view, if we just play a few more moves, Var was thinking that, okay, great, you are slightly better. Uh, but the position so reduced, I should be able to draw. That may be true, but on the other hand, it's at a nice advantage for white, and I like white's uh, opportunities here very much. If I was to go back a moment and just uh, be a little bit critical of Ray's decision to play bishop f4, not a bad move, but I might have felt that a move, for example, like c2, c3 was actually more useful because if then we were to transpose into the game, this pawn on c3, in fact, is a good pawn. It defends the pawn on d4, and it sets up for bishop to d3. But in any case, I do like the way I do like the way the situation is. 
gone in Ray's favor, and he's looking really good. A big star of this tournament. And, and we have Taryn, actually, who's with Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez for his thoughts on the, the, the various uh, twists and turns of this exciting U.S. Chess Championship. Thanks, Jen. I am here with Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez, and last year you played in the U.S. Chess Championships. Can you kind of take us through the mindset of what the players are going through while they're up there? Well, it's definitely very stressful. I remember I've played this tournament three years in a row, and it's one of the most fun tournaments to play in because of the sheer strength of the players, but it's also one of the most stressful because it's so important, and you have to score so many points against people that are just amazing chess players. So it's stressful, it's fun, it's a combination of emotions. Uh, of course, it's frustrating, but sometimes you get a lucky break and it feels really good. What kind of preparation do they have to go through after each day before the next round? Well, everybody takes it differently. You know, you have players uh, that prepare more, some people that prepare much, much less. We have players that come here and they think, okay, my preparation is going to be sleep 18 hours and then I'll show up to the game. And there's players that, you know, they've studied for two months and they're going to review five hours before the game, all their analysis and all their preparation. Yeah, and you're here as one of the commentators at the Kingside Diner. So what's it like to do that? And, you know, is it a little bit less pressure for you since you're not up there? Well, it's also a combination of emotions. I mean, of course, it's less pressure, and it's always fun to come to the U.S. Championship. It's my favorite tournament of the year. But at the same time, you see all these guys playing, and I'm like, oh, I want to be in there. I want to be playing. I want to be showing my own ideas. There you go. Well, you guys can come over here. Your ticket will get you into the Kingside Diner and will allow you to sit in on the live commentary from him and Ben Feingold. So make Highly recommended. Come out to the St. Louis Chess Club in person. Watch Alejandro and Ben. You can also see us on the big screen outside. It's just... Yeah. It's an unforgettable experience. If you haven't booked your tickets for this, at least come out for one of the upcoming events that we're going to have here. Absolutely. And the Kingside Diner is a nice place, too. Breakfast all day. Yeah, breakfast all I day. I love that. And an uh, interesting development in the game between Sam Sevillan and Daniel Naroditsky. Uh, when we had left at Jen, we were we about these four. perhaps to some kind of drawlish line. Y yes, exactly. H4. We had been considering uh, h5 as well as h6. h6 was Danya's choice, h5, bishop, h7. Now, in this position, uh, we've been looking at these moves of queen d1 and bishop takes d3 and queen a8 and what have you. A, a perplexing de decision by uh, young Sam Sevillan. He's played the move f2, f4. Arguably, he's thinking that he'll be able to shut down this bishop with, with the move f4, f5. Black could simply say, well, fine, let me take pawns while you're doing that operation. Queen takes b2 looks like a very good move to my mind. But also, queen d1, that same ideas that we've been having and been looking at before. And if you try to play f5, well, thank Oops. you very much. I'll take this pawn you're over so here. You're good at winning pawns, Yasser. Yes. That's your thing. It, I, I made a career out of it, by the way. Uh, give me your pawn. But uh, I think that queen takes b2 and Dan, uh, Daniel Narodisky is going to be very fine in uh, this martial gambit. Now, let's take some tweets. We have one from uh, Jonathan Manley at Kingpin Ed that says, I feel like a 19th century person built for a different era, Yasser Sarwan. <laughs> Did you really say that? Yes. Okay. And we also have Lou Adamson from Cape Town, South Africa. He says, there's been some alien chess so far. Awesome coverage. Thank you Thank for you. watching, you know, from all over the world. We love to hear it when somebody's watching from another country because in, there's hundreds of countries that tune in. Absolutely. Well, I think almost 200. Um, and I think that it's really cool to see that at the U.S. Chess Championship, people are tuning in internationally because they should be. We've got two of the top ten players in the world. Well, to begin with, and, and half the field is in the top 100. We've got one of the strongest national championships outside of Russia and other really, really top countries. So we're proud. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so keep those tweets coming to hashtag U.S. Chess Champs. We also got one from Stefan Strandberg, which brings us to another game. He asked us in the Kansky gorayev game, after that G5 thing that we were looking at, the sacrifice, yes, right. um, what would happen if the rook came to E8? 
So oh, he was looking let, for that escape. Well, 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 we'll do our best to answer that one, and right? While, yeah, while I'm taking um, hashtag US Chess Champs questions, I want to point out that Leonard o Oates here um, at, the, at the chess club, who's doing photography and tech stuff, took a phenomenal photo yeah. of Hikaru versus Wesley Cell. So you probably want to look at that. That's, it's just beautiful. Yeah, nice just, black and white. Yeah, I mean, just catching some of their expressions, especially two guys who are pretty expressive. Nakamura is very expressive, but almost rivaling. Gary Kasparov and the expressiveness of his face. And Wesley, actually, I, I noticed yesterday against Sebian that he's a little bit more emotional and expressive than I might have thought. Right. He has this demeanor at the board of being very, very calm and cool, but he a little tall-like. He sometimes flashes, uh, uh, stares at his opponent. Uh, going to the question uh, about that peace sacrifice, this was the one that Maurice and I had been looking at. So it was h6, bishop h4, we dropped back and we were trying to line g5, I think. And when did that move rook e8 make its appearance? He was probably looking at takes, takes. Um, he's probably Knight looking takes. at trying to run, to with, run away with rook e8 in this position. But now queen h5, We've got uh, black is going to have issues on both the f7 and the h7 square. Um, I, I wonder can't, if he's just thinking that it's not checkmate. That could be the that could be what you're thinking, but boy, this is just not a position that you want to hand to such a headhunter like uh, Timur Dariev here. Uh, I've got a feeling that uh, this is a very very nice position for for. White we'll certainly with plenty takes, of compensation. Takes. We've got this check. You always have the perpetual in reserve, right? So that's but good to know. I'm going to drive. I'm going to use the bishop to drive that king. Uh oh, you got me in this line. <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, king goes to f8. There's queen f7 check. And of course, bishop f6 would allow queen f7 and queen h7 mate as well. Exactly. Just uh, what you said, Jen. If the uh, bishop takes f6. You're allowing me uh, queen h7 as well. So I don't think rook e8 was a viable defense. Maurice has more on this exciting tactical game. Well, that's what's interesting. The game has become a bit more suppressed. No tactics at all. Gadakomsky avoiding any sharp moves, and he allowed his opponent to consolidate his position, consolidate his spatial advantage in the middle of the board. And Gurev's got to be feeling pretty good about himself, but I just saw a move that caught my eye that I probably wouldn't have played. The move C3 happened in the game. This is exactly what Black was probably not hoping for when he accepted the wing gambit to give the white pawns that kind of dominant center. The A pawn will drop. So the extra pawn really doesn't matter here because white's good. White's happy. So bishop to D7, very passive, just laying back, developing pieces. Timor said, give me the pawn. I got one back. Don't give me another one back or I might stand better. Rook to E8, talk about solid defensive chess, just holding his own. Rook to E1, maybe not the most accurate, but he's saying, I'm going to improve my pieces. Rook to C8. Now, a move here that's really fascinating, suggested by the engine, really surprising, in fact, that I really liked, I, this reminds me of Karpov, was the move knight back to E3. How do you like that one, Yaz? Bringing the knight back and saying, I'm going to offer you no trades whatsoever. I've got this pin on your queen. How do you unleash this bottleneck of pieces in your position? Plus, there might be a threat of d5. That might happen later. Picking off your a pawn. Just keeping all the threats and the dynamism, the dynamism in the position. Instead of putting the knight on e3, he played rook to e3. Now, that one's really paradoxical to me. The rook's not going anywhere from here. I'm sure Black's not thinking G5. Maybe that's the point. He's super prophylaxis against G5. That's a wild idea. Rook to E3. Hard to justify in this position. The engines are saying Black's a tiny bit better with that plus pawn. And uh, it seems as though a move has been played in the game. The trade has taken place on D5. As uh, we had said, maybe this did not have to happen if the knight had moved. Let's see how the events transpire now that the e-file is going to get open. Guys? Thank you, Maurice. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm giggling to myself because sometimes I just have to laugh when I see uh, the play of the modern grandmasters. Uh, the player I really love, I re uh, Alexander Morozevich, to me, he's a creative genius par excellence. And I go through his games 
And I really, really pat myself on the back when I can guess like three in a row. I mean, like I've done tremendously <laughs> well, right? Now, while, while Maurice was giving this great ex exposition on why the retreat night D5 made the most sense, before he was mentioning that, I was thinking to myself, the only move I'm considering here is rook E1 to E3. That's the only move I'm considering, right? So you're patting yourself in the bag. And this is Timor going yeah, but I have just as hard a time with Timor as I do with uh, Alexander Morozevich in terms of guessing his moves. So he plays the extremely logical, for me, move rook e3. And maybe I should explain well, well, why I think that this move is very logical. Okay, in my mind, from White's point of view, he's a pawn down, but he's got this nice central pawn, the central pawn duo, as well as pressure, thanks to this oops, pardon me, I'm not highlighting the pawn the way I want to, thanks to this bishop uh, kind of bottling up black's position. So with the move rook e3, in my mind's eye, what this move, move creates is, first of all, that it makes it very difficult for black to untangle by trades because then the queen will come to e2 and a, a, a lot of pressure pounding down this e, e, e file. And also this rook on a3 isn't just a defensive piece, but it's also eyeballing on a good day this a7 pawn. So rook on e3 is a multi-purpose move. There's a potential to attack the e7 pawn, the necessity of defending c3, and a good day it could rover. It could come over to the king side. So I like this move as a kind of a building up move. What Marie said made also a great deal of sense too, that the knight just kind of drops back. You can build up the position with queen d2 and perhaps a knight g5. Anyway, after rook e3, we did see the move knight takes d5, e takes d5, and Gada has played knight a5, uh, blocking white from ever grabbing this pawn on a7. But this looks like nice pressure for white. The natural move would be queen e2, uh, piling up, if you will, against this pawn on e on e7. And let me just put a, I don't know if this is a bad move or a good move or not. Let me just put bishop on f8 for the moment, right, on the board. Then I would be thinking about a move like knight d2, again, mentioning that rover, but also, you know, the knight can come to e4, Throwing knight comes to d6. d6. Uh, this is not a pleasant position. That's not that it's bad or anything like that, but it sure White's feels like fun. White's having a lot of fun. Yeah, that's exactly right. So and that's just what Timur wants. I mean, look at his shirt, look and, at his yeah. shoes. And this nice attacking game, a uh, free-flowing game. So no. Gada Kamsky, defending champion under pressure, even though he's the one with the material advantage. Similar point from uh, Patrick JMT, our YouTube Bath star, um, but instead of Morozevich, he gave a shout out to um, Jobova and Rapport for being the kings of top level unorthodox chess, saying that Grave was taking a page from their books. Yes, exactly. And uh, he's right. Uh, those two players, uh, Rapport from Hungary, Jobova from Georgia, two very original dynamic players. During the Tata Steel uh, Chess Festival, I got a chance to uh, talk to Jobova a lot, and uh, I made a comparison. Uh, between him and, oh gosh, uh, uh, there's a wonderful, uh, uh, from the Soviet Union days, uh, a Tatar, Nezhmedinov. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Well, I'm yeah. so happy that you just smiled. I, <laughs> so I was doing this nice uh, explanation to the Dutch audience about Nezhmedinov, and there was no reaction. And I went, time out, everybody, hold on, I don't think we're on the same page. How many of you in the audience no, uh, Nezhmedinov, and like one guy out of like oh, 200. Oh, really? I feel like I read an article on New in Chess, or he's there's a, a book or something. He's a brilliant well, attacking a master. Him? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Not not John, though. It wasn't John who wrote a book on him, was it? No, no. Okay. But, but um, can you spell it correctly? Nezhmedinov. I don't think I will be able to, but I think it goes N E M Z. Any letters, N E Z H. The point was, was that after the game, I, he had played uh, Jabova, that is to say, played this fantastic move, knight h4, uh, in the round, 
and he, he, Medina, <laughs> he came on the air, Jabova did, and I said, by the way, I made a comparison between you and Najmadina. Jabova said, really? Aww. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you would think of Najmadina. So for those of you who have not seen Najmadina's Best Games book, I'm jealous. It's... It's alien chess. It's just oh. wonderful, wonderful stuff. That's always the biggest recommendation when you say, I'm jealous that you haven't read that yet, or yes. I'm jealous that you haven't seen that the yet. First time. I like that. Yeah. Um, we have a piece on interviewing members of uh, both tournaments on their chances in this competition. Okay. This was pre tournament. It's safe to say that Hikaru and Wesley are the at least on paper, are, are the favorites, and the results that they've demonstrated over the past year or two have been phenomenal. Well, we, we have two obvious favorites, Hikaru and Wesley, just by rating alone. Of those two, um, you probably might give Hikaru a slight edge just because, you know, he, he has more experience, I suppose, and he's won this tournament many times in the past. I would say probably 90% Wesley so wins. Um, anyone else wins, that would be a huge surprise. Certainly, I think I have as good a chance, obviously, as anyone. Um, but of course, we'll see what happens in the individual games. Well, my goal is just to really play my best and just have to focus on playing my game. And um, I think, you know, if I play good chess, then I have, I have a good chance like all, all of these other guys. There are 11 games, 11 long games, so I will take it one at a time. And after two weeks, we will see who is the best player to come on top. They're the guys to beat, but uh, I think in this tournament anyone can beat anybody. There's no easy games, and uh, if either of those guys makes one bad move against anybody, they will be punished. So while they're the guys to beat, I, I wouldn't necessarily just throw anyone else off. The rest of the guys, including me, we're, we're gonna try our best to, you know, to hold them. But uh, whether we'll succeed, we'll see. Nobody is counted out, and everybody will play, will fight to the, to the last drop of blood, so it'll be quite a tournament. Some great interviews there. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to hear all what they said. Ninety percent. I think what that's a little. It? Well, there was somebody said uh, that I think I think Nakamura said it was ninety percent him or so. Whoa. That's a little too high. That I, I find think maybe eighty-ish. Yeah, more exactly. Right? In a twelve-player field, uh, one of the other ten. Let's put it that way. Are is going to score like we're seeing right now with Ray Robson, right? And. Uh, but it's you not know, that high. I mean, we're saying maybe it's 85 or 80. That's, I mean, okay, 10 points is a lot, but mm -hmm. 10 percentage points is not like, it's not like uh, the real answer is 50 or something. No. Like, clearly, one of these guys is a big favorite to take sure. home. without question. God Kemsky's told me that he thought his own chances were 10 percent. So, Which is really, he's underrating his, you think? oh, big time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, just, okay, first of all, uh, God has got to be feeling very, very, very happy about yesterday, right? He just, he, 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 he snuck away with a draw. Yeah. So he's undefeated at one and a half. And that, you know, when you get fortunate, uh, it gives you confidence. And uh, with so many games to, to, to play, you do not want to have a, a competent God of Kamsky in the field if you're what, Hikaru or Wesley, because this guy can put together a lot of silky smooth, Performances and before you know it, he's in some silky kind of smooth. silky smooth. Silky <laughs> smooth. I like that. That's it. It's been a while since I heard that one. Okay, and you know he puts it together. You know, got a style chess. You'll see him in an Armageddon game. You that's know, that, right. That, no, that's the way that works for. He's good at those graphic games. And he's too, very, okay. very good. But that's funny because so God says he's got a ten percent. Nakamura a says ninety between him and so, so that that leaves it exactly Z <laughs> zero for the rest of the field, right? <laughs> <laughs> the rest no, of the no, field no, has no, no, no chance. No. Uh -huh. And uh, Maurice, some thoughts on that? Yeah, ninety is a bit high, but his rationale is this: he's Ikaru Nakamura. He is the number three player in the world. He's currently rated 2,800. Then you take Wesley So, who's rated at 2,786 right now. I mean, he was a little bit higher going into the competition. Those are two giant gorillas sitting in the room. They are hard to play against. Now, it's a long tournament. If one of them plays their kind of chess, one of the two, let's say the other one is not in his greatest form, but the other one plays just like himself, just like his rating says he's supposed to play, then one of the two should win the tournament. And the only other person who's ever cracked 2,700 is Gadakovsky. 
So the rest of the field, the only way anyone emerges beyond one of these three players is if they play out of their minds and they have to play 2,800 chess. Actually, they have to play over 2,800 chess because the, those two guys are already 2,800s. So it's not even hard for them to think about playing like 2,800 players. So I think that the odds of anybody else coming through are very, very slim compared to those top three. So I, that's the reason why Nakamura is so confident. He says, if, if I play like I can play, Wesley plays like he can play, and certainly if Gata plays like he can play, then everybody else will be shut out of the tournament. Guys? Well, yeah. luckily we are playing the event, so we will find yeah, out. Sorry. That's why you but, play the game, right? Yeah, Ray Robs has got a chance now, that's for sure. For sure. And I'm uh, looking at the game of Ruslan and Naji, uh, the top women's table uh, in that event. And just going back, we really liked White's position here, knight takes, rook takes. I see three knights from maneuvering in the knight, the e5 square. And Naji has won the two bishops, bishop e5, rook c8. Me, Rusa. Pardon me, Rusa has won the two bishops, uh, and I still really like White's position. I think I might have liked it a little bit better a move, move or so ago, but still, uh, White for choice here. So too uh, early to snap off that pawn on d5. Because is it? Uh, I was just, I was going to ask that question myself, yeah. Jen. If you take on f6 and you snap the pawn and you fall for this terrible, terri terrifying pin, e4, and in the best case, Black will recapture twice on d5, but then have a, oh, a messed up structure. Okay, so you're thinking the weakness on c5. Yeah, because we can capture on d5, right? Like takes, takes, and just um, queen f5 or something. Mm -hmm. Queen f5. Well, okay. Or oh, oh, e5, e5. Okay. Just, queen, just so that right. we don't have that option. Exactly. Sorry. Well, hold on, because there's this little peshki over here is a little bit loose. Uh, right, might be going okay. over here I and getting. It. It's not that easy still. So for now the idea is that if we take on d5, you take um, on a6. So exactly, and I'll be a pawn ahead, not necessarily winning, but I'll be a pawn ahead. So there is uh, an opportunity here for Russo to play uh, for uh, a technical edge. Let's put it that way. I wanted to go again to. Okay, after, in the game between Samuel Sevillon and Daniel Naroditsky. So you weren't, didn't approve of that four because of the move queen takes b2. Which Danya just said, thank you very much, give me the pawn. And surprisingly enough, Sam <laughs> hasn't actually followed through uh, with anything. He's now still tanking on, um, well, I think that this is, oh, he's beginning to reach for something. Bishop. He moved his bishop. Where has he moved his bishop? I can't tell at the moment from the webcam, but it looks like the bishop d8 went to b6 and maybe even a5. Not 100% sure. We'll I'll wait for, uh, yes, there we have it, bishop a5. And I can only guess that uh, queen d8 and moves like queen d8 or queen a8 followed by bishop b4 is what uh, Sam is hoping to do. But we saw these kinds of positions before when I wasn't even a pawn, there was still a pawn on b2. Queen uh, coming to e2 with this very straightforward idea of bishop takes d3, harassing this knight on f1. This looks like a very nice counter for uh, Naroditsky in the position. I think he's doing well. Again, let's go back to Ray Robson because he too is tied for the lead. And he's got that position that I, I thought that he was going to get, where, okay, the king side um, has been uh, wiped out, but what remains is a passive position for right. Barakobian. More activity for Raya than also the two bishops. Right. So something's going on there. And on Will it be enough against game? such a strong player as a Kobian? Not sure. Okay, and our featured game, uh, Wesley So, Hikaru Nakamura. Again, it appears to me that this is a very balanced game. Maurice, you had some thoughts to share. Well, we often talk about the knights and how the knights affect the strategy in chess, the strategic direction. Knights are such critical pieces because they're not linear like the other pieces. So it's really a mark of fine players, how they handle knights. And in fact, the knights affect so much about chess. Well, I'm generalizing now. Let's get specific to a position. This one here between Komsky and Gurev, 
Gurev with the white pieces, he sacrificed the pawn, and then he stuck a knight on the d5 square. Now, earlier we saw that he could have dropped the knight back to e3. Instead, he played your fine move, yes, rook to e3, very deep move. His opponent decided to trade, capture, and now stick a knight on a5, looking for that nice c4 square. The quick response, knight dropped back to d2, controlling this knight. So now this piece is trapped on the a5 square. This knight on d2, this bishop on d3, preventing it from going anywhere. Is this going to turn into a bad piece that has no future? b6, knight back to b7 would mean nothing because it cannot go to c5. So it could be on a bad circuit, just stopping up the position there. The question is, could white increase the pressure with, while also keeping the knight trap? Queen e2, if this pawn is defended, what does white do next to continue to increase the pressure? Will he play f4? Will he play f5? Very interesting game here. White is definitely happy with the outcome of the opening. Let's take a look at another position that I was extolling the virtues of white's game, but then came a knight. Check this out. After, the, after these moves by Anna Sherevich against Victoria Nee, Anna had all this development, all her pieces in the game but one, this rook. And after queen to e7, she hurried here. She had a strategic possibility to play the move a5 and find a place for this knight. Look at both these knights. They're not doing anything yet. She played knight to g3. Nowhere for this knight to go. No future. Knight d7 was the quick response. And after rook to f2, knight to e5. This knight is lord of the chessboard, attacking in multiple directions, but more importantly, defending everything from e5. The blockading knight, I know Nimzovich, one of your favorite players, he has, as the knight blockades on e5. Rook a f1, h5. Looking to, where is this knight going to go? And after h3, h4. Put it back where it came from. Knight h1. Whoa, what's up with that? That's not one of your pretty knights. Uh, another Nimzovician move. Yes, why, why did you uh, appreciate Nimzovic so much? <laughs> anyway, g5 now, pushing, it pawn, pushing a pawn forward in front of her queen, in front of the king, chasing the queen back, queen e3, rook to h6. These pieces are still not developed. Unusual development by black, but very good development. Bishop to d7, and now a5, a little too late. Rook f8, knight to d1. This knight is headed to f5, folks. Now knight to g6, and queen c3, check on the board. This has been a weird game with all these maneuvers. Knights on the back row. Wow. This is the kind of game that you just shake your head and say, don't look at this one, students. It doesn't count. It doesn't count. Guys, but, but the maneuvering eyes. has been very, Victoria's maneuvering has been very good. And in that position that Maurice left it, I really like Victoria's position after Queen E5. White's knights on H1 and D1 in particular do not make a very favorable impression. I like Victoria's position. Let's go let's back take a look at, yeah, let's our, take a, our first board. Yes, uh, because we actually have a comment from none other than the Sinkfield Cup champion, Fabiano Caruana. Oh, a shout out to Fabi. Yeah, and thank nice you, for, you joining us. for watching. He says that... He's going to play it safe and predict a draw. They both had a rough day yesterday. Wesley still, of course, losing to Sevillan and Nakamura, um, allowing uh, Gata Kansky to escape with a draw. Right. And they're both looking to get back on solid footing. Okay. Well, interesting from Fabiano. What we had when we left uh, was we had just seen this maneuver, knight b8 by Wesley. Rook came to c1, uh, knight to c6, bishop b5, rook c3, and... Uh, to my surprise, Wesley simply agreed to make this trade. I think his, the activity of his two minor pieces, like true, he doesn't have the two bishops, but look at how pretty his two minors are. At the moment, that is indeed the case. And now but we because see because you've uh, kind of given White a little bit more play in the position with the pawn structure. You've always got to be on the lookout for c4, d5 ideas. Yeah. Uh, Icaro wanted to retain. His two bishops, he played bishop f4. Wesley played queen h4. And when I see these moves like queen h4 in such positions, uh, I already feel that, okay, the position's equalized because now. Black, I mean, yeah. the active, active pieces, it's not just the minor pieces. This queen on h4 is really irritating. Uh, Very first of irritating. all, it's, uh, it's gaining the tempo against the bishop. And now when uh, the bishop goes back, you can't, you're not even threatening c4. Right. You can just play knight takes d4. Right. And um, well, I think we're that. up to date, but uh, let's well, say like, rook d8. Yeah, let's just say rook so d8. So for instance, if c4 in this position, knight takes d4. Yes. Rook takes, rook takes d4. Queen takes d4. Pawn takes d5. 
um, even though you have uh, the two bishops of the rook, uh, that, that, that open file is, is pretty dominating. Yeah. And I was also looking at queen a1 instead of queen takes d5. Aha, uh -huh. nice one but too. That might also be good, but I guess you have queen f1. Doesn't uh, look. But still. That's not really where you want your queen to be. Uh, this is two pawns. Uh, I'm two big, pawns, and we have a nice rook. And we have, and that's very important. You have an active rook. Remember in the Ray Robson game, yeah. uh, the the Caden had the inactive rook. Here, the active rook. Uh, no tr no problem here for Wesley at all. Now the other thing is, if you ever try to like bolster your pawns um, on c3 and d4 by playing bishop e2 with the idea of getting c4 in. And you could actually be in a world of hurt because I could just start hitting you on g2, and you, you don't have a, you don't really have many guys to defend it with. You mean like queen g5? Yeah, like queen g. We could start with queen, queen g5, g5, and now ideas like knight h4. You're not. It's not easy for you to defend against that. Yeah. Otherwise, there's a queen e3 check. This is very irritating. Also, just pardon me. After bishop b2, also rather irritating is the fact that in such middle games, first of all, you've always got to eyeball this a2 pawn. I mean, are we leaving that a2 pawn hanging or not? I mean, I'm an old pawn grubber, so, you know, I always look at the captures well, first type, right. type of thing. So. And the other thing is I can force the trade of queens. Uh, these endings are that easy for either player, but I have the feeling that this is more of a of a draw yeah, than, Black's, than an advantage for white. I agree at this point. It does seem like Black's minor pieces compensate for the fact that white has the two bishops and the potential c4 break. But we will keep a close eye on this game as it yes. is a crucial battle for determining the 2015 U.S. Chess Champion. Without question. And we are going to take a quick break. Um, okay. Don't leave us. We are going to be back more for round four of the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships and U.S. Women's Chess Championships here in the capital of Chess in America.
2014 was a great year for chess. Chess 24 brought you live interactive broadcasts from top tournaments. A play zone where you can take on opponents from all around the world 24-7. Interactive beginners courses ensuring you pick up the basics fast while having fun. A tactics trainer to sharpen your chess by solving puzzles adapted to your level. Hundreds of interactive videos. Chess 24 on mobiles and tablets. Most features are free, but limited for registered members. Chess 24 is offering a special premium membership for just $9.99 per month or $99 per year. See you at chess24.com. Hi, I'm Mike Matheny. Whether you play chess for fun or want to boost your child's academic performance, come visit the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis, right here in the chess capital of the U.S. From a welcoming, diverse environment to a scholastic outreach program, now in over 100 schools, our center, across from the World Chess Hall of Fame in the Central West End, has it all. So whether you've played for years or never before, we invite you to experience all chess has to offer. Welcome back to our round, plot, round four coverage of the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships here in St. Louis. We see the battle of the tournament many thought, Nakamura and So, but world number two, Fabiano Caruana. And I know they're actually they're actually right right neck and neck, right? So right, Nakamura, kind of flipping a little bit. Uh, it can do, it can really hinge on the result of any of the games in the U.S. Chess Championship. As we but saw he said, in predicted draw, and it does Play look safe. that in, unless somebody takes a big risk. We are headed in that direction in that game. Uh, true enough, and uh, the the game that really is getting my attention is Ray Robson, who's played terrific chess through three rounds to share the oh, lead yes. at the moment. He has come up with a devilish Ooh. pawn sacrifice. Wow. We left it around these parts. H6, G takes H6, a very paradoxical move. Bishop f4. You were expecting takes on h6, and you thought he had a little something something. In that, maybe not in that case, but basically what, what Ray is saying is, I'm going to dominate the position with my bishops, even though I'm material behind. After h5, queen came to c3, Ooh. setting up ideas Bishop like takes bishop a takes a6. And you really don't want to move this knight away. For example, if you drop back with a knight, this bishop can take up a dominating post on the e5 square. And you definitely don't want to go to e7. And you definitely <laughs> don't want to go to e7 one. to allow checkmate in one. Um, Queen takes e7. So, but, but how bad is that? Let's take a look. So, because we do have to stop bishop takes a6. So, so if knight e8, bishop e5, you're saying that we're going to have issues with where to put that rook, rook h7. And I'm thinking that what white wants to do is play moves like rook h4, bishop d3, and rook h1. And again, even though he is uh, material behind a pawn at the moment, it's like he's got all the active play in the position, and poor Vars, bishop on e6, the bane of the French defense player, is doing nothing in the position. In fact, it's right. really, really, really this bad. This is really interesting. So a nice, I, and but we what do else, have What else can black do besides moving the knight away? He did, in fact, play bishop d7. We so he do this bishop d7, okay. So that does prevent bishop takes a6 by just protecting the knight. On, on c6. And also guarding against uh, bishop e5 uh, type of play. Now, from White's pers per perspective, how does he increase he starts, the pressure? Can he start throwing patties, as uh, <laughs> the author is fond to say? Well, I got that from Joel Benjamin, by oh. the way. That, that's actually a okay, Joel shout Benjamin. shout out to Joel Benjamin. That, like, he likes to throw the patties, and he likes ideas like b4 with simple you know, pawn storming is, ideas. The only thing I'm thinking is that if we do get a four in, then you you could maybe meet it, meet it with a prosaic queen e seven, and unfortunately with our king over on that side. Well, well, just to show what you might mean, yeah. uh, b four, rook h seven. Okay, let's go for the gold. A four, so queen we're just e seven. Blunt b five to, to you know counter yeah. the knight. And the diff uh, here, uh, Jen, is that after you successfully traded queens, your oh. knight, oh no, your knight gets stranded. C2, C3, and your knight's trapped, and that's all she wrote. So this B4, uh, you can't be flippant. You can't just say, okay, it's not a big threat, because it's caveman chess, but it is coming, B4, B5. Maybe you'd have to start with queen E7, or maybe 
Queen F8, keeping Get the E file. Right. Yeah, and forced me to slow my a slow play it a yeah. little bit with A2, A3, and then my next move I'm anticipating will be B5. Not this as nice, but still, uh, it's White who's having fun here, despite being a pawn behind. Yeah, and it's a shame to have to play A3, though, because another one of my ideas was to get the queen on A3 in some moment. Okay, so uh, if we don't like B4, we might uh, make uh, some preparatory move. Rook H2, that just, I don't know, keeps certain things alive. It's not so easy for black. Maybe black is just going to have to push his pawn, h5, h4. Um, but I like the way uh, Ray is playing this. And uh, again, he's been playing great chess. He's been avoiding time trouble. The moment he's got 28, 28 minutes for a lot of moves, though. This game might come down to a little bit of a time trouble scramble. Let's go back uh, to our table number one. When we left it, we saw the move queen h4, bishop c8, rook d8, as expected, f2, f3, rook d7, very flexible, bishop d3, rook c7, and uh, Hikaru Nakamura to play. Um, I like everything that Wesley's doing, quite frankly, and I think he has a good position. Maurice. Over in the women's championship, Maurice has some thoughts. Well, actually, it's for both championships. It looks as though the crazy chaos from yesterday with the time pressure for everyone causing blunders, bad moves to happen in all the games, it has given everyone pause and made them say, you know what, I'm not going through that again. And on almost every board, people are being extremely responsible about their handling of the time situation. Maybe it's because the positions today are not as chaotic as yesterday. However, in this game in particular between Alyssa Melahina and Katarina Nemsova, it is Katarina who has found herself in a little bit of a time crunch. Not so bad yet, though, but let's take a look at the position. Her opponent played the C3 Sicilian, got this somewhat broken pawn structure with the pawns, and now after knight a5, said, you know what, I got some activity for it. Let me attack your king side. Well, castling was not in the cards here because the move bishop h6 picks up at least an exchange because you have to play g6 here. Well, instead of doing that, she played the move king f8. We saw that in the other game uh, with, uh, was it Nazi Pakidzi? Who played, no, it was actually Victoria Nee who played her, in her game against Anna Sherevich. So king to f8. We see the protecting the pawn, and now simple development, rook a d1, now knight to c4, threatening something very concrete here, but bishop to g5, the response, and after bishop takes, queen takes on g5, guarding her pawn on e5. A couple of funky variations. Black can now play, and in fact she has played it, knight to b2. Knight to b2, we are expecting this rook to move. Now she could snap this off, and then just take on A4, she's up a pawn. She has 17 moves to make with 14 minutes plus her increment on the clock. But this is a forcing line. Black goes up a pawn and says, I'm up. I'm up. I may be down on the clock, but what do you have? But this king and this rook are definitely long-term issues she will have to deal with for her greed. We'll see how it works out in this, one of the key matchups as far as the leaders are concerned on the ladies' side of the championships. Guys? Thank you so very much, uh, Maurice. And we have a comment from one of our, our tweets on... Tweets? The, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I like that. One of our tweets uh, on the Golatiani, and then, uh, sorry, the golatiani Pakidzi matchup. Yes. Um, Chess by Kermi asks, Jennifer, do you think that today is a key moment for Golatiani in case she outplays Pakidzi? Thanks for the broadcast. Yeah, I really do, because you saw that when Golatiani um, came down for her interview, she... She was confident. She's always a self-confident person, but she always seemed a little bit surprised to be in the lead. Like, you know, she Without has her question. chess business. She's been busy with her kids. Not only that, she got a business degree from Neither, Columbia right. and was just hired by Deutsche Bank. Right. So a lot going on for this very talented woman. And it was just like, oh, wow, I'm at the U.S. Women's Championship for the first time in a few years, and I'm leading. That's what She's I'm magnificently listening. talented. I think that's a thing. Like, she won a world youth competition when she was very young. And usually the people who won world youth competitions, they're very talented. Oh, without question. It's like they've got chess in the blood, so to speak. Yeah. They're hardwired for chess. What's really remarkable for me is that she can take a two-year hiatus uh, and return and be in the lead 
and playing great chess and uh, when everything keeps going like that, you just feel like somehow it's a destiny, you know, like you're supposed to win. And uh, chess is really a lot about confidence. Yes. And if you come into the game uh, where you're feeling like everything is going in, in your favor, as it is for Rusa at this moment, uh, she's a force to be reckoned with. And Arena's yeah. got uh, real issues. She's going to have to really win a lot of games. Up. Uh, to catch up to, uh, she spotted the she spotted a whole point to the leaders. That's right, and she might not she might not win today. And I think the difference is that today we'll be at the quarter <coughs> way, we'll be past the quarterway mark of the tournament, and mm -hmm. also it'll be different because she's played a really good game and she's been on top today, where she's gotten a little lucky in other games. Right. So if she wins today, I think she will start thinking, I can do this. Very good. And um, we, do we have a result in any of the games? Uh, not that I, I saw some players stand, get up from the board. I haven't seen that, but I'm oh yes, Trove Shanklin have drawn their game. Oh, wonderful! Let's just see how that happened. How that shaked out. Yeah. In fact, I haven't uh, paid a attention to a number of games. We'll just run through it very quickly. Caden Trove with the white pieces, uh, having saved his batus uh, yesterday against Alex Onishuk, facing off against Sam Shanklin, who lost a hard breaker against Wesley So that night ending. Uh, Sam was on a remarkable streak of nearly 60 games, I believe it was, without a defeat. Uh, Sam playing the black side of a Queen's Indian, Petrosian variation uh, of the uh, Queen's Indian with a3, d5, bishop, g5, bishop, e7. All of this is pretty standard. c7, c6, however, is not the standard move here. Uh, Knight e4 takes on c4, knight d7, h6 are moves that have been played before. T c7, c6 looks a little bit passive, but on the other hand, very, very solid indeed. Uh, Caden trying to create weaknesses in his opponent's camp. Knight e4, uh, alert, threat alert. Knight d2 is a threat, rook d1. Okay, this all looks very normal, safe, and with this move before already, I think that uh, Black is simply doing fine at this exact moment. And Caden couldn't make anything work for himself. This is what happens when you see two very well played. Uh, um, Two very good grandmasters playing safe with one another. A draw is the most likely outcome, and they reach this rook ending, which looks rather even. So no fireworks whatsoever in that game. Let me just turn to our youngest grandmaster in the field, 14-year-old Sam Sevillan. <laughs> what harder, harder for it to be a younger one, considering he just broke the record. Exactly. It would be Here hard. in St. Louis, he broke the record for the youngest American in the Grandmaster in history, and of course, illustrious names like Bobby Fisher and Nakamura. And Robson, give the kids some credit. He's leading Absolutely. the tournament, too. Uh, you know, uh, I, I like to t tell the story because I think it's rather a funny one. I became a Grandmaster at 19 years and I guess 10 months or something like that. I was very, very proud of myself at the time. And um, I, looked, I looked it up, and I was the fourth youngest Grandmaster in history at that time. There was Bobby Fisher at 15, and we all knew nobody would ever break his record. Then there was a guy called Boris Spassky. Then there was a guy, Henry Mecking. Mecking. And then there was me. Ah, this is a humble ride. And this is, like, really <laughs> great. And then suddenly, you know, they started be breaking oh, Bobby Fisher's record, and I stopped talking about when I became a grandmaster, you know. like the That records is were the classic humble ride, Gosser. Ah, uh, that was terrible. <laughs> Good Queen one, Matt. A3. Okay, that wasn't a move I expected, Queen but three. whoa, that is a surprising move by Daniel Norris. And now Queen, Queen B8 B8. on the board. Yeah, uh, with a threat of Bishop B4. And do we have more moves? Yes, yes we Queen do. D6. Queen D6, Queen E8. And this is the situation we have at the board. So Bishop B4 on top again. Uh, very much so, in fact. And uh, Daniel, Daniel's got to figure out how he wants to deal with that. I'm sure he has no intention of going into some kind of a a huddle uh, like this. This is where, you know, he ends up just being zugzwanged or something, like this, this uh, eternal pin. 
on the eighth rank. So Although we can move our bishop, so at least yes, for now. Yes, right. But so. this is not what I think Daniel had in mind. But queen a3, okay, a bit of a surprising move. And again, we do have this position. Oops, sorry. And meanwhile, we have um, our first guest in the studio. Oh, lovely. Grandmaster is Sam Shanklin. He is with Maurice Ashley to talk about the tournament so far. Thanks, Jen. I am with Grandmaster Sam Shanklin, one of the stars of American Chess, with us now playing in his tournament. Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Sam, uh, you are off to a little bit of a difficult start. You've been playing well most of the year, for about a year. 53 games without a loss. That's a pretty dramatic number. How are you feeling now, particularly after that game that was a really uh, tough loss against Wesley So in the second round? Well, uh, I mean, I forget who said this first, but they're absolutely right. To be a great chess player, you have to have a, a bit of masochism in you, or at least uh, a high pain threshold, because that game, I, I mean, I just wanted to you know, throw something out the window. I mean, it was... Not yourself, hopefully. No, 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 but... Uh, I, I tend to be more violent towards others than myself, <laughs> but no, it was a it was a tough blow um, to lose with white, especially when apart from that game, starting the tournament with three blacks, and uh, it's tough to recover. I mean, I, I I thought about, for example, going completely nuts before the game today, but uh, I just said I should just wait for him to make mistakes. But I mean, it's, it's frustrating when you're playing black and they never make a mistake, and or, or if they're taking d5 and killing all the plays. So. Um, it's been tough, but there's still a lot of tournaments to go. I remember last year I had the ex exact same one and a half out of four with three blacks in the first four games, and I managed to recover. And I didn't. I was never really fighting for first, but I tied for fourth, and I beat two guys who tied for first. So it wasn't such a disaster. I mean, uh, you had a great finish last year. You beat a Kobian. Did you beat Lenderman also? I beat a Kobian and Lenderman. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't my best result. I performed on par with my rating, but uh, I got. I had to slow start last year as well, and then. Uh, I managed to pull it together and salvage a very respectable, if not spec if not unbelievable, result. Uh, so you need to start picking the right numbers when you go uh, pick those locks yeah, and you'll get three blacks out of the first four games. This is my seventh U.S. championship and my sixth where I'll be playing more black than white, uh, which has been unfortunate. But at the end of the day, uh, white games don't win tournaments, good moves do. And uh, the way I've been playing so far, I, I don't really deserve to have won any games either. So. so tell me your lottery number so I can pick the other numbers, okay? I think I was eight. <laughs> I think I, I think I got eight all the time. Really? Well, eight this. I mean, I had the same this year as last year because I had black and rounds three and four both times. But um. so tell us a little about your game. Uh, tell us a little bit about Caden Trove. I mean, he he seems like a fine young player. Yeah, I, mean, I actually fifty percent. I now. actually used to coach him when he was much younger, uh, but then he um, he found uh, better coaches than me, and he's <laughs> uh, oh, he's he's playing well. I mean, uh, it's nowadays. I mean, I, I would certainly never mean to belittle anything he's ever done, but uh, it's it's not quite as special as it was when he, Yasser was talking about making GM at 15. Uh, he's clearly done great so far, but there's a lot of time ahead of him to show what he's capable of, and uh, you know, I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll see the future uh, of U.S. chess and young players like him and yourself. But at the moment, the two top players, Hikaru Nakamura, let's start with him yesterday. He had a crazy game against Gatikomsky. And he was disgusted walking out of here, only drawing the game. Did you get a chance to look at that, or what were your thoughts? I mean, I saw the game, and it looked like he goofed pretty badly. I mean, but at the end of the day, he's he's a great chess player. I mean, he's world number two or something, but he's also a human being, and he makes mistakes, and he's got to learn to forgive himself. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I've seen him implode before, but for the most part, when something goes wrong for me, he usually recovers pretty well. Uh, what about Wesley So? I mean, he, he blundered. Uh, you blundered against him. It looked like he blundered yesterday against yeah. Sam Sevian. Did you get a chance to look at that game? What are your thoughts well, on I, that I position? think West, the quality of trust Wesley has brought to this tournament is lower than uh, what I normally see from him. I mean, which is to say maybe only 2750 or something like that. Uh, only. But uh, I, I definitely don't think he's playing as well as he did in, say, Chorus. But there's still a lot of games left to be played. And if he can recover, I mean, the game with Sevian was, must have been very hard on him because he was borderline winning straight at the opening as well. But... Uh, you know, it's chess, and like I said, you have to have a high pain threshold. Let me ask you my final thought here. Uh, Nakamura said that he thinks that he and Wesley have a 90% chance combined, 90% chance of winning this event. Would you agree? Uh, at the start of the event or now? At the start of the event. I think it's probably fair enough. I mean, uh, it's maybe a little bit of a provocative statement, but until someone disproves him, I don't see any reason to object to it. Well, Kowski gave himself 10%. Where does that leave you? 
I don't count percentages. I just try to play good moves. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thanks sure. so much for joining us, Sam, and sure. good luck in the rest of your game. Thank you. Grandmaster Sam Shanklin, uh, looks like an objective opinion so far, and hopefully he doesn't throw anything out of the window. <laughs> At least not when I'm walking by. Exactly. Guys? I love that quote about pain threshold. You've got to have a high pain threshold to be a chess player because a lot of people don't think of chess in that way. Chess is a very, very emotive game, I assure you. And he's absolutely right. You, when you play chess professionally, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. And you've just got to accept that uh, losing is a part of the game. It happens to everybody. We're all human. We, we do make mistakes. And it's always how you recover from a loss. That's really the mark of the champion. Now, That's right. I hadn't realized it, but boy, poor Sam, he's absolutely right. Starting with three blacks out of four games in the U.S. Championship is not a lot of fun. And isn't you know, eight supposed to be the lucky number in China? Uh, number nine, number eight. Number eight, I think. Number nine, okay. Well, there you but, go. But um, he, what, what happened was he picked eight, and of course, if you pick on, from the, uh, the second half of the score, ta the second half of the score table, you, you get, get an extra black. Exactly. So. But not only in his case does he get an extra black; they all came up at the start of the event. In other words, he's going to finish the event with white, because at the moment he's minus two, right? He's got two extra black, so he'll finish the event with white. But as he said, like a game like today. For example, Caden uh, took all the play out of the position, and he's, you, it's really, really hard to beat these guys with the black pieces when nobody's making mistakes. Well, at least <clears throat> now that he got uh, black, more blacks in so many championships in a row, he'll probably get white a bunch more. in a row in future championships. Well, you kind of hope that those things balance out. They don't. No, always, I was just, I was just yeah. kidding. Because somebody actually tweeted and they asked if there are similarities between chess and poker. And it's funny that actually there are a ton of similarities, like the approach and the fact that they're both mind sports, mm -hmm. that they are physical but mostly mental, mm -hmm. and people don't believe they are sports. They are, but not just in the same way that you would think of, like uh, basketball, right? Right. But uh, one thing that is not the same, which I think is really funny, is that there's not a lot of pure math in chess. Like, sure, mm -hmm. there's geometry, and it, it rewards the same type of brain type, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have to, like, crunch numbers mm -hmm. while you're playing. It's more visualization, right? Yeah, and calculation and judgment, too. You can yeah. calculate these long lines, but at the end of the day, you have to say, this line is actually in my favor. And that's why it was funny when he said, I don't calculate percentages. It's like, you know, that's a very chess thing to say. You know, you're not, you're not adding and subtracting and saying, like, what are my chances to win this event? You're, you know, you're, you're playing. Well, I, I'd have to correct him in a sense that he's saying he doesn't calculate percentages as, you, as we think of 10% or 15%. But in truth, he is. He's just doing it a different way. He's sitting there, for example, Sam Shanklin. I would say to him, Sam, how do you like your position? He says, really a lot. I really like it very much. And I said, okay, what about this combination? And he says, well, I like the result of the combination. And I say, well, has your, has your chances of winning this position improved over that position? In other words, did you raise your winning percentage? He says, well, I haven't thought about it that way. I just thought my advantage increased. Yeah, so it's interesting. Just, it's a, yeah, well, it, it is percentage. I, I, don't, I don't believe he thinks that. Uh, 90 percent though that's high that's high and, that's you know, my aggressive brother actually wrote an article for u.s chess where he uh handicapped the tournament and his front runner after the obvious three was shanklin actually and one of his rationales was that you know shanklin's been improving so much lately and he has like a lot of like lopsided performances like sometimes really awesome and sometimes like a little like the, lackluster the, the, the gold medal in the olympia or like when he be beat leko in the world championship and his other argument was that shanklin got serious about chess a little later in life so that his window for improvement, even mm. though he's like a little bit older than some of the young stars, yeah. that his window of improvement was like actually advancing because of that. Interesting. Which I think is an interesting argument, and I would tend to agree. Right, and what I saw at the Tata Steel uh, Chess Festival in Vaikonze this year is uh, Sam was, was playing the challengers group. So the idea is Sam is, is, is fighting for first to qualify for the premier uh, group. And Sam finished the tournament undefeated, plus three, very, very nice. But he had three winning positions that he didn't win. Had he won one or two of those, he would have really been playing for the first. And it was a very impressive field that he played in, and he performed really excellently. So when I, when I came to this U.S. championship, everybody's talking about Wesley and Gata and the rest and Hikaru. I said, well, don't overlook Sam. He, uh, he hasn't been defeated. Nobody's beaten him in as he said, 53 games, and 
that's how you win tournaments too. You just don't lose. That's the way to go, Maurice. Well, how do you win tournaments? Sometimes you've got to draw some. You've got to win, excuse me, some drawn positions. Now, you guys have been talking about this position, so correct me if I'm wrong if you've been up to date on this game. But the move A4, A4 was played here, definitely trying to get some some uh, aggression on this side. You might say, okay, well, that doesn't change the assessment too much. Still looks kind of drawish. We, we heard number two in the world, Fabiano Caruana, say he thinks this is going to be a draw. Well, what do you think about this drawish looking move? G5. Whoa, what's up with that? Just throwing a pawn in front of your king. What are you doing exactly? You trying to attack the guy? Stop a bishop from going to F4? What is this move about? That's explosive. That looks like a guy who's not interested in a draw. And I'm sure Hikaru is sitting up in his chair staring at that move. G5 is a really provocative move right at this moment in the game. 28 moves in. And also, guys, they're at 20 minutes. Seven, 20 minutes for white, 17 minutes for black. Not real time pressure, not real, because uh, there's 12 moves to play, so they can handle themselves here. But G5 is certainly a move, and Hikaru has responded to the move G5, it seems, with also an aggressive move, F4. Wow, so this game has definitely exploded. I think uh, over and under in the draw, what percentages now? I don't think so. I think uh, you bet somebody's going to win this game guys thank you Maurice and boy uh, the, <laughs> that does open up the game yeah, that's good well, G5 <laughs> our, our move of the tournament right <laughs> right G5 thank you Timor Timor H6 so okay uh, the first thing I always love to do is look at the tactics what about Bishop takes F4 Knight takes uh, D4 with the idea that you can't recapture on D4 thanks to Queen takes D4 with a check hitting the Bishop uh, if you defend then I'll trade rooks, and I'll pick up this bishop on d3, and I've won a, pit yeah. a couple of pawns along the way. But after knight takes d4, I suppose white could simply uh, slide his queen. Well, is that true? Maybe just simply slide his queen to e5 or e3. No, knight takes d4 is a tactic that simply doesn't work. And we actually have a big result in Sam Sevian and Daniel Narodisky have drawn their game. Well, let's see. Because, let's see how that game finished because I was actually very curious as to how uh, uh, Danya was going to deal with this threat of bishop b4, bishop a5 to b4. Oh, it was a simple repetition. <laughs> Well, that's it. <laughs> insight into why the computer okay. was zeroing out uh, earlier in the uh, earlier in this game. I so, just wanted to turn to one other game because oh yeah, because this is getting hot. Yeah, uh, Marisa pointed out that in the game between Kate uh, Nem Nemkova, Nemsova, yeah. Nemsova, and Elisa Melikina, Elisa sacrificed a pawn in that forcing line that Marie showed. We got the players got to this position. And poor Black King. Poor Black King, however, nice extra um, pawn and solid position at the moment. The Queen's going to have to move somewhere. I'm not Castling exactly. Castling by hand on menu. Maybe. I don't like Queen G3. I'm just throwing it out there so that I can keep my options of Rook G4 alive. Okay, the Bishop's under attack for the moment. Let's imagine the Bishop just dropped back, attacking this Rook. I suppose the rook might slide over now. Black has to decide what she's going to do with her king. Maybe king could slide over to g8, hoping to finally free the rook. Um, not 100% sure and now about if we the. Now we play rook g4. Right. I assume you're not defending with rook h7. <laughs> In fact, I was. <laughs> it's like it looks uh, really ugly to have a rook there at the moment, but. <clears throat> but how do I get more more stuff? In the game. You, 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 you've got all your ammunition locked and loaded. The knight is the knight's not doing anything. That's right. my big issue. So, but if you try to get the knight in the way, uh, am I leaving myself? Now, this is a back rank mate that you, uh, a back rank mate that you don't see every day. But while black is made luft, uh, <laughs> the h7 square. Nice. has been uh, occupied by a rook. You don't see that kind <laughs> of a back rank made every day. Hello. But uh, action uh, heating up in that game uh, between at least some Yeah, that'll check. be a critical moment where she decides to place her queen in that position. Uh -oh. Meanwhile, in our 
our game Lucid. between Rusa Tangolatiani and Nazi Pagizzi had things taken a turn. Let's see. When it we looks left like, it, uh, like somebody's picked up a lot of pawns, but there's well, some activity. When we left it, we left it in a position about these parts. Queen takes d5, so a sweet oh. extra pawn uh, for Rusin at this point, but uh, she was forced to play this awkward move f3, okay, but let's see how the game continued. We got to this, still looks fine for white, but... Uh, well, now white has actually two pawns. Yeah, nice, centraliz <coughs> nice centralized play, piece play by black as compensation, but... And plus we're probably going to win that, that one of the pawns back pretty soon. Oh, w w without question, you're yeah. going to win one of the pawns back. Because you can't play rook c1 and passively defend because um, we'll play rook d2 check. check. Yes. And then, well, you, you can't take it. Right. Because we would, be, we would just uh, win but, your rook. But for example, after queen h6, rook takes c4, I give back one pawn, and I've got a nice queen here. Uh, I'll play h4, and by the way, Keep and we've got mind. big news in the Nakamura Soho game, so we're yes. going to go right over to Maurice. Okay. Well, I am wondering what Nakamura is thinking about in this line as you look at him there. We know he reveals a lot with his emotions as he's calculating the variation. He played this move F4, a very dynamic move. Look at So, very calm because F4 looked like it was going to break over in the king side, but you can see the agitation in Nakamura because guess what? G takes F4, Bishop takes F4, the natural response, which we were waiting for him to play, is met by Rook captures on C3, a Rook sacrifice, and now Rook takes, Queen takes D4, check, and give me the Rook. Now, oddly enough, the best line runs Queen F2, Queen takes C3, and now Bishop takes on F5, EF5, Bishop H6, but it's black for choice here. Look, black is up a pawn. It's opposite colored bishops. And black can play the move queen a1 check here and force white to play queen f1. That means black has a draw definitely in hand here. The question is, does queen takes on a4 give him anything at all? He's up two pawns. And this pawn, if you capture back, he's going to be still up queen check uh, only one pawn that is now and now look at this queen trade is this a is this a winning position for black or is it just a draw these two pawns not going anywhere i don't know i like having two pass pawns even in a bishop of opposite color position so nakamura is no longer better in the line at least if he plays bishop takes f4 he does have another move in this position just play queen to f2 to try to get his pawn back but that could be met by f3 and this definitely changes the nature of the game this one has gone crazy guys after that g5 move definitely a game to watch that is the game to watch and we're so excited that a game that looked like it might peter out has blown up uh, definitely definitely and i and and i i was blind i definitely have missed rook take c3 uh, an obvious uh, nice tactic picking up two pawns also uh, worth mentioning is if you think bishop takes f4, rook takes c3 is good for black, which it is, you might think to yourself, oh, I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll just play queen g4 check. I'll pick up this pawn on f4 with my queen. Uh, no, you will not. Queen g5, and there's no queen takes f4. Oops, queen takes g2 check and mate would, and you don't want to trade queens because then you're just simply a pawn down. So. Hikaru flicked out this move f4 and may not have properly calculated all the uh, ins and outs of this one. He has played the move queen f2, which was the other uh, move identified by Maurice. But after the move queen f2, big time move here, f4, f3. And this is a game that could easily slip out of control for Hikaru. Hold on. Is there a cheapo? Oh, there is. Check this out, Jen. Yeah. Bishop takes f5, queen takes f5, queen g3, check. Give me that rook. All right, says black. Go ahead and take it. King h, queen takes. So, I'm just looking at this move. Well, f2, check. I do cover the c4 square, but... With the queen, but what about... Yeah. This, the quiet move, bishop d3. Ooh, nasty. And, uh, big time nasty. And how are you going to meet bishop d3 check and f2, f1 equals queen? 
Oh, so you, you don't play... even don't 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 go for that rook. Don't go for that rook. But I'm thinking f4, f3 could mess up white structure, and uh, black's pieces look very active here. All of black's pieces are working. Uh, That's in right. Harmony. Maybe white and white will try to play c4 to kind of take all that bishop on d5. Yeah, but okay. I mean, but you can just backtrack. You're you're setting yourself up for I don't know a knight takes d4. So well, type I guess of maybe shot. now I can take on take on f5. Let's see how that changes the variation. Okay, let's see if it does, does it make a different anything? difference or not. I'm not 100 percent sure. In this particular case, it doesn't look like it makes. Although you well, do have rook c3, c3 now, yeah. but no, it's still good for black because I'm going to be picking up the bishop on d2 with a check, check huh? and black will be happy about Gaining this. Gaining too many pawns, huh? Well, yeah. I mean, well, is, it, is that the end of the story? No, but it's just a position but, that black is happy okay. about, right? Yeah. Okay, but we'll go back as things are getting here. And what is the time situation? Well, we have a move. We do? Instead of f3, Wesley has played knight h4 straight away, pressuring... A G2. Ooh. You know. Wow. Okay. I liked F4, F3. I'm not sure. So let's just see so what he has so in mind. so many possibilities here after Bishop takes F4. What does he have in mind? Bishop F4 comes up with a, ni a nasty tempo against the rook. Maybe Wesley should simply move his rook. I mean, that doesn't feel like the follow-up that you want as black. I'm thinking. So does know, he have he? to? He yeah. Takes. Yeah, it the, this There's no sacrifices on no. tap. Let's look at the random sacrifices too. Yeah, I was looking at that exactly. Okay, and then Queen G5 hitting uh, C1. This doesn't look uh, like uh, it works. That's wore, not running. Yeah, there's no Knight F3 business. So hold on. So we're looking at Bishop takes F4. Do we have another? This looks weird. Okay, hold your br breath. No, it doesn't. Sorry, knight takes g2. Uh, again, the queen g3. And we've got a move for Nakamura. He did play bishop takes f4, and now we are going to find out what Wesley had in mind. Right. Uh, knight Ooh. f3 check. Knight, knight f3, f3 check. check. And look at Nakamura's face. He's shaking his head. And Ooh. now with this move is just is, is gaining a big edge, isn't it? Because now after pawn takes, the, the bishop just didn't take, and Blast got some positional domination. Maurice, what, what happened here? What happened is Nakamura simply blundered this move. He did not see this obvious shot to his position, and he is completely disgusted right now. This move just came out of nowhere. And in fact, Nakamura had a fantastic alternative to this. And just looking at him, he's thinking, what did I do to my position? He cannot believe he missed this move. A, a piece on a square that is protected by a pawn. It is a move that even top grandmasters miss. Protected squares, particularly those protected by pawns, you just think the guy can't go there, and then he shows up on the square anyway. So Nakamura has allowed this to happen, but guess what, he had another move, Queen takes on f4, that was much better, and the computer was giving him a significant advantage after queen takes on f4. This move, he's attacking the rook in the corner, he's attacking the queen, he's attacking the knight, he's prompting a queen trade, and if black tries to avoid it with the move queen g7, he had to find this fine move, bishop to e4. Now, it's not easy at all, because it looks as though maybe black can start with knight takes on g2, and there's some funky discoveries that might happen, but guess what? Give me your rook and prove it and there's nothing to prove here according to all the calculations instead he has gone into this line shaking his head disgusted at himself it's definitely worse here uh, maybe not worse enough well actually he's down a full pawn in this position suddenly losing the game at least much worse and uh, he is very angry at the moment guys Poor, look at nakamura's face man the emotions is pouring out of him. He hasn't stopped shaking his head for the last three minutes. He's definitely, definitely disgusted with himself. But he can hold his end game. Yeah. He, do you think Hikaru would make a good poker player? <laughs> <laughs> he definitely wears his emotions on his sleeve, doesn't he? And yeah, uh, it, it would be hard for him to hold back all those emotions and to, to get used to the fact that you don't win every time. I mean, you don't right. win. Like a player of obviously his elite status in chess, he wins the large majority of the time. Yeah, exactly. You know? Sixty-six percent, seventy percent of his uh, he scores. And poker, you're poker, looking for like more of a smaller edges that you right. just repeat over and over and add up. Exactly. Not you, you can't like win eighty percent of the time. Probably right. you're happy winning thirty percent of the time, but the bigger pots. Oh, oh yeah, that's another way to look at it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, but Nakamura, actually, I, I think he, he enjoys to let his emotions out. If he really had to, I think he could keep him in. But why not? It's more entertaining for us, right? <laughs> well, indeed. And now the question is, now that he does find himself a pawn down in this ending that we have on the board, does Wesley have enough to reel home the point? Rook A1 was Hikaru's last move, uh, simply protecting the pawn on A4. Now, I've got to prove, this is going to be a hard one to prove, but I sure would like the opportunity to, to try to win this ending. Oh, sure. Uh, you're going to press. You're going to press as Wesley, but if you had to... If you had to pick a result, draw or win for Wesley, right now I would still pick Nakamura being able to hold. I would say it's something like um, a 50% draw. 50-50? Yeah, because yeah, okay. I think in percentage terms. Right? Exactly 50-50. I think 50% 50, 50. 50. 50 of the time an elite player, elite grandmaster is going to win this position against some level elite side, grand, grandmaster. If you had to pick a side, would you pick Wesley win or draw? Right here, right now, I'm going to go with Wesley winning, and I'll tell you why. I think Hikaru sometimes has this uh, mental history, right? Right now, if he didn't blow a significant edge, right, and he, and he was just given this position without this, you know, mental history of like, gosh, I really, really blundered my position, uh, he, he may be able to draw it. But right now, he's in some tumult. Uh, he just feel he just feels really bad about what he's done. And this might cause him to blunder further. If only you could hear Sam Shanklin in his ear, he Carl, you have to learn to forgive yourself. I like that by the way. And it's true. Sometimes you just have to say, hey listen, you know, like I'm human. Yeah. I make mistakes. Yeah, but it's nothing's enough for Nakamura because he wants to be the best player in the world and he's quite close. And that's why he demands so much of himself. Absolutely. He's, a, he's his best critic. And Maurice, what's going on in the women's championship? Time pressure is starting to affect the games, the proceedings. This is our favorite time, maybe, of the whole uh, phase of a game is a time pressure moment. And unfortunately, it affects us all. Take a look at this game. Victoria Nee, she had a provocative opening, but Anna Shervich managed to correct the problem of her knights. We talk about the knights all the time. Remember how bad blacks, uh, whites' knights were? They were stuck on some awful squares. Now they've improved dramatically, particularly the knight on C4 found a great home. And now, not realizing the change of events, Victoria Nee decided to play the move F5, maybe influenced by the fact that she has only five minutes on her clock. Now she has only four minutes on her clock. In this moment of break, we would all have looked at E5 out of nowhere, and now Black is in deep trouble after this move. She's much worse. She has to find some good moves now. Problem number one, if she captures this pawn, bam, take a look at that move. The pawn now rushing down the board, expecting to find the d7 square. And the problem is you can't just move your rook away so easily because give me that with check. And when the king move moves over, how about that nasty knight move? We saw the knight in Wesley So's game go to a square protected by a pawn. This one a little bit easier tactic to see maybe, but definitely a big edge for Cherovich in this game. So she has completely turned the game around and Victoria Nee with her time now at three minutes and counting is under heavy pressure. Looks like she might be going down in this game. Guys? Wow, and another big development going on in Timor Gariev Gadikamski uh, game. Timor had been building up a very nice attacking position, and he's just blasted away with an exchange sacrifice. When we left it, we had left it around the parts of knight d2, uh, queen f3, rook c7, nice build up by white. Uh, again, not a lot of harmony in black's position, specific, particularly this knight on a5 misplaced. This last move, bishop f4, directing an attack against h6, and this bishop on d3 is also lurking, ready to sacrifice itself against the g6 pawn. The game continued, bishop g7, c4 by Timor, e5 by Gata, trades, e5, takes, takes, Queen f8, protecting this pawn on d6, protecting the pawn on h6, and now, bang, rook takes a5, sacrificing a rook for this offside knight. Don't know if that was necessary, but Timor, on the attack, 
Let's just play knight d2 to e4 with a big time idea of bishop takes d6, getting two connected pass pawns for the exchange. And this game has just lit up. And defending uh, champion Gada Kamsky under a lot of pressure, both sides eight minutes on the clock for the time control till move 40. And Gada looks uh, perturbed. And God is the, not the one having fun here. It's Timor who's having fun with his fashion and with his chess moves. Now let's take a look at our other defending champion who is also not having an easy time of it against one of the youngsters in this competition, 16-year-old Aperva Verku, who started the tournament pretty well, one and a half out of three, and that included a win against Tatev. When we left that so, game, <laughs> I, I, Irina had just made the... Uh, Break a C7, C5, rook E1, centralizing the rooks, makes sense. Takes on C4, takes on C4, takes on D4. At the moment, I think Arena has a little bit of an edge. At least I do like her position. Bishop E2, yeah, that, that rook pawn D7. on E3 could be a bit of an issue, huh? Yeah, well I'm, think, well, I'm thinking that Arena wants to play something like G4 and rook C8 and to isolate or weaken can the e4 pawn she went rook d7 knight b5 rook d8 there was a trade of rooks by perva and oh that's a nice i like that move uh picking up a nice tempo against the knight threatening queen takes e5 with a check and we have now it looks more and more balanced and Arena Crush needing desperately to a uh, win. And, she, and now, the, no, although now a perfect played a kind of weird move, Bishop F1. Um, well, I mean, obviously it depends the pawn on H3, but my concern is it lets go of the G4 square. So now Arena has the opportunity for this tactical idea. And I think that might have been the reason why a perfect played King C1. She was worried that G4 would come in with a lot of danger and um, the bishop takes E4 check. So Because that does look like an odd move until you understand that. So to, to uh, express what you've just said, is in case of bishop F1, if you get a situation like this, the bishop would uh, capture this right. pawn with a check. Or you could even play just knight takes F3, I think, in that particular line, perhaps. And get, and get the check um, the going. the tactical, like if you play bishop F1 in this position. Um, knight f3 might be possible, but anyway, let's take a look at. Uh, no, well, well, no. The point was was that you want to avoid yeah. that with king b king b1 to c1. So that's why she played this weird looking move, king c1. But the other thing with bishop f1, which I'm just not convinced by, is what happens if we play g4 anyway? What's what's the fallout here? Okay, let's so take a look. So my thought after is that g4, if I go f4. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm just wondering here about these past pawns. They look like they could become very dangerous. Pass pawns? Oh, well, if I play knight f3. Uh, no pawn is passed as far as I know. Yeah. Take, 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 take. At the moment. So I, I could play queen c6 check and get my pawn back, but then you're going to win the one on h3. It's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back. Let me Absolutely. try something different. Uh, well, you could have played perha perhaps f5. in this position. f5 is a move, queen d4 is a move. Uh, at the so cost of sacrificing a pawn, you're getting your bishop to a pretty uh, sweet square on e4. And meanwhile, even though we like the way that Ray was pressuring the position, he has ended up drawing against Veruja and so that's Ooh. another result in the bag. We're not having quite as much blood in the, in the round this day, <laughs> not but, as much but action, a lot of potential yeah. blood. There's, exactly. <laughs> that, that, this is what it all comes down to, these 30 minutes in the... Uh, the pre-time control zone, correct? I'm I'm really surprised by Ray's decision as white here. Even though he's a pawn down, he's got, he's the man with all the activity, and queen f8 draw agreed. Uh, he's the man with a plan, but it's not I, even 30 uh, moves. So that's yeah, have right. I misunderstood? Don't we have a 30-move rule yeah. in this game? It's not the Sophia uh, rules that we play, but I, or maybe it was just a, oh, it was a repetition. Ah, uh, yes. So we always think pardon. that. We always get confused by that, don't we? So it was just a repetition of moves. What were the they, were re they were repeating the position back and forth with right, the queen. Perhaps because uh, Ray didn't think of a way to, he didn't really want to weaken himself with these like before ideas that we were looking at earlier, leaving like more results up for grabs. Well, I do, I do believe that Ray underestimated his position a bit, and I think Var will be very pleased with himself to have escaped what was not a happy uh, situation. So a draw by 
uh, Ray uh, brings him to three out of four, and all eyes was, turn to I mean, board this could one. Have been partly because of his time situation. You know, we were talking, we were praising his time handling, but he did only have four minutes for thirteen moves. So that's not a lot, especially if you're talking about trying to or orchestrate um, a massive advantage from this minuscule on. Okay. Like you're, you're going to make committal moves like B four or four minutes on your clock. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably why. And we actually got a, a tweet from Grandmaster Ben Feingold, who's commentating over at the Kingside Diner, yeah. and he said that, I told Ray to draw or not get into time pressure. <laughs> <laughs> he, chose he chose not to get pressure. into time <laughs> trouble. Okay, well, interesting decision uh, in that game. Maurice, we'll go to you as I'm figuring yep. out what's happening in the Wesley So ending. A very big development possible with one of the leaders in the women's tournament. Katarina Nemsova with the black pieces battling against Alyssa Melchina. And it looks like Alyssa might have made a huge mistake. Take a look at how the game developed. We left the game at a point where this pawn was won by black. So black was a pawn up, but dealing with some kingside development issues. Look at how this game proceeded. Queen to g3, bishop dropping back to e8. Now rook to g4, forcing a defensive move, rook g8. Now c4, guarding her pawn and saying, what are you going to do with your position? She played the move f5, offering this possibility of taking on the square, allowing queen takes. And I'm not sure exactly why she didn't go for this position, but she could have taken back and would have been interesting for her. Instead of capturing this pawn on f5, she played the move rook to d4 and allowed g5. We talk about this being the move of the tournament, g5, this time in a good situation for black. But look at black's king, very exposed. So h4, why not? Very natural. Queen to e7. And now Alyssa needs to be very careful, maybe trade off these pawns. Instead, she played the move queen h2. And unfortunately for her, her opponent has found the very first move of the critical line, g4, telling you move your knight out the way. We'll find a square for the knight. And now the money move is she finds it g3 burying the queen in the position but also more critically if you capture back suddenly this rook is starting to be a factor this pin is possible queen c5 even a great move like rook to the d8 very deep move the point is that black's queen is going to be superior to white's queen in this position so a trade of rooks which looks most natural, suddenly this knight is under attack, and it's black who has all the dynamic play. This queen check is coming into position. If a move like knight to f3, for example, just, just take a good look at this queen. I mean, you want to improve that guy? You're not going to do it for a while. Queen d3, for example, picking up even more stuff really quickly would be very powerful. So let's see if she finds it. Knight e1 has been played on the board, so I can go back to this moment, knight e1. I'm not sure if she realizes the g3 shot, but g3 takes and queen to c5 will be a huge problem for her. It looks like Belahina is going to go down in this game. Guys? We also Thank have you. a big turnaround in the game between Irina Crush and our Perva Verkud as um, an unfavorable exchange of pawns have occurred for the youngster. All right, let's see what happened here. We were talking about this position uh, a little bit earlier, g4. That was the answer to bishop f1. f4, we looked at knight f3, but knight d7 was arena's choice, which makes perfect sense. Now that the pawn on h3 is defended, um, Perva played bishop e2, and after knight c5, bishop takes g4, arena to play. I'm sure arena's thinking about capturing on um, e4 with her knight. But doesn't that look like an unfavorable exchange there that we, you, you let us like just jump into the position here on e4? Yes. In other words, I like what Irina has done very much because also there's a nasty trick here. Check this one out. Okay, obviously the knight attacks the queen. The queen needs to move, but at the same time protect the knight. How about this? Is this a shot? Knight takes g3. If you take with a pawn, obviously you're unleashing this passer. If you take with the queen, well, then the knight on d4 has been hanging. So we're going to have to hanging. try. So show us after pawn takes. I beg your pardon. Knight so takes, show us after pawn, pawn takes, takes, h2. Two. And now, um, well, bishop f3 is our only way. How about this as a shot? <laughs> is that cheeky? That is fun. That's a cheeky shot, right? Because after check, I get to drop back with the oh, bishop. Oh, beautiful. And Very then, nice yeah, whoopsie daisy, and black emerges as a piece ahead. 
So there are there are cheap cheapos in the position that uh, the youngster Perva and the wily veteran Irina. She likes these tactical uh, shots. She's very, she's got a very good eye. And by the way, Kate has found the money move according to Maurice and has found g4 g3 burying white's queen on this horrible square on h2 and suddenly these moves f5 g5 g4 giving kate uh not only a material advantage but also the initiative she looks like she's rolling uh, to victory and by the way if she wins she'll be Three, Three and, and a half, half out of four. four. That's a huge score. Wow, um, Another Monster player score. who seems to be rolling to victory in the women's section is Tata Vavrahami. I remember she started as one of the tournament favorites, and she began with two losses. Oof. She won yesterday, and it looks like she's on her way to a win today. So with Irina Crush stumbling early in the tournament, she still might become a threat. Well, we expected her to emerge uh, and, you know, deal with these two losses, but what better way than to snap back with two wins? Two that, wins in a row. I mean, she's that's up a the couple best pawns answer here. that you could give. This looks yeah. lovely. And now um, Timur Gureyev, um, how's he doing against Gada Kamsky? That seems well. To be he was really taking the fight to Gada, and he had sacrificed the exchange. It was rook takes a five. I like what he had done up to this point. Bishop takes d six, queen d eight. C5. Oof, this is not fun for Black to play, especially with two, two minutes on his clock. Two connected pass pawns on C5 and D5. Huge, huge advantage for White. And now he's played A3. Bishop to C4. Bishop C4, keeping that, keeping an eyeball, I should say, on that pawn. And do we have a move? Bishop yeah, F5. Yeah, Bishop F5 has happened. And now um, so Timor licking his chops as he's looking at his opportunity to uh, gain a very We're important not down victory. Material anymore. You mean, I mean after, bishop after bishop takes, takes c7, c7, queen takes c7. We're not even down material, and our pawns are rolling. True, but I'm just worried. You, you don't even want to take on c7. I do and don't. You know, I have mixed I just, feelings. I, the thing I like about <laughs> taking on c7 is that. We're getting our bishop out of the way so we can start queening our pawns. <laughs> so you like to see go, re yeah, reestablishing the material. I'm, do you like knight d6 or do you like d6? Um, I was sure. going to try to play d6. Yeah. Okay, and let's say queen c6, attacking the knight, just drop back and maybe look eyeballing queen e7 and queen. This looks very, very good for Timor. Maurice, are we right? Is Gata going down? Uh, you are true, as some of the Russians like to say. This position looks very good for White, but guess what? He did not play bishop takes c7. In this moment, the move bishop to b5 could have been played by Gata. He's going to kick himself for not finding that deflecting shot, forcing the, rook, the bishop to move back and putting his bishop on a much better square. Instead, he did play that move bishop to f5, and he's been responded to by knight to g3, missing a great move here. You're right, if he had played, and you know, it's that time pressure thing going on. If he had played instead, uh, in this moment, okay, just when my board decides to freeze, if he had played bishop takes, like you said, and then that knight g3 line, you actually showed that variation, so you can bring that up again, Yes, followed by d6, he would have been rolling, especially since he's going to take the pawn on a3. That's the key idea here. After you bring the knight back, after taking the exchange, after stabilizing these pawns, you take the bish you you chase the bishop away and take the pawn on a3. Once that pawn is gone, Black's counterplay is dead, and he's just facing two solid pass pawns. But Timur missed it instead in time pressure, played knight g3. Now Black can actually move the rook away and try to fight back in this position. So we'll see how they handle their time pressure as the moves come in fast and furious. E7 moving the rook away, as you said, Maurice, was played. And just because your board uh, wasn't uh, cooperating, what you had mentioned was that if Timur had simply played after the move, bishop f5, capture the rook at once, and thereafter move knight back to g3, keeping d5, d6 in reserve, and just going after this pawn on a3. And that's the key. Uh, take away those pawns, and what white is left with is two connected pass pawn and a rather meaningless pawn on the a7 square that's not actually 
uh, up the board. And now let's this see what actually happened, running. because it also looks like it's uh, difficult for Black to defend, especially in the time pressure situation, well, where they've got eight moves. So um, we've got Knight G3. So what happened Knight was Knight G3, Knight takes F5. Right, G takes F5. Now white to play. Uh, the only way black is going to make it difficult for white is he's looking for this opportunity to sacrifice the exchange back. So we expect back. queen takes a3. So in case of queen takes a3, takes, and takes, takes, bishop f8, uh, you, you can take this pawn, but after queen takes, you're in a bishop of opposite color game. Obviously, white's for choice, but, you know, again, this is like slippery gata, you know, from a losing or lost position you know, re, uh, digging down, finding a resource that allows him to uh, to stay in the game. Now he played bishop to e5 instead. Uh, not too much of a big difference here, bishop e5 or bishop d6, uh, bishop f8, pardon me. Uh, you're just simply recapturing this pawn on d6 for this pawn on a7, and again, you know, got a you know, tough defender that he is, is finding that one opportunity in the position. And the big difference, if you go back to this moment after the move bishop f5, uh, Timor ended up winning the exchange for a bishop, but he got his pawns doubled. If he had just gone with your move, which, sorry to say, the most obvious one, uh, grabbing the exchange, then dropping back, then his two pawns would have been... Uh, pristine. Pristine, and side by side, uh, protect... well past pawns, uh, very, very strong. So another so miss... So it would have been a case of overthinking. Yeah. Because in a blitz game, he would have just snapped it off and gone for this. Of but course. But he thought a little bit too hard, and that um, haunted him. All right, let's go back to our number one board, uh, Wesley So, pawn up after we know these difficult moments for Hikaru. I don't think Hikaru stopped shaking his head for the last 30 minutes, by the way. <laughs> I know, I said, when is he going to stop? <laughs> I when mean, he scores a draw, maybe, if yeah. he scores a draw. Okay, so he's definitely... Otherwise, he's going to keep shaking his head until he, <laughs> he plays tomorrow. Until the score sheets are signed. So uh, when we left it, uh, Hikaru had just played the move. King f2, bishop a c6, rook a1, defending the pawn, f6, uh, preparing to centralize the king. Um, and this a5, one's going to go the distance, b5, I, I believe. c4, uh, Hikaru trading the pawns, and we're up to date now. And we'll keep an eye on this one, um, but as we approach uh, time control, some dramatic happenings, um, what's going on in Nsova's game? Is she going to win this and be leading the women's championship? Maurice, what do you think? My guess is she is going to win this, and she will be leading the tournament. She looks like the, the one to stop in this event. She is playing like a world beater right now, and we saw some moves uh, that just that said, look, I'm coming to take over the world right now. Take a look at this continuation. We saw this G4 happen, knight to E1, G3, trying to bury the queen. Alyssa said, I don't want to have my queen buried on that side. Nemsova said, so what? Let's trade off your only active piece, that rook on D4. Alyssa brought her knight back, another trade, knight takes, and now rook to G4. I mean, that move leaves a gigantic impression. You don't want to play f4, first of all, because your queen is buried forever. Second of all, because moves like queen to c5 would be possible. Uh, or even just, <laughs> funny variation, a5. What if I try to queen my pawn? Your queen looks completely ridiculous. It's never getting in the game. So rook to g4 looks like a monster move. Uh, she did play knight back to f3 in response. And now this queen can just show up on c5 in this kind of position. I mean, you just never see. Queen on h3, nothing can move on this side, and all of this is falling. Two pass pawns. Black is completely winning. She's going to go to three and a half points and be leading clear in the women's championship, waiting to see if the person she's tied with, Galatiani, will win her game. But uh, she just looks like the ladies' champion right now, playing chess at a very high level. She was playing the kind of chess that I really expected Irina uh, to come to this championship and play. I mean, all of her games have been really dominant ones. Uh, she gave up a draw, but in that game, it was against uh, Ruslan that she gave up the draw. She should be 4-0, and, and she's been playing terrific chess, and I agree with Maurice. This, posi this position is 
is essentially hopeless for White. This queen on h3 is a terrible misplaced piece, and Elisa knows it. She hasn't quite gone into the Hikaru Nakamura uh, shaking of the head, but she recognizes her, her cause is lost. Again, I just want to go back up and check in on this well, game yeah, of Wesley So. Yeah, that type. She's super composed, right? She you know, she's also has this well background composed. in ballet, and that's why she, you always see her with this, this perfect posture while yes. she's playing, right? Yes. Most chess players like kind of hunched over the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. Um, I'm thinking that Wesley So uh, again has got 50% chance of winning the game versus a 50% chance of drawing for Hikaru. So it hasn't changed. It hasn't Your changed much. Hasn't changed yet. Uh, but it may change very, very shortly. It really depends if, if black, that is to say Wesley, gets in two moves for free. If he gets to play the move king d6 and rook g7 for free, uh, suddenly I think his winning chances go up, you know, shoot up really dramatically because then Essentially, all of his pieces are better than his opponents. Uh, Ikaru's rook is going to be tied down to the A file. This rook, this rook on C7 will jump to the square G5, which will mean that it will be attacking uh, the pawn on A5 as well as the pawn on D6. Excellent bishop on C6, excellent king on D6. So Ikaru has got some issues, real big-time issues to deal with. And let me just go to the game of uh, arena uh, crush the defending champion. Maurice is saying something uh, crazy has just happened. Let's take a look at what happened here. When we left it, we left it at these parts. She didn't play knight, knight takes e4, by the way. She played bishop takes e4. Set up, uh, alert. Uh, there's a big queen takes d4 in the position. Ooh, and she didn't stop it. Oh, no. And that's it. That's all she wrote. Unfortunately, yeah, at the end of the variation, instead of taking the queen, she gets to check. The, the old Swishenzug and yeah. Arena That's Crush. That's been the uh, motif of the tournament. Arena Crush. By the way, uh, not just a win. All wins are very nice, but it just happened that uh, Aperva had the same number of points. So she gets to push Aperva down, and she jumps up to two and a half points. But uh, the wrecking ball in the event, Kate, uh, Nemkova, um, three and a half points. She looks like the lady. Uh, oh, pardon me. She hasn't won yet. No, she hasn't <laughs> won yet. I'm counting the chickens before they've hatched here. Okay. Interesting. Oh, why did Kate? Kate captured this knight on f3. I don't think I would have ever have touched that knight on f3. I just left it alone. I liked. Uh, Marisa's idea very much of what are you doing going to do if you just push this pawn? All the pieces are stuck, if you will, on the king side. But that was not her choice. She took, took, and has played rook takes c4. Still winning. This is just very, very good for black. Okay. Uh, there are other games in the men in the open section. Well, um, in the Kamsky game, we're, we're just, we, we made time control, so we can come back to that later. Let's look for a game like that a draw. hasn't, uh, Conrad hasn't Holt, reached time control yet. I think only the ladies. Alexander Holt, uh, Holt uh, Conrad Holt, Alexander Onishuk, uh, four versus, well, five versus five, rook ending. Looks, a little, looks pretty balanced, a little edge for Alexander. Shouldn't be enough uh, for the whole point. And that's it. And we haven't we looked at a Naji and Sabina uh, Foyzer's game for a little while against Annie Wang. Okay, let's go to uh, Ruslan's first. Uh, she has been nursing an extra pawn, a uh, major piece ending. We left it around these well, parts. Well, some activity. Except this move E5 has just suddenly showed up on the board because E5 sets up very nicely these right. queen F6 check ideas. So Naji had to cover, protect the F6 square. And I thought we were about to see a rook ending, uh, a queen ending there for a moment. Uh, but rook uh, b2, and, and Ruslan is setting up for a queen f6 check, followed by rook b8 check if she can get it. Uh, nice extra pawn, and what, mo what game would you like me to go well, to? Well, we can stay on this one for a minute, because we've just mm -hmm. got, I think this is the only game that hasn't reached time control yet. I see. So we've got uh, two minutes left for Rusa. Um, Queen e6 has been played now. Queen e6, again, Nazi. covering the f6 square, yeah. 
makes good sense. Now at some point, it might be a nice idea to play moves like g4 and h4. I would probably preface, if I was going to expand on the king side, I'd probably want to do it with g4 so that h4 could not be met by h5. And if the rook stepped back, my rook would come over and very nice extra pawn in the position. Um, tough defense isn't going to be needed by uh, Naji in this game. Let's see what else is going oh, on. Oh, Sabina Foyser, I wanted to draw yes. your attention because she has uh, one and a half points, but she looks like she's totally winning. So she will jump up to two and a half, which, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's plus one in this tournament, and uh, same score as Irina Crash. So it, uh, if she continues to play well, exactly. she could be a, a threat to the leaders. Exactly. Well, it looks like uh, she's it, mopping up. She really is. She has a very nice position to begin with, and look at that. Uh, the criminal, A3, is uh, broken out, broken free, and um, Annie is trying to set up for potential sacrifices here, whether they start with knight g6 or bishop f5 or rook f5. She's doing her best to try to distract black from doing what what uh, Sabine wants to do, which is simply queen or pawn. But strategically, game game over for uh, Sabine. I think she just has to play so, some precise moves, and she should be well on her way to victory in this game. That's right. So as we finish time control, we see that a lot of games are re-beginning, yes. and we are going to be in for quite a show today, especially with our top board still not decided, and of course the big Nakamura Snow matchup. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We are going to be right back after a little break with more action from the chess capital of America here in St. Louis. Thank you.
Back to the 2015 U.S. Chess Championships and U.S. Women's Chess Championships here in the capital of chess in America. Well, time pressure is over, but plenty of fun left to be had. Um, in the Women's Championship, we're, we were taking a look at our game between Ruzidan Golatiani and Nazi Pakidzi, and it looked like Ruzidan Golatiani might build herself up to a massive three and a half score. But um, in fact, Nazi found a pretty good defensive formation. Mm -hmm. um, does does Ruth have any chance here? No. Uh, now it's four versus three in a rook ending, and these are notoriously drawn, especially the a2 pawn and um, the defender. In this case, Nazi has an active rook, and this game should be a draw. Um, Ruslan is going to be kicking herself because she really let the wind go here in this game. Also, in our other game, I had already chalked up uh, the win mm -hmm. by Kate um, for some time against Elisa, but uh, the game is still going ongoing, although Kate is still winning and should just, with two connected pass pawns uh, in this rook ending, she should win the game, and that would be a massive score for Kate. But we right. do have our defending yes. champion in our studio. That's right. Irina we Crush. have defending champion Grandmaster Irina Crush with Maurice Ashley to talk about today's win. Well, certainly a fine result today for the six-time champion, Grandmaster Irina Crush. Welcome to the show, Irina. Thank you, Maurice. How did you manage uh, going into this game thinking about what happened yesterday against uh, Nasi Pakitsi? Well, I wasn't thinking about what happened yesterday. That was the point. You know, my, um, it was pretty clear I had to forget that game quickly, and I did. It didn't give me any particular nightmares. I mean, sometimes you lose, and my opponent uh, played better yesterday, so um, there wasn't any particular thing that I could really, um, well, criticize myself for except my overall play, you know. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my overall play, you know. I mean, it was just a kind of game, you know, I, I was better out of the opening, and... Um, but I let her. I underestimated her counterplay a bit, and then things uh, got out of control. She found a nice peace sacrifice, and then my position was very difficult to play. You know, I, um, so yeah, that that was that game. Um, but that happens, and uh, it wasn't pleasant, but it wasn't the end of the world. So today you go into a game against a youngster in the competition and a newcomer to the field, and this game wasn't easy either. I mean, it was a tough fight for a while at least. 
Yeah, I mean, this game was tough. Um, I just never managed to fix anything, any sort of real advantage. I never felt like I was in any trouble. I actually always felt like I was, uh, you know, controlling the pace of play and that White was basically just kind of reacting to my um, ideas throughout the game. Um, but it certainly wasn't easy to to um, fix an advantage, and only at the very end, um, you know, in time trouble, I managed to win. I was counting on that time trouble. <laughs> she did blunder. That was part of the plan. In a moment, okay. Uh, tell me, does it feel different, this championship, than other championships? So many young players in the tournament, good young players at that, not just people you know, being thrown in as a random wild card, but, but real serious challenges. Does this feel like a different championship to you? I think um, for me, maybe the, the way it feels most different is just that Anna is not here, you know, because... Um, Does that give additional pressure to you to win the tournament because you're clearly the favorite? No, I always feel that way, you know, um, whether she's, it was she's here or not. But, um, but yeah, certainly the dynamic is different when there's not someone just around your rating who you know can win almost all her games as well, you know. Um, for me, so yeah, maybe that's the biggest uh, difference. Um, but definitely the young players are more dangerous than before. That's, that's what I feel. And so I wasn't underestimating my, my opponents. I mean, she beat Elisa Malekina quite convincingly in the first round. She saved her game against Nazi Paikidze. So I knew that if things you know, got messy, anything could happen. Um, yeah, and, and, and in this game, I just realized that, that the clock was going to be—it was going to be a factor. It was going to have to be a factor since I couldn't win the game on its own. You know, I had to take a kind of um, account on the fact that in time pressure, she would uh, let an error slip in, and that's what happened. A real veteran's approach. Speaking of a veteran, Katerina Nemsova is playing like a world beater. This game, she was dom more dominating, but it looks like she's going to win. She's going to be at three and a half. What pressure do you feel to challenge her as she looks like she's sort of taken on his place and is just crushing in all her games? She should have won her first game against Politiani as well. Yeah, um, well, I played her in the last round, I think. So there's like a whole world <laughs> before that happens. Um, I really just think about it one game at a time. I know everyone says that, and, but that's the way you have to play your tournaments. You can't look too far ahead. I think tomorrow I play... Uh, I think it's Rusa. I'm not sure because <laughs> I said I only look one round ahead. Um, so you know, I have a lot of work. I have a lot of work to do to make up for the damage I uh, caused myself yesterday. But you don't always have it easy. You know, you can win a tournament from all kinds of positions. You know, you can, like, uh, you know, last year I won when I was a point behind with two rounds to go, and you know, I had to play Anna. So um, you know, anything can happen. I mean, Anna won here four years ago when um, she barely could make it into the qual into the top four, you know, and she did it through playing tie breaks with Sabina, won those, beat me in the semifinal, beat Tatev in the final. Um, so really, your chances aren't over when you lose one game. Well, wise words indeed. We thank you for joining us and wish you the best in your next game. Thank you, Maurice. Too far ahead. Thank you. Grandmaster Irina Crush, defending champion, getting herself back on her feet after yesterday's tough loss. We expect to see much more of her as the competition proceeds. Guys? Thank you. And indeed, she does play Rusa tomorrow, by the That's way. That's right, so, with the white pieces. And that will be a crucial matchup to the standings, without question. Again, we are looking at the game between Hikaru Nakamura and Wesley So. We've been playing around with the chess engines with Maurice during our break. And it's remarkable. The engines are kind of just saying, hey, listen, um, a seven-tenths of a pawn advantage for um, Wesley, but nothing really decisive or dramatic. And it's one of those positions that, you know, you, uh, to win it, you have to slow play it and just increase it. Uh, improve your uh, pieces incrementally. I like what Wesley has done so far. I mentioned it before, he's brought his king to d6. It had been on g8, it's a lot more active, it's closer to the action on d6. The one piece that he really needs to do something with is magically move this rook over to the g5 square, where it will be attacking the pawn on g4, back attacking the pawn on a5. Um, 
and, and at some point he needs to create a pass pond too. How exactly he goes about that, we, we're going to have to wait and see. But the engines are just basically chilling out and saying, Ikaru should hold this game. And I thought, in fact, that Wesley's uh, chances were much greater than the engines giving the p current position credit well, sometimes for. Sometimes they don't understand the end game quite as much, right? I, I don't mean, know. Yes, They're getting bases, the, yeah, but... the table bases, especially that uh, that particular ending, Wesley. So Sam Shanklin, that was like uh, one of the worst end games for a human player. They're very, very complex. Yet uh, the table bases have worked out the ending perfectly. With perfect play, it's a draw. With perfect play, it's a win. And the players were playing back and forth, almost like a hot potato, as to who was going to mess it up. And in the end, uh, Sam Shanklin messed it up. Uh, made the final mistake and lost the game. By the way, we did we did see a move by Hikaru. That's right. He's playing very, he's like the A6 in this position. Th not a move that I considered at all. What on earth is Bishop A6? That looks very, very strange to me. I'm not sure I get this at all. So I would play the move Rook G8 with a straightforward idea. Again, I've mentioned it several times. Uh, either playing the Rook to capture the pawn on g4 or playing to put the rook on g5. Now that the bishop goes to a6, going rook g5, rook takes a5 comes with a tempo. So I'm not exactly sure why probably, Hikaru like this. You probably have to play this. like bishop e2 or something just to protect the pawn. Okay, bishop e2. But yeah, that, that makes us makes you wonder why we play bishop a6. Exactly. And now, uh, now the question is, should I should I try to improve my bishop? Like a moment ago, I was talking about improving the king. The king looks really good. Should I start to put my bishop on d5? Or let, let's play the move that I really wanted to play for a long time anyway. Rook that g5. lovely outpost rock, huh? Exactly. a6 looks kind of forced. We'll swing the rook over here for a moment, uh, seeking to harass uh, white's king with a rook check. Should we look at rook h? No, we don't want to look at rook h1. Oops. Excuse mm -hmm. me. So let's look at rook b8. Sure. Now we've got a little hakasito. King is going to have to go to f4, I'm yeah, let's supposing. Go to f4, sure. And now, well, here's the question of the passer. Let's just have a look see. e5 check, takes, takes. I would have, I'd love to prepare this in a nicer way for black, um, but for the moment, let's just. See, does this give enough chances? The pawn on h6 is... Yeah, so rook uh, h8. Yeah. Well, rook h8 is not the end of the show. Let's say I give a... Should I give a check or just... I'll start with this one. Okay, let me start with this one. And so now... So now if we play g5? Now we play g5. You have bishop d7 check. Exactly. Protecting your rook so that... After king, I will take your pawn. And I'm getting into a bishop's ending that might just be winning with the pawn on a6 because it's on a light square. And we so, do have a couple moves, actually, after... Wonderful. We've got a... It looks like rook g8 instead of bishop e2, Hikaru has played for counterplay immediately with rook f1. That's what I think we got, yeah. So, so this was his rook idea. G8. Rook F1. So instead of passive defense, he's trying With to defend Bishop actively. E2. All right, fair enough. I mean, that's usually the way to go in these in these rook type end games. Uh, active defense is is better. Of course, yes. the first step is to calculate. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have to go to two choices, and you know, you just don't really have time to calculate both of them, lean towards the active one. Yes, principle of active defense, especially in the ending, is a very crucial one. It's you, normally speaking, if you huddle up and go into a, a tight ball and say, I'm, I'm going to hold on, you make it much easier for your opponent to increase his advantage. Okay, so rook f1 with the obvious intention of capturing this pawn on f6. But let's have a look here, because is Hikaru giving Wesley a chance? Okay, let's bite. Rook takes, rook takes, and let me say, okay, I like pawns. I'll keep this pawn on h5 for a moment. So I do have, I, the rook takes e6 trick doesn't work here because you can interpolate the bishop on d7. It's, uh, the skewer doesn't work, right? Yes. 
But it would be because my pawn is on a sure, five. Yeah, <laughs> okay. the movie four, yeah. I guess. You tactically, you girls are so tactically inclined. Jeez. <laughs> okay. Well, we could, but I do think that you know that, that means that we should look at some moves like bishop c8. But I guess for the moment, you always have like bishop d5. Exactly, bishop d5. And again, I'm trying. I need a pass pawn in the position. Let me put it that way. And the the trick that I really want. Uh, let me just put show you just the trick that I really want um, is I want to put you in a very unpleasant pinning situation like this. This would be white's uh, black's ideal. I beg right. your pardon. Yeah. Now so, you might have had rook takes d4 in that position. Sure. For like a more cheapo type sure. trick. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying. Okay, from the position we have at hand, which whoops, I'm going the wrong way. I apologize. Uh, we do have rook f1. We've been looking at rook takes g4, rook takes f6, h5, and just saying, okay, my pawn up, do something. And we looked at, oops, not that one. We were looking at bishop c8, I beg your pardon, right? Yeah, he's just throwing in a little bishop c8. Bishop d5, protecting this pawn. Oh, and yeah. I was just mentioning that rook f7, um, <coughs> there's also the possibility of rook d4. It's kind of interesting. Rook d4, or rook e4. <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry, Jen, what? Um, rook, rook d4 and e5, Jack. <gasps> oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't look any further. Than I just, King takes d4 and I was thought thinking... thought I just of, typoed. <laughs> well, yeah, blunder the rook. Hello, I beg your pardon. Very nice shot. e5 check. Oops. And the thing is, if rook d7 check, we have king e5, so... In order to defend the... Yeah. Okay, but after rook d4... Oops, sorry. What are we doing? Rook takes d4. I do have rook takes a7, with or without check. I'm not sure. Let's say I just go rook a7. Trading off a lot of pawns suddenly. It gives you a lot of counterplay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, so how do you think? How do you think uh, Wesley can be solid here? Well, I, well, can he drop again, his back? I think h5 is good. Uh, and sorry, bishop c8 is good. Bishop d5 is good. I was thinking that after rook f7. I like this line a moment ago that we had on, on our board that went something like rook g8, just uh, tickling this bishop, forcing it to drop back. No, guess what? This is a, this is a pretty dangerous pawn. I wonder what happens if we just get behind the pawn and say, bring me victory. Oops, sorry. Here. So that if you take this pawn, which is a reasonable decision, I'm going like this. Mm, maybe it's too slow. I'm not but sure. a lot of calculations for Wesley. Now, how about if he goes for a little bit more of a passive route and just plays um, king e7 here? Um, mm. it just doesn't seem like enough to you. Rook f1, rook f1 to c1, uh, swinging to the uh, c file. If you're going to take a passive route, maybe you would do it like uh, this. But again, I think rook takes g4. Well, let's see again. This is the position at hand. One more look. Rook takes g4, rook takes f6, right? And then h5, that's what you want. Yeah, h5 is what I want, but I want a lot of things here. Okay. <laughs> you can't uh, have everything. One move at a time. Why not? I want everything. Okay, let me start with a rook check. How's this? This is good in order to disturb you. How about rook check? Where would you like to go with the king? Back to f2 or up to f4 or back to d2? Um, let's go to f4. f4. And then you have rook f3 check. And wins. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make it easy for Sal. Well, thank you he so deserves, much. He deserves it. Okay, yeah, Hikaru, would you no, no, be no, happy we'll, with your decision we'll go, making? I'm sorry, Hikaru. <laughs> okay. King but, d2. King d2, okay. Now, having achieved this wonderful success of driving your king a little bit backwards. Let's see what I can do next. And for my next trick, I am going to play h5. Now, in this case, the difference is maybe I've given you bishops. See, this is what I was trying to achieve before in the sense that I get an active king, but probably you're going to get enough counterplay with a move like rook here. All right, well, we're going to see whether so can pull this one out, but I think you're, you're, you're under 50% yet. No, I'm still, still at the same. 50 /50? I'm still at the same All price. Right. I think I think uh, Wesley has played a good game, very uh, very good game, and uh, he's still trying to squeeze. 
Maurice, thoughts on uh, how Nemsova's game is shaping up? Well, I'd like to make an observation. So far, four of the games in the men's championship, or in the open championship, have ended in a draw. A fifth game, Conrad Holt, battle against Onischuk. That will also end in a draw. This sixth game, looking very likely, at least a maximum 50%, according to you, Yaz, looks like a draw as well. That's going to be six draws possible. Already four draws done and a fifth draw coming almost certainly in the Open Championship. But on the ladies' side, it looks like there might be five wins out of six. Uh, maybe six wins out of six if one of, the game goes, one of the games goes the wrong way. But it turns out that one of the games we were already writing it off completely, the game between Alyssa Malahina and Katarina Nemsova, that one has some difficulties. And you see her there. You want a look of a woman who's working too hard right now? There it is with Katarina, who has blown the gigantic advantage she accrued earlier in the game. I mean, she really played so well to get to this position. But she made a trade that was simply cryptic in my mind, or maybe the answer is it was just bad. In this position, she had this queen totally frozen on this side of the board. This queen can never get out. I mean, it's just it's just imprisoned in this, in this way, entombed on this square. So she could have done anything. The engines are saying she could be as calm as playing the move A5. Forget about the fact that she could rip a pawn off the board. Just play A5 and make this pawn uh, scare the mess out of White's position. Instead, she played the move that none of the engines are talking about. Bishop takes on F3 and suddenly opened up the game and freed this queen. Now, she's still much better here. Rook takes on C4, but look at that. Queen G2, Alyssa must have breathed a sigh of relief when she was able to play that move, even though she's still worse. Rook C2, Queen G1, and now the trade, Queen takes on G1, another a plus for White. And after King G1, we'll jump ahead now to what the position is we had established with this position, king to e3. It looks as though these two pass pawns, it should be over. It should be lights out. Well, it's not so easy because the move b2, rook to b1 is very tricky. We want to play a move like rook to b6, but here comes the white king headed over there. It means that black would have to change directions because a5, king back to, or king to c3, and now this pawn is going to drop. White has a pass pawn on this side as well. Black's going to have to change directions and go this way, but the engine's already calculating this to be just a little bit better for black as compared to what was a completely crushing position before. She should not have to be working this hard to work out the win. And it is clear to her that uh, her fine play and the advantage that she had has not paid off. So we'll see whether or not she's able to get the game back and get a lock on these women's championships. Guys? That's wow. right. I mean, I think she's probably going to win anyway, but... Obviously, conserving energy and not leaving the result in doubt is the way to go. She does have a tough round tomorrow. She's going to be playing against Tatev Abrahamian. Right. Who's showing and her forms coming back. Yeah, after two losses, kind of bouncing back with two wins. And Kate's problem in this event is she's outplaying her opponents brilliantly within the first 30, 40 moves or so, and then just letting the win. Uh, uh, after having a chokehold on the position that she had against Rusa and today, uh, she's kicking herself in the teeth. So she's playing well. She just did good the, middle game, good opening, good understanding of the ideas, aggression. But just when it comes time to claim victory, she's letting it slip through her grasp. So if you were her coach, how would you? Whose games would you tell her to study to work on that? Like, what approach would you would you give to her? Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, I congratulate her for playing so well. <laughs> I mean, like, it's Builder really, confidence. really, really, really good yeah. that you're getting these winning positions. It's really, really, really good. But uh, somehow uh, you're breathing a sigh of relief uh -huh. when you're getting a winning position. And now it's time to start realizing you've got to bear down and win them. Uh, Anatoly Kondov, great great master of the technique and so even after he got a big advantage just making sure to to ride at home perfectly. And, and to bring home the big hand that's right and uh uh talia was fantastic at that uh so kate uh that that's a wonderful cure to have to have by the way <laughs> you know like the problem for me is like getting these bad positions and saving them or something like that but no 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 having winning positions and just you know um uh, pressing yourself, pressuring yourself to win them, that's that's a nice fault, let's say. Well, guess who's back? 
Of course. Yes, Timor. he's back. Timor's back, but today he's got some super rad pants. Mr. Excitement himself. I mean, you don't know what kind of gambits he's going to be throwing. Uh, I want to know, is he going to, you know, throw us for a wrench again tomorrow? Of course. Of course. We could not, I mean, you never know what to expect with Timor, and he's... With yes. us with him, Maurice. Timur Gareev is with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. Timur has just drawn against Gadakamsky in a game where he had some chances to pull off the full victory. Not some chances. He he had him cold. Well, we are with the irregular opening specialist, Timur Gareev, after playing uh, H6 and G5 yesterday. Timur played the uh, intriguing line with the wing gambit. Timur, tell us why yesterday you said that that uh, Akobian was the ideal person to try something strange against. Oh. And yet today, you tried it against Gadakomsky, the reigning champ. Yeah, um, well, um, yeah, it was an exciting game, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was an exciting game. Why did you decide on the wing gambit against him? Well, uh, I had some prepared against Karo Khan. I kind of had a feeling he was going to play Karo Khan. I was just taking one move at a time. And then uh, when I played E4, you know, I had, I had some prepared against Karo Khan. We'll, we'll see if somebody's going to play that. <laughs> You're telegraphing your preparation against Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Warning everyone not to no, play that line. Normally, that's why I don't play E4, because people play like C6, you know. I'm like, I don't know what to do. But now I <laughs> have an idea. But, uh... Yeah, so, and then uh, B4, it, just, it was just hard to pick anything else, you know, it was just... So you chose yeah. to give away a pawn and a move, a move three. I don't, yeah. A I'm move not, two, even. I'm not an E4 player, so, you know, it's, I'll, I'll probably do as well in a, any, any system uh, as good as, like, the main line, let's say, you know. Except for closed positions, I don't like those. All right, so you got a decent position at some point. You definitely had compensation, and then you decided to sacrifice an exchange with rook takes a5. Did you do it because you were in time pressure, or because you really felt like this was the the way to go? Well, uh, you know, I think the whole game was was fascinating from a standpoint of the strategies, um, uh, kind of meeting each other and uh, you know facing each other. So Gata was just really skeptical about skeptical about uh, trying to. Pick pick up any of my material because you know there, there were besides the sacrifice that I delivered there was actually kind of a minor sacrifice uh, you know there were a lot of sacrifices that could have taken place in the game you guys probably saw right g5 commits me to, uh, to sacrificing sacrifice a piece right there yeah. so, so I got another one actually uh, I, I have a cool position in mind if, if, if you would like sure, to let's take a look. pull up back to where the bishop is on h4 I think move 12 probably yep and uh, here uh, yeah just to Make sure people know what we're talking about. Yeah, G5, we oh look, wow. We looked at this. Yes, we looked at uh -huh. this, G5. I didn't, I didn't think about Bishop G5. I thought of Knight G5. Really? Yeah, I didn't yeah, think of Bishop G5. Bishop G5 seemed Knight quite strong, six. according to the... Oh, man, yeah, that's kind of cool. But uh, yeah, let me just show you the idea. So Knight G5, uh, H takes G, Bishop G5. And, uh, well, you yeah, see computer kind of calm down a little bit. So here I, I considered F6, at which point I was going to play E5. Okay, that's a crazy move. Yeah, yeah. So now actually commits black to taking on e5 with one of the knights, right? Because everything else is uh, giving white a good. Yeah, but knight takes looks yeah. uh, pretty pleasing to the engines right now. Yeah, uh, but you know, even even this position, I guess it's kind of it's, it's like a huge advantage for for black, right? So I guess d takes e, black is gonna recapture with a d pawn, right? Or f takes g. Okay, okay, okay. Pick up now. They pick up the bishop. Oh, okay, and the bishop of five covers the. This is a crazy position. This is a, <laughs> the kind of position you wanted to look at against Gadakovsky. Yeah, I, I, I might have figured out uh, that I was supposed to take with the bishop, but um, yeah, yeah I mean, we did see we did see that sacrifice. Uh, but I, I really want to jump to this moment in the game that was mm -hmm. critical. Everybody's curious about it. Was when you sacrificed the exchange here mm -hmm. in this position. You decided not to play queen g3, a solid move, but you sacrificed rook takes a5, b takes a5, knight e4. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like? You were winning here or had some yeah. fantastic chances? Yeah, yeah. I felt like uh, I just couldn't see uh, a way for black to defend. Yeah, absolutely. Queen g3. I didn't realize that was just a simply winning a pawn, right? Well, here uh, he played uh, a4. Yeah, so yeah, he played a4, and then you took on d6, queen d8, and you played this monster move, uh, c5, and then he, he played, what was it, bishop? Uh, Sorry, a3, yeah, pushing the pawn forward. He played a3 here, yeah. and, uh, and according to the engines, after, after bishop c4, 
He should have played bishop to b5. Yep, but, that's what I expected, yeah. But instead he played this move, and what what did you have? Did you think about bishop c7 at all? Yeah, I guess it's just, uh, I, I had I had an option of pick, picking up that rook for a couple moves, so I just kind of forgot there was, <laughs> that it's a rook, and, you know, it's better than the bishop. <laughs> you know? So, so you know, I just didn't cross my mind. I just kept uh, playing that kind of a gambit-style game. So you couldn't uh, get out of that mode that you were in to, to yeah, capture with, this piece? With very little time on the clock, uh, you know. And uh, plus, you know, once I pick it up, uh, that gives freedom to my pawns, which start moving forward, which wasn't the case in the game. And, uh, you know, that bishop on c4 basically finishes the game, looks like. So a missed opportunity uh, in this game. Can we count on you to play some more creative oh, Timor uh, gambits in your future games? You gotta, you gotta teach me some more. I'm running out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have plenty more ideas in that <laughs> mind than I do, for sure. Huh? But Timur, thank you so much for at least an entertaining show. We appreciate it and good luck in the yeah, rest of your games. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Timur Gureyev, uh, one of the top players in the tournament. Back to you guys. Uh, Timur, today I really, really like the way you play. I have a quick question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, every, uh, I like to play the wing gamut when I was a youngster. Uh, everything you did, to my mind, brought back wonderful, wonderful memories. You got to move 22. And exactly at this mo position on move 22, I thought that you had the greatest structure in terms of limiting black's pieces. The pawn on c3 is good, the pawn on d4 is great, kills the bishop on g7, the pawn on d5 is great, kills the knight on c6. I was expecting you to, you played the, the very straightforward and aggressive uh, c4. I liked your structure. I didn't understand why you didn't play queen g3. Uh, the idea of queen g3 obviously is eyeballing bishop g6 kind of sacrifices, knight e4, knight takes d6. Uh, if black tries to move his king, like king h7, it seems to me he's walking into h4 and Gata is going to be in big, big trouble. Uh, did you give queen g3 a lot of thought or just give us your understanding of what's going on in the position at move 22? Oh, uh, f uh, f yeah, for sure, yes, yeah, sir. Uh... Uh, queen g3 was a part of my strategy. Uh, the well, the, the thing that's actually the computer is showing that as well. After queen g3, black gets to play g5, committing me to uh, a sacrifice. That's actually exactly where uh, I didn't see. Uh, uh, so bishop takes g5, h takes g, and then what happens is that uh, so queen takes g5. I got to pick off that pawn, and he gets to play e5, where his queen from d8. Uh, uh, connects with the king side. That rook on c7 is ready to defend. So uh, uh, once black plays f5, and uh, black gets to coordinate the attack. Now queen g3 idea was definitely there. So for example, I, when I played that, that was the difference. I was going to play c4, and the cool thing about the c4 idea is the yeah. So c4. The the cool thing about it is that hey, uh, this whole game I basically. I was willing to sacrifice my whole army for to reach Black's king. Now you know that rook on a3, instead of being a passive observer, is uh, getting a potential pathway all the way to g3. So once I get rid of the bishop and the rook, they throw the queen out to h5. You know the rook is coming to g3, right? <laughs> so I figured if I was serious about the attack in this game, I had to play c4. Now if queen c8. Uh, which is a, a kind of a cool subtle move, uh, uh, trying to play bishop f5. Now here I believe uh, white can play queen g3. I guess bishop, yeah, bishop f5, I guess that was, that was kind of a cool counter-attacking strategy. That's, I think, where Gata was going to be getting some counterplay. So bishop f5, queen f5, and even though I do get to pick up that pawn on d6, uh, rook d7, or, oh, rook c4, okay, beautiful, yeah? Rook c4 right there, right? And uh, that's the kind of play that got a hand in mind, I'm sure, uh, to kind of get, get out of the so get out of the that the turtle position and get into uh, you know offensive uh, for for sure. And uh, so uh, that's why well, a lot of my actions were kind of uh, as as I was building up my position, I was also trying to play active enough so that he can he has to be focusing on the defense rather than. No, I'm going for the counterattack. What are you feeling about your chances going into uh, the rest of the tournament? Well, I, I feel like my goal would be to 
get uh, you know more than 50 percent. That's that that would be great. Yeah. So once that happens, I think uh, um, you know th that's that's like a reasonable uh, goal, right? And what are my chances? Uh, I'm just taking it one game at a time. You know, it's this, this we game. We get that all the time. One game. <laughs> one game at a time. Yeah, because it's a long tournament, right? <laughs> I mean, you can have your big strategy and you know all this, you know, calculations. But uh, the color doesn't really mean anything. We can see uh, both black and white winning. Uh, the opponents, uh, the, the the highest rated players in the in the tournament, uh, losing their game. So uh, I, I don't know how did Wesley play, do against They're the, still playing. the Hikaru. Yeah. So I think Hikaru is defending uh, position down the pond. You know. So. Yeah, so it's uh, it's 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 not quite a roulette, obviously. <laughs> That's why we like the game, um, you know, for the intellectual reasons. But uh, I feel like you know, strategizing a little too much uh, takes away headspace, and then, which uh, you know, detract from your ability to to play the wing gambit. <laughs> <laughs> wing gambit specialist, uh, right? We can't call him anything. I think if we try to pin him down, then uh, he'll do something else funky and freak us out. So thank you very much, Timur Gureyev. Guys, back to you. Thank you, Timor. Thank you for your answers and to uh, express the position. And yes, you can always be my wingman. I, I know. Uh -huh. that, that'll be an interesting. we got to get the, the web team on that. The camera crew um, uh, wing, over to watch that, uh, yeah. that, uh, that dynamic. But um, yeah, I don't believe Timor. He said that he's running out of ideas. No, he seems to have a fountain of creative ideas and definitely bringing, uh, uh, trotting out uh, the, um, <laughs> the wing gambit uh, was a good one. Uh, let me uh, turn to the game of Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley. So and we Timur have seen. Timor thinks this one is going to peter out into a draw. Right. Um, those bishops getting traded, making it a pure rook end game, um, it has to be. Um, something that Hikaru will uh, breathe a sigh of relief. Yes. We've seen the move rook takes g4, rook takes f6. I was going for h5, uh, Wesley's choice. In this, in the, pardon me, in this position, I think uh, we have mainly focused on the move h5. Um, Wesley's choice was to give a check followed by rook h4, bishop c4, and this is where we've gotten into a pure rook ending. Um, I think uh, Hikaru's drawing chances went way up more than 50 percent, and I think that the players are uh, heading towards a draw now. The, the point is, is that after, for example, a move like rook check, king back, uh, king takes, rook takes, all white has to do essentially is trade this pawn for this pawn by moving his rook over at a certain moment, and then we just get a Philidor right. position, and that's just a stone cold draw. Speaking of basic rook egg games, um, Nazi Pakidzi seems to be in a totally drawn situation against Rusadan Golatiani, but this one's kind of instructive, so we see that, well, now, uh, actually, it's, now it's just two versus two. I'm not quite no, sure how just, that happened. So this, right. this is definitely going to be a draw. Meanwhile, another result I think that is very likely to happen now in the Women's Championship is even if her technique wasn't the best, and uh, they have shaken hands. So um, Rusu Dangolatiani and Nazi Pekidzi, both now playing for the U.S., both used to play for Georgia, have drawn their game. And now that brings Arusadan to three out of four and two and a half for Pakidzi, which is the same score that Grandmaster Irena Gresh has. Um, but can Nam Sova pull ahead? I think the answer to that is yes, she definitely can. Um, this working game looks to have perked up for her. We were right. a little unsure about her technique, but she seems like she's got a listen in a totally passive position here. Rook c4, takes, takes, b2, rook over. And here the difference. Uh, over that variation that Maurice was talking about some while ago. Here the difference is that, uh, uh, well, even rook here, uh, Kate is ready to transpose into a king and pawn ending because her king is going to scoop up these two pawns. White's gonna, king is going to scoop up this pawn but the e6 pawn is going to win. So it's dead lost. Yes, actually, it's the end of the story here. So. For Elisa. Nemsova will be the clear leader in the women's championship. Exactly. And I think the and, uh, culprit for this uh, was actually this move, g5. That really uh, 
I, well, it looks to me that like uh, if if White was going to have drawn chances, it was not based upon the move G5. But again, they have reached a position where it's going to be an easy win for Kate. And that will give Kate clear first, uh, or she'll be in clear first. That's at the, right. Okay. And meanwhile, in the championship, if Nakamura indeed does hold the draw in this game, as you predict, yes, that means that there will be a two-way tie. The, main, main, the tie between Ray and Nakamura will maintain itself into the next round because right. nobody else in the field has uh, caught up with them. Exactly. So just three out of four, they'll be tied in the lead. The okay. same situation we had in the standings, and the tension will continue to build. Absolutely. And uh, they have uh, reached a theoretical... Um, basic uh, drawing, drawn end game. And we uh, have some fun pairings tomorrow. Wesley So is going to be playing <laughs> against Timur Gureyev. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Let's have some fun. Uh, what are the pairings then? Well, for So So is going to be white against Gureyev. Oh so. wow! I don't know if Timur is going to do something uh, to uh, up the ante early or well, not. Well, maybe he uh, previewed it by saying that tomorrow he's going to calm down a little bit. Very you good. know, because he, remember, he, it was there was a little bit of method to his madness. He did say that against Akovian, he thought that Akovian liked control. Yes. You know, French player. Right. D4 player, mm -hmm. great with his system. Technical, positional player, and he was being provoked. Uh, yeah. Horribly so with H6 and G5, and that would be upsetting him. Yeah. His temperament and psychology. And, yeah. And, you know, obviously we can argue it's still not a good move, but he had, there was a little bit of method to his madness. Right. I don't think he's going to do the same thing against Sal. No exactly. way. Exactly. He's going to play something more traditional. Right. And for Hikaru, by the way, he'll be going up against Daniel Narodisky. And on paper, this is a great opportunity for uh, Hikaru because Daniel has had a, 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 a difficult start. But on the other hand, this is, the, this is the time when juniors can be very, very, very dangerous players because they're thinking, okay, I'm having a bad tournament, but I can turn that all around with one big win against the big dog in the tournament. And so uh, Hikaru is going to have to be careful, especially after he's been feeling that he's letting his tournament slip. He's been making some mistakes. He made a mistake today. He made a mistake yesterday. So he has to, he's going to have to be very careful. And it looks like the players are actually moving pretty moving quickly. Very quickly. As if, Nakamura's yeah. And, and they, here they, they have drawn uh, uh, their game. Right. So Nakamura can finally stop shaking his head. And does that mean that all the games in the open yes, section Yes, all the games in the championship have been drawn and they're all over. Meanwhile, most of the women are still battling out, although most of the results we, we can predict with a high degree of accuracy. All right. Um, you know, Tatev's totally winning. Foyzer is totally winning. Um, Anna Sharovich looked like she was very much on top, but um, now we, that game seems to be the one that the result is most in doubt. Okay. Alyssa Melikina totally losing. Right. So Sabine winning, Tatev winning. Yeah, yes. Tatev was up a couple of pawns, and she's still up a couple of pawns. I'm not sure if Jennifer has gotten a little bit more counterplay, maybe a tiny bit mm, from when we last like looked. Night before for Tatev should be enough to. So, yeah, just the illusion of counterplay. Right, it's not yeah. there. Night before looks like she'll be uh, winning, bringing home the point. But that, as you mentioned, Elisa in bad shape. Yep. Okay, so um, but the one a that lot of blood <laughs> in the round in the lady section, and no blood in the open. One that is not so clear yet. Um, What's that? Sharovich versus Victoria Nee. How's that game going to go? That game has seen a lot of twists and turns. We thought that it was great for Anna earlier. I don't know. I just lost. It looks to me. Honest like Colt was a draw, by the way, as well. Okay, very good. It looks to me like I've lost my ladies' uh, games for the moment. Uh, that did look a little weird. Uh, I'm not too sure what's going on in that Anna Sheriff Victoria Nee game. Yeah, maybe we can get some insights from uh, from Maurice on that game as we uh, fix your board. Okay. But uh, first, let's uh, take a take a deeper look at the pairings tomorrow. So. We mentioned that um, Nemsova was going to be playing against Aubrey Hamian and then Crush was going to be playing against Rusadon. Right. We also have Nazi Pakidzi facing off against Anna Sharovich. Also important. That should be a good one. Mm -hmm. anyway. And in the championship, um, obviously, we're going to be most excited to see uh, Nakamura and So, and who's going to kind of be the front runner, but another big, big game, Kamsky versus Robson. 
So big test for right. Robson. Robson playing black, going to be tied for the lead. How is that going to go? Exactly. The reigning uh, defending champion, Gotti Kamsky, again, uh, feeling very good to be at 50%, knowing that with a single victory, he could catapult himself into the leaderboard, uh, while at the same time bringing Ray Ray back uh, to earth a bit. Uh, with a victory tomorrow, so big game for Gata. And boy, did Gata save some tough position. He really did. Today so, was no picnic, and the previous day against Sicaro was really a kind of a luck, lucky one as well. And here they are, uh, the pairings, uh, the full list of pairings tomorrow, Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Conrad Holt versus Troth, Kobe and Onishuk, Kamsky Robson, Sogarev, Naroditsky Nakamura, and the Battle of the Sams. Who are, um, yeah, Sam Shanklin and Sam Savignon. Sam's gonna win. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I was like, that's a really strong opinion. What do you have against Sam? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer Yu versus Aperva Vurku, two of the youngsters facing off. Katarina Nemsova versus Tate Abrahamian. That's going to be a game full of aggression. Sabina Hoyer, Alyssa Melikina. Victoria Ni nee versus Annie Wang. Nazi Pakidzi versus Anna Sharovich. And Irina Krush versus Rusadan Bolotiani. But now we have um, a Wesley so in studio with Maurice Ashley about today's very exciting game where it looked like he almost was going to beat. Nakamura and uh, shake chances. this championship up. Absolutely. With the number two player in the tournament, Wesley So. Wesley, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank this you. game was seeming to be kind of even, kind of so-so for a while. And yeah. then you play this very dramatic move, G5. What, was this a desire to win the game? Or why did you play this move? I was just to complicate things. I felt that in a maneuvering game, uh, White has good chances because of his bishop pair, and so I decided to uh, pre prevent, in some cases, bishop f4. So um, g5 is on the board. Let's take a look at that. Let's analyze it just yeah. for a moment. You play the move g5, was, then he played this move f4. Were you surprised when you saw this move? No, it's a, it's a strong reply, and uh, he could have played rook f1 first and then f4, but yeah, I, I regret playing g5 immediately after I did it. No. <laughs> you regret it? <laughs> yeah, when well, I can take back but um so, so he took on it you took yeah. and uh it, it he played queen f2 it looks like he couldn't really take on on f4 right away because yeah. of rook c3 rook c3 yeah so we looked at that but then he played queen f2 and you played knight to h4 and Which he could have a mistake he could have taken with the queen yes he should have taken with the queen and then i would play queen g7 and he's slightly hmm, i'm not sure probably much better yeah, we, we saw him as much better in that line. Uh, well, yeah. after queen, queen takes queen g7, queen bishop e4, four. Maybe, he's only, maybe he's only a little bit better, but that seemed like the main line. Yeah. Instead, were you shocked when you saw like him play queen bishop e. takes on f4? Yeah, which is a blunder. You know, now I win a pawn. Did you think you were going to win when you, when you put this move on the board, knight to f3 check? Were you, were you thinking, uh, now this is, well, <laughs> this is going to be money? He, he has to go for the end, ending pawn down. Which he did. He took. Yeah, which I did. Yeah, I thought I had good check, win. check and takes, and good. now you're pawn up. Good win. I thought I had good winning chances in this end game, but it wasn't very easy, and he defended very, very well. But um, I made some mistakes. I when I let him put his pawn on g4, eventually it was uh, not not very no, not very good for me. So, what are you feeling about this game? Do you have mixed feelings? Are you like? You feel like you should have had him, but somehow you let him off the hook? Mm. Well, I, I wouldn't say that I should have had him because I haven't, I mean, I haven't seen a, a clear winning plan, although I do believe that Black has very good winning chances here. And just uh, keep in mind next time not, not to play G5 again. <laughs> 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 Which, you know. But it would have been very, very good if I won with the Black pieces against the Great Hikaru Nakamura, but, you know, maybe. So, um, so what today. are you feeling about your chances for the rest of the tournament? Uh, well, I'll take it one game at a time. Mm, obviously, yesterday was uh, a big, a big loss. So um, mm. we hear that one game at a time a lot. I guess it's the, the thing. Yeah, that because the problem do. is you cannot look at, you cannot just play every game and think about winning the tournament as as a whole. Like you know, there are eleven rounds. You cannot just think of winning every single time or else disasters like yesterday might happen. 
but um hmm. ask you one last question Timur Gureyev is your opponent tomorrow, since you do have to take yeah. it one game at a time. He played the move H6 on move two, oh. and then G5 in his game against Akobian. Yeah. How are you going to prepare against uh, this guy? Today he played the B4 in the second uh, move. Oh, right, on the wing gambit. Uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> what will you do to prepare to get inside the mind of Timur Gureyev? Well, I hope he plays like uh, that again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you want to no, see that tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> you got something planned for 8 6 g <laughs> Yeah, well, you, which is... Um, the, that's why I'm glad Timor is here, because I don't think you can... There's any other player who would play moves like that in the opening. You know, it just gives uh, more excitement to, to, the, to the tournament. And I'll try my, my best tomorrow. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and good luck in the rest of your games. Thank you. Wesley So, after a tough draw, could have possibly won the game against the number one player in the tournament, but he's still sitting pretty uh, with three points after four. Well, two, two, and, two and a half points yeah. after four. Guys, back to you. Thank you. That's, I think that's just so funny. I played the move G5 because I wanted to be enterprising. Then I thought, well, I should like to take that move back. <laughs> right? well, it's great to see that one of the top five players in the world has that same thing where, you know. Like, why did I do that? As soon as you take the hand off the piece, you're like, you, you enter this other realm. Right. Because I do think, like, you're talk, you talk a lot about the difference between judgment and calculation. And I think that players calculate more when it's their move. And they judge more when it's not their move in a exactly. way. So, like, I do that, for sure. Yeah. So that I think that's that it's like a different frame of mind. You're in like the judgment mode now, and you're like, oops. That's <laughs> yeah, you, what? You calculate that G5 works, then you judge it as being like, what am I doing? I'm just giving my opponent a chance to open up the king side favorably, rook f1, f4. That Hikaru uh, missed the shot knight f3, and that he was very very lucky. Normally, when you miss such a big shock like that, right? That just turns the tables. You've gone from... Are you sure you missed it? I couldn't tell by his uh, facial expression. I, I picked up on it. I'm very I'm very intuitive and sensitive. He's actually with things. us right now. Oh, okay. And he's laughing. And he's laughing. But, um, I but mean, <laughs> then he's very, very fortunate that, you know, he hasn't blown it because he had such a nice position before allowing this one shot. Yeah. 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 And okay. then we have big news in the Women's Championship, by the way. Nemsova has won, and so she is the clear leader. But okay, with no good. further ado, we do have Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura number three in the world, he is with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. And by the way, he was not laughing, guys. <laughs> uh, we have Hikaru Nakamura with us, the number one player in the tournament, one of the finest players on the planet. Hikaru, today was not your best moment. Uh, you, you missed the move, and it was a big one, and you really seemed shocked when it happened. Well, I mean, I, I think I was a little bit worse uh, in the middle game somewhere. I, th I thought Wesley was very imprecise with queen f6, and I thought g5 was just, I mean, just a blunder, frankly. Um, you know, if, if I go queen takes f4 instead of bishop takes f4, I suspect that I'm in. I'm much better if not winning. So to, to miss that's very upsetting. Um, that being said, fortunately, just like yesterday, um, when I blundered, I, my position wasn't was, was still good enough that I was able to draw. So. I guess that's okay, but I'm not, not very happy, obviously. Speaking of yesterday, that was, must have been a shock uh, when it happened that you only could draw a game that you really felt like you had in hand. How did you manage the psychology from yesterday coming into this game? Yeah, well, I mean, you? okay, yesterday I just took the wrong piece. I mean, I, I just I took, the, took the bishop in, instead of the knight. That's, that's, that's all that happened. Um, so, I mean, I got low on time, and I, I just took the wrong piece. So, um, not, not that big of a deal. Um, maybe, you know. I, I felt a little bit uneasy because normally I don't make those sorts of blunders. But that being said, um, I mean, it's not a big deal, and it's, it's a long tournament, so any, anything can really happen. But, I mean, if I had lost today, I, I think uh, I probably would not be sleeping tonight. So, <laughs> fortunately, um, I was able to, to defend. And I, th I think, I mean, I, I think probably at some point I was much worse, maybe, um, if I couldn't have gotten in G4. But I think once I got in G4 and I found this very nice bishop a6 rook f1 idea, I think it's, I mean, technically speaking, it should be a draw. So, um, you know, fortunately I was able to buckle down and, and, uh, and save it. Well, you're still in a good situation. I mean, you're tied for first uh, in the championship. You've gotten rid of two of your major rivals, that is uh, Wesley So, naturally, and also Gadakomsky, uh from the last game. How are you feeling now with the rest of the games to come? Well, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm getting rid of them because I didn't beat them. I mean, it's not like I'm exactly putting distance. So, you know, if there's, uh, you know, to, to use an example, in 2012, I played God, I think, in like the 10th round or something. I was a half point behind and I was able to beat him. So, um, 
I mean, if I if I was beating <laughs> my main rivals, then then perhaps I'd be getting rid of them. But the fact that I'm just drawing, certainly they can catch up if they win a few games. Um, so eh, it's it's okay. But uh, I seem to be getting my chances and not ta making the most of them. So um, certainly hope. I mean, or at least hopefully I can, can find a way to do something as a tournament progresses. Your confidence level, do you feel like it's all there still, uh, that, that uh, your chances are as good as anybody else, if not much better than everybody else? Yeah. I mean, I'm always confident. I'm just annoyed that I played a bad, that I played a series of bad, bad moves in two, two days in a row. So what can you do? I mean, I'll, I'll just go, you know, waste an hour and then I'll forget about it and move on. So that's, that's life. Okay. Thanks for the interview. We wish you luck in the rest of your games. Thanks. What did he think when he saw the wing, wing gambit being played in the U.S. Championship? Uh, I saw him. Gurev, yes. Gurev played the wing <laughs> gambit. Gurev also played the move h6, g5. I mean, you don't play him uh, for a little while. But uh, what do you think about these kind of moves being uh, played in the U.S. Championship? Well, for starters, it's good that there's one opponent that I won't have to prepare for. I can just, <laughs> just go in and play the game, you know, not, not, not waste a few hours and, and waste, waste my life preparing. Um, uh, that, that being said, uh, Timur is a very creative player. Um, I think actually, if if you're going to play something like the wing gambit, God is probably the best person to do it against. Um, Why is that? I mean, God just likes he he's he's not super prepared. So I mean, God is not going to know the refutation to the wing gambit if there is one. Um, so uh, God God is the perfect guy to play it against. But that being said, um, I mean, it's it's still it's still risky, but it's creative and. Uh, you know, considering that I've played a lot of creative openings over the years, uh, I, you know, I certainly can't fault Timur for playing like that. So, Nakamura, you said uh, you're going to waste an hour now and get over the fact th of this game. What does that mean? That means I'm not going to look at any chess for an hour. I'll just uh, <laughs> only an hour. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll just go do something else. Maybe I'll go eat or, or, or spend time on Facebook. Who, who even knows? But uh, yeah, I'm just going to forget about chess for a bit, and then. Um, then I'll then I'll start preparing, get ready for tomorrow. I think. I mean, tomorrow, there's a game yes. tomorrow, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Please don't. Stay right. <laughs> yeah. Stay in the hotel. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, whatever. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us, and uh, good luck tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Nakara. Well, you know, everybody says they're going to take it one game at a time. Nakamura shows us. Because he's like, is there a game tomorrow? Is there a game Yes, he's playing right. Daniel Naradinsky with Black. Yes, indeed. We already spoke about that one. All right. Uh, well, exciting uh, events happening this weekend. Yes, and uh, we're waiting uh, to get our, our leader in the Women's Chess Championship uh, set up for an interview. Oh, And wonderful. here she is. She's getting okay. up, set up right now. So oh, Katarina right. Nemsova with three and a half out of four. So that puts her um, a half point ahead of the field because Ruslan Golutiani did hold the draw or today. didn't win. Uh, didn't game. win, sorry. Yes, yes. 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 Nazi was the one who was in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so that that brings uh, Golitsiani to three points, and she's uh, just behind them, Sova. Who's been playing great chess, just simply great chess. She's dominating the field so far after four rounds. Yeah, fantastic. And she played well in, in previous championships. Last year she played well too. There was that big game against Anna near yeah, the end of the tournament, right. Grunfeld. Yeah. So not that surprised to see this, in fact. Not at all, no. And uh, and I think uh, we are ready with uh, Katerina Nemsova and Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. We are with the leader in the women's championships, Katerina Nemsova. Katerina, welcome to the show. Thank you. Katerina, you played such dominant chess today. I mean, you have just been in fine form. Do you feel, like, really confident as you're at the board? Well, I try to be confident because, uh, I mean, this game, she was attacking me so much, so I tried to, you know, to, to arrange something on the queen side, and I tried to appear confident more <laughs> than I was. <laughs> now, she indeed was looking uh, to make your king seem uh, like a bad piece when sitting on F8. She, she played very aggressively right out of the opening. Were you worried about this position at any point, that maybe you were worse, or did you feel like you were always Yes, okay? I think that when she captured with queen on G5, if she captures with uh, knight, I think I'm in trouble. So. Really? Yes. Well, we didn't look at that position. Uh, maybe we can pull that up on the big board. Uh, let's see. Right here, bishop takes g5. Uh huh. Yeah, knight takes g5. Knight takes g5. Well, the engine's not giving you too much trouble after knight takes e5. What was your thought here? Did you think she just had compensation? I or maybe you were just. Yeah. Maybe you saw. Oh, yeah, queen f4. Queen f4. Queen f4. I wasn't sure what to, 
what to do here. And uh, eight six looks like the move could be played. Seems like you're just hanging on according to the engines. Mm. Maybe you saw one of those. Maybe maybe move earlier. I think somewhere she was she was better. I think. Okay. Well, we didn't but, see anything for her exactly. It just looked oh, okay. like there was always a play for you in compensation. But we, you have to tell us what were you thinking in this moment in the game after you played these fine moves to attack her. You you storm down the board uh, with uh, G4 and especially after knight E1, this really beautiful G3, and you got to this position right here. And we were screaming, you played bishop takes f3. Why did you do that? That was just a horrible move. <laughs> there, I mean, I thought that maybe she can play knight g5 at some point, and I won't be able to capture the pawn back. And then, you know, there is a pin, so the rook is hanging, so I thought maybe this knight can be annoying at some point. But, I mean, I can play just king e7, and I'm just fine. I mean, horrible move. Bishop takes f7, bishop takes f3. And after you took, after this happened, and you started looking at your position, did you feel like... Yeah, I wanted to punch myself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you were not happy, but you settled yourself down, and then you you started to bring the game back and, and get an end game that uh, looks like you were always much better. Yeah, I thought the rook and game is winning, but I mean, you know, rook and game anything can happen, and I wanted to exchange the queens because if I keep them on the board, then my king can be very weak. So I better went to the rook and game, but I wasn't hundred percent sure that it's winning. Well, you did convert it. Now you're sitting in the first place of the ladies' championship mm -hmm. after four rounds. How does that feel? Good. <laughs> it feels good. And what are you thinking of your chances for the rest of this tournament? You know, it's still it's many, many rounds, so I don't, I don't look at this this way. But, I mean, I won twice with black, which is amazing, so I'm happy about that. And tomorrow you play... You don't know. know. That's don't the know. funny part. <laughs> the players don't know who they play the next round. It's always one game at a There's time. There's a thing. It? I just focus at one game. You know, why to spend energy energy on looking at games in the next round, and next round. I mean, I just focus on one game, and when that is finished, I can focus on next game. Well, we appreciate that absolutely, and how well you're doing. We hope you continue in the rest of your games. <laughs> Thank you, Katarina Nemsova, leading the tournament with some really powerful play. Except for one really bad move. <laughs> Guys, back to you. Well, good news for chess fans. Tomorrow she's playing against one of the most combative players in the championship, uh, Tate Babrahamian, who hasn't won yet today, but is on the road to winning. So that's going to be a very exciting game. Absolutely. And Tate hasn't won. That's surprising. I... She's, been, she, she's been winning it for such a long time. We somehow mentally chalked it up for her, but uh, I'm sure she will win against Jennifer uh, Yu in that particular and game. And another winner today, we had uh, Sabina Foyzer um, climb up to a plus score with victory today against Annie Wang. Exactly. So we're getting her set up for an interview to hear uh, her thoughts on the Women's Championship and uh, her um, her result. You know, two and a half, same as Irina Crash. Exactly. Like this, this tournament, um, a lot of people can still win this Women's Chess Championship. Oh, sure. I, I consider it wide open, but if Kate keeps the form that she's had so far in the first four rounds, I don't yeah. know if anybody can catch her. Come yeah. on. Katarina she, and Irina, I think. She's been playing really, really, really yes. well. So Powerful the game, Jess. The game tomorrow, uh, Tatev better bring her A game if she's going to stop the steamroller. And Sabina Foyzer with Maurice Ashley. Yes, with Sabina Foyzer, who is one of the Olympic, uh, one of our Olympians playing for the ladies' Olympic team uh, last year in Tromso. Welcome to the show. Thank you. First time on the show this time around. Yes. Uh, you must be feeling pretty good after a victory today. Tell us about your game. Yes. Uh, it was a tough game. I think, although she's uh, she's not that high rated, she's definitely a really strong player and deserves to be here. So I try to be careful. You know, we played. Um, uh, I played the Slav and she played the exchange variation. Uh, I thought I was a little bit better after the opening, but then it wasn't clear for me if I really had an attack, if she were, if she were to come on the C-file and try to, you know, put her pieces. It wasn't clear to me if I really had a mating attack, but um, she didn't do that. And then I think at some point, okay, um, when I played Queen before, I think she had knight c4 and um, c5, sorry, knight c5, and I thought my queen is trapped, but I don't know. There was just one move <laughs> that could happen, and I, that I got a little bit worried there, but other than that, I think the game 
okay, went went to my favor. So yeah. you lost the game earlier uh, in the competition. Yes. Uh, what were your feelings after this loss? Did you feel like you know you had to really buckle down to bounce back? Yeah, and I, I was also very disappointed because um, I, I I thought I was better for most of the game. Then I messed up, and uh, I got into a worse or at least Rusa was attacking me, and then I got into what I thought was a drawish position. You know, different color bishops in in rook rook rooks each and, and different color bishops and um, I thought it was draw and then suddenly <laughs> there was a trick and I lost my bishop so I was very disappointed that you know I didn't I didn't make a draw that game so I definitely wanted to get back. How do you come back from something like that when you just feel like you know that was just dumb what did I do? <laughs> it's tough you know you're just trying to not think about the previous game and just think that okay you have um, eight nine more rounds to play you can't just stop there. The tournament is really long, much longer than last year. So, you know, you just need to keep going. So you're in a good position in the in the championship right now. I mean, there's one player, a clear leader. Let's talk about her play. Have you been paying any attention to what Katarina is doing? She's playing extremely well. I know she's a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. How uh, how do you feel about her game so far? I'm happy <laughs> that that goes well for her. I mean, you know, we're all, I mean, most of us, I think, are friends here. So you know, we are probably trying to focus on our own tournament, and then when we play against each other, we're just trying to be playing because it's it's a game after all; it's a sport. So, you know, just keep playing. I play my my tournament; she plays hers. You know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> what about the result in uh, for Irina Crush? Now she was everybody's pick to win the championship again, especially when Zatonski uh, did not uh, come to play. Uh, that was a big shocker for everyone, I think, in the, her position in the tournament. She's kind of righted the ship by winning today. What do you think about how open the championship is, the ladies' championship is right now, for everyone to win? Well, I think there's some pressure uh, on, on Irina because she's uh, number one rated. So, of course, everybody expects it from her. She probably expects it from herself. So it's good from the re for the rest of us because she's... She's in the although she's she's number one. She's in the position where she has to to kind of prove herself, maybe in a way. So um, definitely, yesterday Nazi played a really good game too, and she won. So you know, but I'm sure Irina is going to to come back. It's you know happens to everybody. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and good luck in the rest of your games. Thank you, Sabina Foyzer. After a good victory, riding the ship, she's in third place, I believe in the championship, guys, in the ladies' championship. Thank you, Sabine. Well, a very bloody day in the Women's Chess Championship, and uh, Tata Babrahamian has also won her game. Okay. And that's going to be that crucial matchup tomorrow between Nim Silva and Tata. Right. So plenty of drama here in the U.S. Chess Championship. Tension building in the open section with Ray Robson and Nakamura still at the top. Wesley So half a point behind. Right. Could have actually beat Nakamura, came close. Meanwhile, in the Women's Chess Championship, uh, yeah, lots of lots of drama there. Nemsova the showing fabulous ones. form, mm -hmm. and um, it looks like we uh, we have uh, one more interview coming with Tate Abrahamian, right. um, and uh, yeah, just a very exciting day for the women's championship. For sure, for sure. And tomorrow uh, again, uh, we're going to be seeing uh, nice matchups. Uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's like every single day is a nice matchup. But I get the feeling uh, when I'm Hikaru seems unhappy. He's like perturbed with him, himself. He's just being a little bit too self-critical. Uh, we're human. We make mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, and he just seems a little bit uh, tight, uh, too too tense at the moment. But uh, Ray Robson so far is looking very good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray Robson and Nemsova kind of like the surprises of the tournament. Yeah. But I have the feeling that they work harder than a lot of their competitors and you know that shows. It has so far. Certainly. Yeah. If it's true. If it I has, know. If it has, they both give the impression of being kind of a bit more studious to me uh -huh. in terms of preparation for one thing. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's my gut feeling. I got a feeling that uh, Ray does work very hard actually. Yeah. I mean first of all you know going to Webster and uh, he's there to win the collegiate championships, of course, and uh, he's taking a disciplined approach. I'm impressed with Ray, with, uh, with Ray Ray. Yes, indeed. Uh, Ray Robson, 
The, yeah, I mean, just like kind of, we expect somebody to kind of come from that group and impress us, and he's the one so far. Yes. But lawn tournaments, so still, you know, there's a chance for somebody else to come in and and, uh, and catch him. I mean, Sam Sevian today was a draw, but even score. Mm -hmm. And of course, a very historic result yesterday, defeating Wesley So. Right, absolutely. And Sam Shanklin, Caden Trough. Well, Sam, like he said, you know, he's he's he feels that he's been under the gun in the sense that he's had three out of four blacks uh, to start the event, making it very difficult for him, and then losing that real, real tough one to Wesley, that night ending. Um, big, big swing in that game. We're waiting for a... Uh, I believe we're waiting we are, for a talk to Abrahami or, on. I see. Yeah, so... What's, so yeah, Tata Abrahamian, you know, again, she started with 0-2, won two games in a row. Right. Now she's climbed back up to an even score. Right. And that was the whole point of putting together all of, you know, if you can put to string together a few victories, again, tomorrow after uh, dropping two, she's won two. If she can win a third. Well, that would be shake up huge. the women's championship because completely. Because that, that, that pulls exactly. Kate, Kate down from plus three to plus two and brings Tatev up to plus one. And by the way, again, is Tatev white? No, Tatev's black. Okay, so Kate will right. look, look to... That was Katarina was saying in her interview that one of the most impressive things about her results so far is that uh, she she's done so well with black. black. Yeah, yeah, the two victories of the black side, so she does get the white tomorrow against Tatev. I see that and only one game going on was Anna and Victoria. And importantly, we wouldn't have known how important this was at the beginning of the tournament, but now we do. Nemkova, Nemsova plays Irina Crush in the very last round, but Something. she plays black. Something Arena actually mentioned. Yes, in and, uh, and Katarina, yes, they, it's funny because they say they take it one game at a time and they don't know who they play when, but of course Nemsova does know when she plays Irina. I think she mentioned that in one of her interviews as right. well. Well, I remember when I was playing tournaments with Gary Kasparov, uh, we'd have a drawing of lots, and it was like a star. Ooh, I knew I was going to play Gary and say round nine or round four or something, and. That particular pairing uh, stuck in my mind, and a lot of the others kind of faded away. We all knew when we were going to be playing against the number one player in the field. Now, we've gotten some good um, good uh, tweets throughout the day. Um, there's one yes, really funny was. one where Tamora Gureyev is actually spinning around in his chair in a full motion shot. We also mm -hmm. got somebody who uh, sent the link in for that book that you had mentioned earlier. Right, the, the uh, best games of Nezh Medinov, uh, a real treat. Yeah, so if you search for the hashtag US Chess Tips, you could find the uh, link to that book, which uh, Yasser is hey, jealous that you haven't read yet. You've posted uh, the, po the, the, the selfie that we took. Um, well, no, it's not a selfie if somebody else takes it, Yasser. That's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we knew what we were trying to do. We were trying it, to yeah, you kind of make it look a little bit like a selfie, but instead have a professional do it. Well done. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we've actually got uh, such a great team here. You know, if you haven't seen it yet, you've got to check out that St. Louis Dispatch article, St. Louis Post Dispatch article about the new studio here yeah. and the the, uh, the setup that Spectrum Studios and Pat Shimp has set up. I am most impressed by that enormous RV outside that has all of this high-tech gear where the whole production crew yes, is. That right. is an awesome, awesome uh, piece of machine. And we don't have to share our brownies as much now. Yeah, we put those guys <laughs> out there. <laughs> and Tata Abrahamian, she is with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. On the comeback trail is Tata Abrahamian after losing her first two games. Tata, you seem to have somehow righted the ship. What are you feeling right now in the tournament? Feeling good. Feels good to win some games. Now, what did you do? I mean, how did you get your mindset right to, to be playing these games? And what's the secret? Tell us. <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of taking the pressure and just playing faster. Uh, I, I mean, I'm still having uh, trouble with time trouble, but not as bad as I did in the first two games. So I think, because everyone, it seems like everyone's always in time trouble. So I think if you play a little faster, it gives you a big edge. Is the time control a little tricky for players, a 30-second increment? I mean, I know it's not brand new anymore, but is it, do you feel like you have less time than you should or more time than you should? I, mean, I always feel like I have less time. Um, I mean, the concept of time for me is a little, I don't know. Like, I, I don't really feel how much time I spend. I can think for 20 minutes, and I don't feel 20 minutes have passed. I don't think it's tricky, but, I mean, it is less than having two hours because it adds up to hour 50, but I think it's just people don't really realize when they need to spend I mean, myself included. Like, you know, when's the time to spend the time and when you have to make a quick move? 
the tournament has definitely blown wide open. I mean, we see Katarina Nemsova playing extremely well. Now she's standing at three and a half points. Uh, Rusudan Gulatiani is also playing well at three points. Are you thinking about what you need to do to catch the leaders? No, <laughs> no, not yet. Well, you do play Katarina tomorrow. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts about that matchup? Um, actually, I didn't know I was playing her tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I haven't really looked at my pairings uh, so far ahead, but I guess it's going to be an important game tomorrow. So. It's funny, it, the players consistently say they have no idea what, who they're playing the next day. They're always talking about one game at a time. Nakamura wasn't even sure if we played yesterday, uh, if we do play tomorrow. Uh, he was <laughs> saying, really? Are we sure? Is there a game necessarily? Uh, how is it that a player is, because we have a lot of kids who watch and they start thinking when they walk to the, the tournament, I'm going to win the whole thing. How do players get their mind right to be able to play a tournament without thinking about even the next round? I mean, on some level, I do. I think we do think about it because um, you kind of look at the tournament and you look, oh, like what color do I have against each player? Because before the tournament, you prepare both colors. So I think you kind of like glance and kind of have an idea what openings you're going to get, what colors you have against the top people, against the bottom people. But when it, I think it's just pre-tournament things. Once you start playing, you're just there to play, and everything else kind of goes away. Well, we're glad to see you back in the fold, getting your okay. game back uh, together. And good luck in the rest of the games. Thank you. Tatev Abrahamian, one of the favorites to win this tournament. We'll see how she does as the tournament goes on. Guys? Right. She's on the comeback trail, and she's got a massive match tomorrow against Katarina Nemsova. Tomorrow, Easter Sunday, but you're going to be here with us all day. It's going to be fun. Yeah, we're at 1250 Central Standard Time, and that is going to be 150 Eastern time. Right. And uh, yeah, if this uh, championship so, so so far is any indication, tomorrow's going to bring a lot of drama. So it will indeed. I'll look forward to it. And join right. us. And we are we also have well, one final comment from Maurice Ashley. Well, so far many of the players in the tournaments must be in the tournament or uh, both events actually must feel uh kind of subdued about some of their results. We saw Hikaru Nakamura not feeling great about his two draws, the way he's playing especially. We also saw Wesley So a little despondent after his loss uh, against Sam Sevian and now maybe could have won against Nakamura. Everybody's feeling a little bit nicked, except probably two players. Ray Robson, who's playing like a world beater right now, must be feeling great about himself. But especially Katarina Nemsova, she's blossoming like a star before our very eyes, playing great chess, except for one move where she didn't play so well, but still dominating the women's championships. It's going to be an exciting matchup for them, for her, especially tomorrow as she plays against Tatev Abrahamian, who's the number two player essentially in all our minds in the tournament. So an exciting round five to come. Great matchups to go here at the championships. Guys? Thank you, Maurice. Well, join us tomorrow, 1.50 Eastern Time, 12.50 here in St. Louis.